author's preface of saint francis of assisi a biography this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org saint francis of assisi a biography by johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan author's preface the fruit of several years of study is here submitted to the circle of northern readers more than once it has seemed that this book would never be finished modern franciscan research has developed to so widespread and erratic a science that those who once get into it are in danger of never getting out of it again even paul sabatier told me in a conversation i had with him in rome in 1903 that he found it difficult to preserve a comprehensive viewpoint now however when i have succeeded in completing my book it has become possible for me to pay my tribute of thanks on all sides first of all i thank my wife who in her time zealously advised me and by personal sacrifice contributed to the carrying out of my plan of a trip devoted to franciscan studies i next owe my thanks to those who gave me material assistance both for the necessary preliminary studies as well as for the final development and production my especial thanks are due to baroness l stamp Cheresis, baroness p rosenorn lane as well as to the directors of the carlsberg endowment especially professor dr edward holm also professor carl larson and my publisher director ernst bogensen are heartily thanked for the interest they showed in my work my thanks are again due to all who by personal interest have facilitated my studies first i thank countess h holstein lederberg who by her translation into german of my pilgrim's bog undertaken with such great devotion has more than once paved the way for me and opened doors and hearts i must next name a number of franciscans above all rev david fleming who by his commendation as vicar general of the order made it possible for me my pilgrimage in nineteen o three through franciscan italy next the historian of the franciscan order rev leonard lemons and the guardian and fathers in the different convents which i visited on the above-named journey especially rev pacifico in greccio rev giovanni da greccio in fonte colombo rev teodoro da carpineto in the convent of la foresta rev vincenzo stefano jacobi in cortona rev saturnino da caprese and rev samuel Sharon de guersac at laverna i give hearty thanks again to rev don severino pastor in poggio bustone and to the learned engineer albert provarioni of the same place to the capuchins in celle and to the redemptorists in cortona under whose hospitable roof i found refuge in the days i passed in the city of st margaret with special recognition i give my thanks to the brothers matucci who gave me a home in poggio bostone and helped me in my work i only wish that i could extend this list enough to include even a part of all who showed me friendship and hospitality in my wanderings for those who know italian people this seems very natural but the present book might never have been completed if i had not found a place of refuge in the franciscan convent at Fraunberg, where next door to my room i had a rich library of franciscan literature from the earliest to the most recent time the second half third and fourth books with the conclusion of the appendix were written there should my work seem to have any worth a due portion of the honor for its existence is due to rev maximilian brandes provincial of the franciscan province of thuringia to which fraunberg belongs to rev pacificus vayner now in gorheim by sigmaringen as well as to the guardian of fraunberg rev saturnine gare who with such great hospitality and affection regarded me for six weeks as a member of his great convent family 
i also thank the willing and friendly fathers who try to help in every way and especially must i thank my tireless and devoted friend rev michael beale by whose ever ready assistance so many stones were removed from my road i shall never forget the summer evenings in the convent gardens of Fraunberg, when we walked up and down the long walk as the sun large and red sank behind the trees and i told him of my day's work and sought pater michael's practical opinion sometimes on one sometimes on another difficult point and thus i take leave of this work which has so long been the centre of my labour and research to write about st francis of assisi should have been his own affair for what does he himself say in the speculum perfectionis the emperor charlemagne roland holger and all the other knights of the round table fought the heathen unto death and won the victory over them and at the end became themselves holy martyrs and died in the battle for the faith of christ but now there are many who by simply telling of their actions hope to win honor and fame for mankind also there are now many who by simply preaching on what the saints have done wish to win honor and fame deep and wise therefore was the saying of francis man has as much of knowledge as is executed tantum homo habet de scientia quantum operatur the ultimate measure of wisdom is to serve and to properly conduct one's life worth is only attained by putting into practice therefore there is a practical and moral design behind all the literary diligence of the old authors of legends thus also a modern biographer of st francis who would really be inspired by the spirit of st francis of assisi like the old convent brother writers must utter the words fox secundum exemplar learn from francis that ideals ought to be put into practice johannes jornson fraunberg feast of st clara of assisi 1906 end of the author's preface book one chapter one of francis of assisi a biography by Johannes Jornson, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Francis the Church Builder, Chapter One, The Convalescent. There awoke one morning in Assisi a young man who was just recovering from a severe illness. It was seven hundred years ago. The hour was an early one the window blinds were not yet opened out of doors the day's business was in full blast the bells for mass had long ago rung out from saint maria del vescovado which lay almost under the windows the strong morning light streamed in through the crack where the window blinds met the young man knew it all so well one morning after another the long weeks of his convalescence had passed thus soon his mother would come in and draw the shutters aside and the light would enter in dazzling brightness then he would get his morning draught and his bed would be made over he used to lie on one side of the wide bed while the other was made up for him and so he would lie there tired but at peace and look out on the blue cloudless autumn sky listening to the splashing on the stones of the street as the people of the neighborhood threw their waste water out of the windows as the forenoon advanced the rays of the sun began to come in first along the high wall of the window alcove then right across the brick floor of the room and when they approached the bed it was time to take the midday meal after midday the blinds were again closed and he took his siesta in the quiet comfortable obscurity of the room then he awoke and the blinds were again thrown open to admit the light the sun had left the window but if he raised himself up in the bed 
he could see the mountains under a blue veil on the other side of the plain and soon the crimson evening red of the late autumn day burned in the western sky as the darkness quickly fell he heard the noise of sheep which were driven bleeding into the stable and of peasants and peasant girls who sang on their way home from the fields they were the wonderful heart-gripping folk songs of umbria which the invalid heard the songs which even to-day are in the people's mouths and whose slow wonderfully melancholy tones fill the soul with sadness till it is ready to burst with helpless longing and melancholy at last the song ceased and it was night over the distant mountains gleamed a single bright star when that showed itself it was time to close the shutters and to light the night lamp the lamp which in the long nights of fever had constantly burned through the long hours of his uneasy dreams Today there was to be a change Today at last he was to have permission to leave his bed how glad he was to go into the other rooms to see and touch all the things he had so long missed and had been so near losing forever he must even venture down into the business offices see the people come and do business see the clerks measure the good tuscan cloth with their yardsticks and draw in the bright ringing coins just as the young man was busy with these dreams the door opened as on every morning of his illness it was his mother who entered as she threw the shutters aside he saw that she carried as she brought his morning meal a suit of man's clothes over her arms i have had a new suit of clothes made for you my francis she said as she laid them down at the foot of the bed and as he finished his meal she sat down by the window while he dressed himself what a lovely morning it is she said almost as if she were talking to herself how brightly the sun shines i see all the houses over in betona so clearly although there is the whole extent of the broad plain between us and out in the middle of the green vineyards isola romanesca lies like an island in a lake and smoke is rising straight up from all the chimneys as if from a censer in a church ah it seems to me my francis that on such a morning as this heaven and earth are as beautiful as a church on a feast day and that all creatures praise love and thank god to these words francis gave no answer but silence but a moment later he broke out as he ceased his dressing how weak i am his mother changed the current of her remarks and their tone it is always so when one has been sick she said brightly as long as you lie in bed you think that you can do anything but as soon as you get your feet from under the covers you find that it is different i know this from my own experience and therefore i had the foresight to bring a stick for you and she went to the door and brought in a beautiful polished stick with an ivory handle soon after the mother and son together left the sick room some time passed before francis could venture to go out of his home alone he and his mother had visited all the rooms they had been down in the shop where the clerks had greeted them with a hearty and delighted good morning madonna pica good morning and welcome back signorino francesco but francis had to go further than through rooms and shop further than through the house he must go out and greet the fields and vineyards greet the open heaven and look far over the wide fertile plain and now he stood outside the city gate on the road which goes to foligno along the foot of monte subiaco here he stood supported by his stick and looked out directly in front of him was a vineyard the vines were festooned from tree to tree heavy blue branches hung under the broad leaves soon it will be the grape harvest and the beautiful time of wine pressing further down the slope were the olive groves that extended over the plain and covered it with a silver-gray veil here and there appeared the white buildings and farmhouses under a veil of mist 
which now towards midday began to rise out of the earth the most distant building seemed hardly larger than little white stones francis saw it all yet not as he should have seen it that excess of delight with which the sight of the landscape's bright colors and of the mountain's fine outline against the clear sky formerly affected him was missing it was as if the heart which formerly had beaten so young and strongly in his breast had suddenly grown old it seemed to him as if he never again could enjoy anything he felt too hot in the sun and retreated to the shadow of a wall his knees were too weak to let him go down the hill he also was hungry and caught himself dreaming of a good dinner and of a glass of wine and like a shudder the sensation went through him that his youth was gone that the things which he had believed would constantly give him peace would now give him no joy that all that he had thought to be a treasure which never could be taken from him the sunshine the blue heaven the green fields all that he in his convalescence weary days had so bitterly longed for like an exiled king for his kingdom that all this in his hands was now worthless smouldering and going to ashes like the palms of palm sunday burned and reduced to the ashes which the priest on ash wednesday puts upon the heads of the faithful with the sad and truthful words remember man of dust thou art and unto dust thou shalt return it was all dust dust and nothing but dust and ashes death and judgment mortality and vanity all was vanity francis stood there a long time and looked into space it was as though he saw the future blossoming before his eyes slowly he turned away and leaning heavily on his stick went back to assisi for him the day was come of which the lord spoke to the prophet i will spread thy path with thorns the day when a mysterious hand writes words of death and corruption on the walls of the feast chamber but like all who are in the first steps of their conversion the young man immediately thought as much of the failings of others as of his own for as he saw the change that had taken place in himself his thoughts were directed to his friends with whom he had so often stood there and admired the beautiful view how foolish they are that they love perishable things he thought within himself with a sort of feeling of superiority as he went back to the city gate end of book one chapter one book one chapter two of st francis of assisi a biography by johannes jornson translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book one francis the church builder chapter two infancy and youth francesco or as we say in our language francis had that morning just completed his twenty-second year and was the eldest son of one of the richest men of assisi the great cloth merchant pietro de bernardone the family was not indigenous to assisi pietro's father bernardone or great bernard had come from lucca and belonged to the renowned lucan family of weavers and merchants the morricone francis's mother fru pica was of still more distant origin ser pietro had made her acquaintance on one of his business trips in beautiful legendary provence and took her home as his bride to the little italian village under the mountain declivity of subasio assisi is one of the oldest cities of italy even in the books of ptolemy it is called assision and in the year forty six b c the latin poet propertius was born there christianity 
was brought to this region by saint crispolitus or crispaldo according to the legend a disciple of saint peter as well as of saint bricius bishop of spoleto who at the command of the prince of the apostles in the year fifty eight is said to have consecrated saint crispaldo as bishop in vetona now betona and to have assigned him the charge over the whole district from foligno in the south to nocera in the north under the persecutions of domitian saint crispaldo suffered martyrdom the same fate overtook later three of umbria's bishops saint victorinus about two forty saint sabinus three o three and saint brufinus who was the apostle of assisi in honor of the last named there was erected in assisi in the middle of the twelfth century the beautiful romanesque basilica of san rufino after the designs of john of gubbio and when it was completed it became the cathedral of the place replacing the very old church by the bishop's palace santa maria del vescovado and in this church of san rufino still stands the romanesque baptismal font in which the firstborn of ser pietro and madonna pica received the water of holy baptism one day in september eleven eighty two it is said to have been the twenty sixth a legend which is not older than the fifteenth century says that while madonna pica's hour with francis was come the child could not be born then a pilgrim knocked at the door and when it was opened said that the child would not be born until the mother left the beautiful bedroom went into the stable and there lay upon straw in one of the stalls this was done and hardly was the change effected when the heart-rending cries of the mother ceased and she bore a son whose first cradle like that of the saviour was a manger full of straw in a stable bartholomew of pisa who wrote in the end of the fourteenth century and who in his work liber conformitatum goes very far in drawing analogies between jesus christ and saint francis knew nothing of this story yet it would have exactly suited the scope of his book on the other hand benozzo gazzoli in the year fourteen fifty two painted the birth in the stable upon the walls of the church of st francis in montefalco and sedulius whose historia seraphica appeared in antwerp in the year sixteen thirteen says that he saw the stable in assisi converted into a chapel even today this chapel can be found in assisi it is called san francesco il piccolo st francis the little and over the door can be read the following inscription hoc oratorium fuit bovis et assini stabulum in quo natus est franciscus mundi speculum this oratory was the stable of ox and ass in which st francis the mirror of the world was born the chapel is not far from the place where now the house of the father of st francis is shown and where since the seventeenth century the chiesa nuova new church lifts its baroque walls the bolandists have propounded the theory that the chapel may be part of pietro di bernardone's original house which the family later moved out of while francis was still a child perhaps the name of the chapel little francis led to the development of the legend of the same legendary quality as that of the birth in the stable is another tradition that is first given by wadding this tells us that the same pilgrim who had given the good advice about the flight to the stable was also in the church at the time of the child's baptism immediately after the birth and held the child over the font there is still shown in san rufino's church a stone on which are what resemble footprints it is told by the guide who shows the stone that the pilgrim or the angel in guise of a pilgrim stood upon this stone when saint francis was baptized the seed from which this legend has sprung is undoubtedly a tale which still exists in a manuscript of the so-called legend of the three brothers it is told in it that while the newborn francis was being baptized 
a pilgrim came and knocked at the door and asked to see the child the maid who opened the door naturally refused this request but the stranger declared that he would not go until he obtained his wish ser pietro was not at home and they told the lady of the house what was going on to the astonishment of all she ordered them to do what the pilgrim asked the child was taken out and as soon as the stranger saw the child he took it in his arms just as simeon had taken the divine infant and said to-day there have been born in this street two children and one of them namely this very child shall be one of the best men in the world and the other shall be one of the worst bartholomew of pisa adds that the pilgrim made the sign of a cross upon the right shoulder of the little one warning the nurse to look well after the child for the devil strove after its life and when the stranger had said this he disappeared before the eyes of all in baptism the son of ser pietro had received the name of john the father was absent on a journey to france when the child was born and one of the first things he undertook after his return was to change his firstborn's name from john to francis this name was then rare although not entirely new it was in use in the immediate neighborhood of assisi as the name of the road via francesca which then ran along the west side of the town from san salvatore degli pareti now casa gualdi and ended at san damiano this road is referred to by name in a bull of pope innocent the third published may twenty sixth eleven ninety eight when francis was only fifteen years old and not yet famous enough to have a road called after him many surmises have been made as to why pietro di bernadone changed his son's name the love of the merchant just returning from provence for france must have been a principal motive he wished his son to be a real frenchman in nature and ways a certain protest against the name-giving by the woman of the house may also have played its part st bonaventure says explicitly that the name john was given him by his mother i wish no camel's hair john the baptist but a frenchman with fine nature is what the father's changing of the name may be thought to have meant others hold that the name the frenchman was first bestowed upon the youth as he grew up because of his skill in the french language a skill which certainly was not very great as he never could speak the language perfectly in any case the youth became familiar from youth with the french tongue he also learned latin this part of his education was undertaken by priests in the neighboring church of st george st francis's first biographer thomas of chelano gives us an unpleasant picture of the education of the period he tells us that children were scarcely weaned before they were taught by their elders to both say and do improper things and that from false human respect no one dared to behave honorably and from so bad a twig no good and healthy tree naturally could spring a wasted childhood was followed by a riotous youth christianity was only a name with the young and all their ambition was simply in the direction of seeming worse than they were thomas of chelano was a poet and a rhetorician and it is not easy to know how much weight should be attached to his assertions perhaps he thought of the conditions in his own childhood's home chelano in the abruzzi of the other biographers only julian of spire has anything of the same sort to say and he copies it all from brother thomas at an early age in accordance with a custom still obtaining in italy francis began to assist his father in the shop he soon showed himself adapted for business even more than his forebears julian of spire referred to above says of him in this respect he was a skilful and active business man and lacked only one business trait but this was also very essential he was not economical rather was he absolutely wasteful to understand the cause of this wastefulness 
it is necessary to take a look at the period in which the young merchant grew up it was the end of the twelfth century and beginning of the thirteenth in other words it was the flowery time of knighthood and chivalry europe's ideal was the knight in the life of chivalry as it developed in the courts of love in provence and with the norman kings in sicily in italy the minor courts of este verona and monteferrato contended with the great republics of florence and milan to see who could give the most magnificent tournaments and tilting matches the most celebrated troubadours of france rambaud de vaqueras pierre vidal bernard de ventadour pierre old d'auvergne wandered over the peninsula on endless journeys from court to court and from festival to festival everywhere were to be heard the chanson de geste of provence fables and ballads everywhere were to be heard songs of king arthur and the knights of the round table even in the smallest cities the courts of love were established devoted to the gay science la gaia scienza pietro di bernardone's french son was as it were destined to be caught in this movement he was not like his father only the saving easily contented italian to whom it was enough to accumulate money there flowed through his veins also the sparkling blood of provence he must have enjoyment by means of his money he wanted to change gold into splendor and joy thus francis the richest young man of the place very naturally became what in our days would be called the leading society man of the town he was skilled in earning money but very frivolous in giving it away again says thomas of Celano. no wonder that he soon gathered a circle of friends about him not only from assisi but also from the neighboring villages we even find him seeking a friend in the somewhat distant town of gubbio how did these young men spend their time when they were together like all young men up to the present day in taking their meals together eating well drinking better and finally in high spirits going through the streets of the city arm in arm singing at the top of their voices and disturbing the slumbers of the citizens the austere friar minor from Celano enumerates for us the sins of these wild young men they joked he says were witty said foolish things and wore soft effeminate clothes i remember a day in may a few years ago a day in may in subiaco in the sabine hills i had visited sagro specco st benedict's celebrated hermitage cave and holy scholastics convent i had gone into an inn by the wayside to get a light meal until i could take the train back to rome via mandela i had my meal served in a pleasure house situated on a projecting point of rock so that i looked down between the openings of a screen into a fig orchard's broad-leaved tops lighted by the sun over the fig trees i had a view into the valley where the anio shining like silver rushed down between blue-gray cliffs and far away the village of subiaco with proud towers and spires lifted itself up like a castle on a mountain top in these cheerful exalting and sunny surroundings was a company of youths who were taking their dinner in the same inn with me out in an open veranda which gave a most beautiful view in among the wild mountains they had had a long table set i saw the bright white cloth the mighty flasks the glasses with the red wine and the waiters who ran back and forth with great dishes of macaroni and laughter and song arose but never became ungoverned riot and they stood up in their places and made speeches and after the speaking there was a little cornet playing such thought i to myself were the festivals filled with italian enjoyment and at the same time with italian politeness at which pietro di bernardone's son bore the sceptre as rex as king of the festive party king for a day and an evening 
and if the old franciscan from chelano had been familiar with the wild inspired drinking songs of the youth of the north or with the salaman de Ribon of the german songs of the muse then he would have been milder in passing judgment on these festivals whose delights were as mild and clear as the yellow wine that ripens on the umbrian hillsides but he knew them not and therefore tells us that francis was the worst of all the brawling youths the one who led and misled the others the gilded youth of assisi went from feast to feast and at night they could be heard going through the streets singing to the accompaniment of the lute or violin as if they were a wandering band of troubadours or jongleurs indeed so far did francis go in his admiration for the joyful science of provence that he had a party-colored minstrel suit made for himself which he wore when among his friends even at this early time francis's father had most probably taken his son as associate in his business at any rate the young man had control over considerable sums of money everything that he earned went for pleasure now and then the father could hardly withhold the remark any one would think you were a nobleman's son and not the son of a simple merchant yet none of his elders cared to restrain francis in the life he led and when well-meaning neighbors complained to madonna pica of the wild son she had she used to only answer i have the hope that he too some day will be a son of god it was impossible to say anything really bad about him in all that related to his intercourse with the other sex he was a model it was known among his friends that no one dared say an evil word in his hearing if it happened at once his face assumed a serious almost harsh expression and he did not answer like all the pure of heart francis had great reverence for the mysteries of life he was on the whole decorous in his life and there was only one thing that really offended his family it was that he clung so to his friends that as he sat at the table in his home if a message came from them he would jump up leave the meal and going out would not return to finish his repast in one respect he was worthy of admiration this was his regard for the poor his extravagance extended even to them he was not one of those typical society men who hardly have a penny to give a beggar but willingly spend their hundreds on a champagne feast his way of thinking was the following if i am generous yes even extravagant with my friends who at the best only say thanks to me for them or repay me with another invitation how much greater grounds have i for almsgiving which god himself has promised to repay a hundredfold this was the inspiring life thought of the middle ages which here carried out the genially literal and genially naive translation of the words of the gospel as long as you did it to one of these my least brethren you did it to me francis knew as the whole middle ages knew it that not even a glass of cold water given by the disciples would remain unpaid and unrewarded by the master therefore a pang went through his heart when one day as there was a crowd in the shop and he was in a hurry to get through he had sent a beggar away if this man had come from one of my friends he said to himself from count this or baron that he would have got what he asked for now he comes from the king of kings and from the lord of lords and i let him go away empty-handed i even gave him a repelling word and he determined from that day on to give to every one who asked him in god's name per amor di dio as the italian beggars still are wont to say one effect of his kindness to the poor was perhaps this as bonaventure tells it one of the original characters of the village a half-witted or entire simpleton who travelled around the streets and byways 
every time he met francis took off his cloak and spread it out on the ground and asked the young man to step upon it perhaps it was the same queer fellow perhaps another of the wandering weaklings of the middle ages who used to wander through the streets of assisi calling out ceaselessly pox et bonum peace and good after francis's conversion this warning voice ceased which is treated in the legend as a kind of precursor of the great saint's coming finally francis was endowed with a vivid feeling for nature for it was in provence that this sentiment now so spontaneous in life as in literature found a century later in the works of petrarch its first literary expression since the days of antiquity but already in the half provencal francis it is found fully developed the beauty of the country the charm of the vineyards all that was pleasing to the eye rejoiced him says thomas of chelano and we will not go wrong if we regard this feeling as a part of francis's inheritance from his mother this was then a notable element of his personality and was temporarily only obscured by the spiritual crisis which preceded his conversion as all good which is to grow so must this side of his nature be pruned down even to the very roots but only to bear a still richer crown for as a german mystic has said no one has a true love for created things unless he has first forsaken it for love of god so that it has been dead for him and he dead for it end of book one chapter two book one chapter three of st francis of assisi a biography by johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book one francis the church builder chapter three history of the epic francis grew up in warlike times emperor was opposed to pope prince to king village was against village and burgher against noble francis was but a child when frederick barbarossa at the peace of constance june twenty fifth eleven eighty three to eleven ninety six had to grant the lombardy states all the privileges which they supported by the power of the papacy had conquered for themselves in the battle of legnano eleven seventy six barbarossa's successor henry the sixth eleven eighty three to eleven ninety six meanwhile made the imperial power firm once more in italy and assisi which already in eleven seventy four had been taken by the german royal chancellor archbishop christian of mayence but which in eleven seventy seven had won its communal freedom with its own consuls had to waive its municipal privileges and bow under the imperial duke of spoleto and count of assisi conrad of erslingen a year after the death of king henry innocent the third ascended the papal throne and this powerful prince of the church immediately took the affairs of the italian states into his own strong hand duke conrad had to go to narni and submit himself to the pope and his absence was at once utilized by the citizens for an assault by storm on the zwingberg guarding castle which threatening the city was enthroned on the top of santo rosso the castle was taken and so thoroughly laid waste that when the papal emissary came to take possession of it as property of peter there was only a ruin left the same which still looks down upon assisi and to be prepared to take the consequences of this daring act the citizens determined to erect a wall around their city with spirit all went to work and in the course of an incredibly short time the people of assisi built the city wall with towers which even today has an imposing effect upon the visitor at this time francis was about seventeen years old and as sabatier says it is not unreasonable to suppose 
that on this occasion he acquired that ability in handling stone and mortar which later stood him in good stead at san damiano and portiuncula naturally the greatest part of the work both of tearing down and building up was done by the lower people minores as it was the universal custom to call them the common people thus realized their power and after overcoming the foreign foe the tyrannical german they turned their attention to the foe at home the minor tyrants the noble lords whose fortified residences as later the steens in the flemish cities stood here and there in the village a real civil war broke out the nobles houses were besieged many of them were burned and the fall of the nobility seemed inevitable then the nobles of assisi turned in their need to assisi's former enemy the neighboring and powerful perugia ambassadors from assisi's nobility promised to recognize perugia's supremacy over the city whenever she could come to their assistance the republic of perugia then stood at the summit of its power and greatness and eagerly seized the opportunity to reduce assisi to subjection its army advanced into the field to the relief of the besieged nobility the citizens of assisi did not lose courage together with such of the nobility as had remained true to their ancestral city they met the troops of perugia at the bridge of san giovanni on the plain between the two cities victory fell to the perugians and a quantity of the combatants of assisi were taken prisoners among them also francis on account of his noble appearance the young merchant's son was not put in prison with the rest of the citizens but just as the laws of many old french cities provide for a les bourgeois en robe he received permission to share the lot of the nobility the defeat at ponte san giovanni took place in the year twelve o two the imprisonment in perugia lasted a year and during it francis astounded his fellow prisoners by his constant cheerfulness although there seemed little reason to be contented he was always to be heard singing and joking and when the others peevishly or angrily rebuked him he answered only do you not know that a great future awaits me and that all the world shall then fall down and pray to me this is the first expression of his firm conviction of his future the definite certainty that a great future belonged to him which is so remarkable in st francis in these years of his youth in november twelve o three peace was declared between the two contending powers the conditions were that the citizens of assisi should repair the damage they had done to the property of the nobles and that the nobles should on their part not be free to enter into any alliance without permission of the city francis was now liberated with the other prisoners among whom he who had formerly been an apostle of happiness now assumed the role of peacemaker for there was among the prisoner warriors one who on account of his pride and unreasonableness was very unpopular with all instead of avoiding this difficult character francis undertook to be in his company and went so far in this direction during the time of captivity that the ill-humoured unreasonable prisoner changed and was received into the circle of his companions whence he had exiled himself the long intercourse with the noble prisoners seems to have affected the young merchant's heart with a greater attachment to the ways of life of the nobility than ever which in the years following the imprisonment twelve o three to twelve o six became very evident in him it was now that he became a disciple of the gay science of provence it was now that he submerged himself in the whirl of festivities and enjoyments out of which his sickness which in his twenty-third year brought him so near to the portals of death was first to rescue him and even at that not too securely end of book one chapter three
Book One, Chapter Four of St. Francis of Assisi, A Biography, by Johannes Jornson, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book One, Francis the Church Builder, Chapter Four, Francis Becomes a Soldier. For even now he was a long way from conversion. He had realized his soul's barrenness, but he had found nothing with which to fill it. As his convalescence progressed and his strength returned, in such measure did he return to his worldly life and trod again the same paths as before his sickness. The only difference was that he had no enjoyment now in the life he led. There was a sort of unrest in him that gave him no peace there was a thorn in his soul that ceaselessly irritated him more than ever he dreamed of great deeds of strange adventures and of achievements in strange and distant lands and again the life of chivalry presented itself to him as the only one which would assuage his soul's indefinable longing to attain the highest from his youth he had been intimate with the romances of king arthur and the knights of the round table he too would be a knight of the holy grail he too would go out into the world offer his blood for the cause of the greatest and highest and for this was not excluded from his thoughts he could return home crowned with undying laurels just at this time the middle ages long-standing dispute between emperor and pope had entered on a new phase henry the sixth's widow had invoked the guardianship of innocent the third for the heir to the throne afterwards the emperor frederick the second one of the oldest of the emperor's generals named markwald made the claim that it was he who in virtue of the will should properly be regent for king and kingdom but innocent had no idea of giving up what he had undertaken and was prepared to defend his cause with arms the war was carried on in southern italy because the widow queen constance being heir to the norman kings was also queen of sicily innocent suffered for a long time one defeat after another until he entrusted his army to duke walter the third of brienne who in the name of his norman wife albinia laid claim to tarentum this illustrious leader overcame the germans in a series of defeats at capua at lecce at barletta and his fame spread over all italy and inspired all the land the germans were hated everywhere in sicily the word german signified coarse impolite unjust the french troubadour pierre vidal wandered through lombardy and sang sarcastic songs about the germans i would not be a nobleman in friesland he sang if i had to hear the language they speak there it sounds like geese not like the language of men all that was young proud and noble in italy rose against the foreign dominion and walter of brienne's name seemed to wave over inspired ranks like a banner blessed by the pope the national inspiration reached even assisi one of the nobles of the place armed himself to go with a little troop to the aid of walter's army in apulia as soon as francis heard this a feverish longing took possession of him here was the chance he so long had wished for here was the moment which must not be allowed to escape now or never was the time the nobleman from assisi should take francis with him in his troop and duke walter should knight him with all his zeal francis pondered over the means of carrying this plan into effect he was seized by wild joy such as one feels when preparing for a new and as one may hope an entrancing epoch of life a sort of wonder-lust mastered him he ran rather than walked through the streets his friends found that his usual good humour had risen to an excessive height and asked him the reason therefore when he would answer with glittering eyes i know that i am now going to be a great prince it goes without saying that nothing was spared in equipping the young merchant's son for war 
one of his biographers says that all of his clothes were individual and costly this was what was to be expected in the extravagant and luxurious rich young man but what is also completely characteristic of him is that when just before starting he met one of his fellow travellers a nobleman and saw that he on account of his poverty could not clothe and arm himself properly francis gave all his costly equipment to him and took the nobleman's poor things in exchange engrossed as he was in the new life he naturally dreamt every night of war and weapons the very night after he had been so generous to the poor knight such a dream came to him and it seemed to him more pregnant with meaning than any of the others it seemed to him that he perhaps to bid farewell stood in his father's shop but instead of the rolls of goods which usually filled the shelves from floor to ceiling he saw now on all sides shining shields bright spears shining armor and as he wondered he heard a voice which said all this shall belong to you and to your warriors it was only natural that francis should take this dream for a good omen and one bright morning he sprang upon his horse to go with the rest of the little troop to apuya their road led them through the present porta nuovo to foligno and from foligno to spoleto here they approached the flaminian way the road to rome and south italy and here francis had nearly reached the goal of his warlike journey for the same hand which had formerly cast him upon a sick-bed to bring him to reflection and realization again grasped him in spoleto an attack of fever forced him to take to his bed and as he lay there between sleeping and waking it happened that he heard a voice asking him where he wanted to go to apulia to be a knight was the invalid's answer tell me francis who can benefit you most the lord or the servant the lord answered francis in astonishment then why do you desert the lord repeated the voice for the servant and the prince for his vassal then francis knew who it was who spoke to him and in the words of paul cried out lord what do you wish me to do but the voice answered go back to your home there it shall be told you what you are to do for the vision you saw must be understood in another way the voice ceased and francis awoke the rest of the night he lay awake but when morning came he silently arose saddled his horse and rode back to assisi in all his warlike equipment which now suddenly seemed to him so vain we do not know what reception awaited him at home but we can imagine it this like all his other eccentricities was undoubtedly soon forgiven him and for a good while he was again the centre of his friend's joyous circle soon the old life with feasting and enjoyment was in full swing again was francis the one who in spite of all had to be acknowledged as the leader of his circle of young men flos juvenum if his feudal trip towards apuya was referred to he replied very definitely that he certainly had given it up but only to do great things in his own land he really had less confidence than he assumed opposing emotions contended in his soul now he listened to the voice of the world only now he longed to serve the lord whose inspiring voice had spoken so pleadingly to him that night in spoleto stronger and stronger the feeling arose in him to withdraw from all and in loneliness to become sure of his calling but if he sought friends no more they sought him and to avoid all appearance of parsimony he was the same luxurious host as before and thus it happened that one evening it was in the summer of twelve o five invitations were sent out in his usual way for a festival which was to be richer and more sumptuous than ever he was to be the king of the feast 
and when the table was cleared all joined in overwhelming him with praise and thanks after the dinner the company as usual went singing through the streets but francis who kept a, a little behind the others did not sing little by little he drooped behind his friends soon he was alone in the quiet night in some one of assisi's small steep streets or in one of its small open squares from which one looks out so far over the landscape and there it came to pass that the lord again visited him the heart of francis which was weary of the world and of its vanities was filled with such a sweetness that there was room for no other feeling he lost all consciousness of himself and if he had been cut to pieces limb by limb as he himself later told it he would not have known it would never have tried by a movement to escape it how long he stood there overcome by the heavenly sweetness he never knew he first came back to himself when one of his friends who had gone back in search of him called out hello francis are you thinking of your honeymoon and looking up to heaven where the stars were shining then now as in the serene august night the young man answered yes i am thinking of marrying but the bride i am going to woo is nobler richer and fairer than any woman you know then his friends laughed for a number had approached and the wine had made them loquacious then the tailor will again have a job just as when you started to apulia we may think some of them said with a sneer francis heard their laughter and was angry but not with them for in sudden light the whole of his former life was before him in its folly its lack of object its childish vanity he saw himself in all his pitiful reality and in front of him stood in shining beauty the life he hitherto had not led the true life the just life the beautiful noble rich life life in jesus christ in this aspect francis could be angry at no one but himself and therefore the old legend says also that from that hour he began to value himself little end of book one chapter four book one chapter five of saint francis of assisi a biography by johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book one francis the church builder chapter five the conversion an author of the fifteenth century saint antonine of florence thirteen eighty nine to fourteen fifty nine in his chronicles of the church has put the summary of francis's activities in the first year which followed his parting from his friends and the joyous life into two lines he now kept in hiding in hermit caves and now piously built up ruined churches solitary prayer and personal work for the kingdom of god were the two means by which the rich man's son young spoiled and worldly sought to ascertain the will of god as applied to his own case a little way outside of the city there was a cave in the cliff where he liked to go to pray sometimes alone but oftener with one of his friends the only one who seems to have remained true to him after his change of mind none of his biographers has preserved for us this man's name thomas of chelano only says that he was a distinguished person francis had by nature a strong inclination to speak of his experiences his biographers say of him that even against his will he would speak of things which occupied him it is no wonder that he confided in a friend and in the metaphor of the bible told of the costly treasure which he had found in the cave outside the city and which only needed to be dug out of the soil 
but he had to be alone to raise the treasure therefore he left his friend outside while he went in by himself and there apart in the dark cave francis found the secret chamber where he could pray to his heavenly father day by day the desire to do the will of god increased until he had no peace until he had clearly determined what it was that god asked of him again and again were the words of the psalmist on his lips the words which are the foundation of all true worship of god show o lord thy ways to me and teach me thy paths psalm twenty four verse four and against this pure ideal his past life stood out dark and repulsive with increasing bitterness he thought of his past youth and it delighted him no longer to think over its delights and extravagances but what was to be done not to fall back again had he not time and again been warned and had he not time and again despised the warning and again followed his inclinations when friends again called on him when the wine once more seduced him when the smell of the feasts again reached him and the sounds of violin and lute rang in his ears would he then have power to resist would he not as before immerse himself in the glad world of festivity and drinking which hovered like a golden heaven over the dark everyday world francis did not depend upon himself and god seemed unwilling to give him the desired word of help which he asked for in agony of mind and desolation of soul francis fought the battle of his salvation in the loneliness and darkness of the cave and when he finally torn and tortured again approached in the light of day his friends hardly recognized him his face seemed so haggard thus francis became a man of prayer he had begun to taste the sweetness of prayer and prayed continually it often happened that as he would be going through the streets or about his home he would stop everything to go off into a church to pray francis's father seems to have been away from home a great deal during this period of change in his son's nature the mother who according to the authorities loved francis more than her other children let him do just what he wished in one sense he had the same life as before only that the poor had taken the place of his friends it was they he sought it was to them he gave feasts one day when his mother and he were to sit at table together he laid out such a quantity of bread that there was enough for a large family when his mother asked the reason for such profusion he answered that he had intended it all for the poor if he met a beggar in the street who asked for alms he gave him all the money he had with him but if his money was all gone he would give him his hat or his belt sometimes when he had nothing else he would take the poor man with him to a secluded place take off his shirt and give it to him he also began to think about poor priests and poor churches he bought church goods and sent them secretly to places where they were wanting this is the first indication we have of francis's vivid interest manifest in his after life for everything relating to churches and which among others found expression in his sending to all provinces good and fine irons to make fine and white altar bread with but first of all the poor were in his thoughts to see them to hear their troubles to help them in their necessities these were hereafter his principal concerns and little by little the desire was firmly established within his heart if i could only find by personal experience how it felt to be poor how it is to be not one of those who go by and throw down a shilling but to be the one who stands in rags and dirt and humbly bowing stretches out his faded hat for alms many a time we may think he stood among the beggars at some church door stood among them while they pitifully asked for a mite 
but it was not like him to do only this he himself must do the begging in order to understand poverty and this could not be done in assisi where every one knew him it was this which inspired him with the idea of going on a pilgrimage to rome there in the great city no one knew him there he could put his plan into execution perhaps there were some particular circumstances which brought near to him this idea of a pilgrimage to the apostle's grave from september fourteenth twelve o four until march twenty fifth twelve o six and again from april four until may eleventh twelve o six innocent the third had transferred the papal residence to the bishopric of st peter so long a stay by the unhealthy waters of the tiber may have had some connection with special church functions in st peter's perhaps the granting of some indulgence the bishop of assisi at this time was also going on a journey to rome however all this may be francis went to rome we know only a little of his first visit to the eternal city he approached by the flaminian way and apparently at once went to st peter's here he met many other pilgrims and saw that they as was the custom in the middle ages threw coins as offerings through the fenestrella or grated window of the apostle's tomb the majority of the gifts were only small pieces francis stood a while and watched then the last sign of his old desire to show off appeared he pulled out his well-filled purse and threw a whole handful of coins in through the grating so that the money flew about and rang as it fell and all the people were astonished and looked at him the next minute francis had left the church and called one of the beggars aside and a moment after he had at last fulfilled the purpose of the whole journey as a real beggar clothed in real rags he stood among the other beggars on the steps which led up to the church of his sensations at this moment we know enough when we read in one of his biographers that he begged in french which he liked to talk although he never could do it perfectly for him french was the language of poetry the language of religion the language of his happiest memories and of his most solemn hours the language he spoke when his heart was too full to find expression in everyday italian and therefore his soul's mother speech when francis talked french those who knew him knew that he was happy how long francis stayed in rome is unknown to us he may have started back the day after his arrival the authorities only say that after he had shared the beggar's meal he took off the borrowed clothes put on his own and went home to assisi he had now had the great experience of what it was to be poor he had worn rags and eaten the bread of necessity and although it must have been a happiness to be in his own good clothes again and to sit at home at his mother's profuse table yet he also felt the spiritual fascination which contentment and poverty can inspire what a delight it can be to own nothing on this earth except a drink of water from the spring a crust of bread from the hand of a merciful man and a night's lodging under the blue heavens with its shining stars why should he be troubled about so many things about goods and money house and garden people and flocks when so little is enough does not the gospel say blessed are the poor and it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven questions of this sort certainly troubled francis after his return from rome with greater zeal than ever he called out to god for guidance and light the friend who used to accompany him to the cave seems now to have wearied of going on this search for treasures that was always fruitless the only man to whom francis now and then revealed himself 
was bishop guido of assisi who probably was his confessor the light cast upon this period by the testament which francis has left us has therefore a special value for us in this document which was written the year before the saint's death we are told the lord granted me to begin my conversion so that as long as i lived in my sins i felt it very bitter to see the lepers but the lord took me among them and i exercised mercy towards them for the lepers occupied a very particular position among the sick and poor of the middle ages based on a passage in the prophet isaiah chapter fifty three verse four the lepers were looked upon as an image of the redeemer more than all other sufferers as early as the days of gregory the great we find the story of the monk martyrius who met a leper by the wayside who from pain and weariness was fallen to the ground and could drag himself no further martyrius wrapped the sick man in his cloak and carried him to his convent but the leper changed in his arms to jesus himself who rose to heaven as he blessed the monk and said to him martyrius thou art not ashamed of me on earth i will not be ashamed of thee in heaven a similar legend is told of saint julian of saint leo the ninth and of the blessed columbini and so the lepers were more than any others an object for pious care during the middle ages for them was founded a special order of knights knights of lazarus whose whole office was to take care of the lepers so too there were erected all over europe the numerous houses of st george where the lepers were taken care of in a sort of cloistered life of these lepers homes there were nineteen thousand in the thirteenth century but in spite of everything the life of the leper was sad enough they were repulsed by the rest of humanity and they were hedged in by severe laws isolating them and hemming them in on all sides as with all other cities there was also in the vicinity of assisi a leper's hospital the lepers were in fact the first real hospital patients and in some languages their name expresses this fact the hospital lay midway between assisi and portiuncula near where the words casa gualdi appear over the entrance to a large estate it was called san salvatore della pariti and was owned by an order of crucigers founded under alexander the third for the care of the lepers on his walks in this place francis now and then passed by the hospital but the mere sight of it had filled him with horror he would not even give an alms to a leper unless someone else would take it for him especially when the wind blew from the hospital and the weak nauseating odor peculiar to the leper came across the road he would hurry past with averted face and fingers in his nostrils it was in this that he felt his greatest weakness and in it he was to win his greatest victory for one day as he was as usual calling upon god it happened that the answer came and the answer was this francis everything which you have loved and desired in the flesh it is your duty to despise and hate if you wish to know my will and when you have begun thus all that which now seems to you sweet and lovely will become intolerable and bitter and all which you used to avoid will turn itself to great sweetness and exceeding joy these were the words which at last gave francis a definite program which showed him the way he was to follow he certainly pondered over these words in his lonely rides over the umbrian plain and just as he one day woke out of reverie he found the horse making a sudden movement and saw on the road before him only a few steps distant a leper in his familiar uniform francis started and even his horse shared in the movement 
and his first impulse was to turn and flee as fast as he could but there were the words he had heard within himself so clearly before him what you used to abhor shall be to you joy and sweetness and what had he hated more than the lepers here was the time to take the lord at his word to show his good will and with a mighty victory over himself francis sprang from the horse approached the leper from whose deformed countenance the awful odor of corruption issued forth placed his alms in the outstretched wasted hand bent down quickly and kissed the fingers of the sick man covered with the awful disease whilst his system was nauseated with the action when he again sat upon his horse he hardly knew how he had got there he was overcome by excitement his heart beat he knew not whither he rode but the lord had kept his word sweetness happiness and joy streamed into his soul flowed and kept flowing although his soul seemed full and more full like the clear stream which filling an earthen vessel keeps on pouring and flows over its rim with an ever clearer purer stream the next day francis voluntarily wandered down the road he had hitherto always avoided the road to san salvatore della pareti and when he reached the gate he knocked and when it was opened to him he entered from all the cells the sick came swarming out came with their half-destroyed faces blind inflamed eyes with club feet with swollen corrupted arms and fingerless hands and all this dreadful crowd gathered around the young merchant and the odor from their unclean swellings was so strong that francis against his will for a moment had to hold his breath to save himself from sickness but he soon recovered control of himself he drew out the well-filled purse he had brought with him and began to deal out his alms and on every one of the dreadful hands that were reached out to take his gifts he imprinted a kiss as he had done the day before thus it was that francis won the greatest victory man can win the victory over oneself from now on he was master of himself and not like the most of us his own slave but even the greatest victor in the spiritual field must be ever on the watch for his always vigilant enemy francis had conquered in great things the tempter tried now to bring him to defeat in small things francis continued as before to go every day to his oratory in the cave outside the city to pray there now it often happened that on the way there he met a humpbacked old woman one of the common deformed creatures who in the south so willingly betake themselves to the sheltering obscurity of the churches they can be seen there all day long rattling their rosaries or dozing in a corner but the instant a stranger approaches they draw the kerchief around their heads limp out from their corner and mutter piteously with outstretched hand un soldo signore un soldo signorino mio a penny sir a penny sir such a pitiful old beggar was it who now every day limped across the young man's path and it happened that in the newly converted young soul there arose a repugnance and a resistance a repugnance to the dirt and misery of the old woman a resistance to her troublesome ways and to her persistency and as he went on his way and the sun shone and the fields were green and the distant mountains shone gray blue a voice whispered within him and are you willing to give up all this are you willing to abandon it all you will give up light and sun life and joy the cheerful open-air feasts and will shut yourself up in a cave and waste your best years in useless prayers and finally become an old fool shaking with the palsy who pitifully wanders about from church to church and perhaps in secret sighs and mourns over his wasted life 
thus the wicked enemy whispered into the young man's soul and this was the moment when francis's youth and light loving eyes and knightly soul weakened but as he reached his cave he always succeeded in conquering himself and the harder the struggle had been the deeper was the peace which followed the joy and the hope all in converse with god end of book one chapter five book one chapter six of saint francis of assisi a biography by johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book one francis the church builder chapter six the message in san damiano god gave me also thus saint francis speaks where in his testament he speaks of his youth god gave me also so great a confidence in the churches that i simply prayed and said this we pray to thee lord jesus christ here and in all thy churches all over the whole world and we bless thee because with thy holy cross thou hast redeemed the world and then the lord gave me and still gives me so great a confidence in priests who live by the right of the holy roman church that if they ever persecuted me i would for the sake of their consecration say nothing about it and if i had the wisdom of solomon and travelled in the parishes of poor priests yet i would not preach without their permission and them and all other priests i will fear love and honour as my superiors and i will not look on their faults for i see god's son in them and they are my superiors and i do this because here on earth i see nothing of the son of the highest god except his most holy body and blood which the priests receive and which only they give to others and these solemn secrets i will honour and venerate above everything and keep them in the most sacred places we have here from the last year of francis's life the most authentic testimony as to his feeling all through his life towards the church and the clergy and this testimony coming from himself accords exactly with all that his biographers tell us about the same phase of his character it has already been told how francis showed his interest in church affairs in supplying poor churches with proper vestments and the like the environs of assisi even to-day contain enough of such small churches road and field chapels often half in ruin their doors are frequently locked so seldom are they used one can look into them through low windows outside of which kneeling benches are often placed and on the altar there will be seen a torn cloth laid awry wooden vases with dusty paper flowers and wooden candlesticks which were once gilded but are now cracked and grey nevertheless there can be something very devotional in such lonely deserted churches if they are open so that one can enter perhaps on the walls will be found half obliterated old frescoes painted by those disciples of giotto or simone martini who in the fourteenth century seem to have personally visited the most remote of the smaller cities and villages of the apennines the holy water font is long empty and full of dust but as one kneels in prayer the wind is heard sighing through the chestnut groves or a mountain stream foams in the solemn loneliness the old church of san damiano a little outside of and below the city was such a half-ruined chapel in the time of francis's youth the road to it has not changed much in the seven centuries which have passed it slopes rather steeply and passes by a broad whitewashed house with large yellow grain houses of the shape of beehives around it and among the olive groves where the corn grows luxuriantly 
under the gnarled olive tree's fine silver-gray web of branches and leaves in fifteen minutes walking san damiano is reached which now is a convent occupied by brown franciscans in the days of francis's youth san damiano was only a little tottering field chapel whose material adornment consisted of a large byzantine crucifix over the high altar in front of this crucifix francis was often wont to pray and thus it happened to him that once a little while after his visit to the lepers he knelt one day in prayer before the image of the crucified one within the church of san damiano after he had placed himself in thought upon the cross for the first time this spiritual crucifixion became a favorite exercise for his meditations with an imploring gaze fixed upon the hallowed countenance of jesus he uttered the following prayer which tradition has preserved for us great and glorious god my lord jesus christ i implore thee to enlighten me and to dispel the darkness of my soul give me true faith and firm hope and a perfect charity grant me o lord to know thee so well that in all things i may act by thy light and in accordance with thy holy will the whole of the young man's striving in the year that had passed since he had stood on the roadside not far from san damiano and had found the world empty and his soul a waste are gathered together and framed in this simple and profound prayer this it was that he had always sought for and wished for through all his errors and weakness light to see the will of god and to act in accordance therewith the whole of his life from that time up to this moment had been one reception in many forms but with increasing fervor of the words speak lord for thy servant heareth and so it came to pass that god deigned to speak to this servant francis from the crucifix came a voice that could only be heard within the heart and what the voice said was this now go hence francis and build up my house for it is nearly falling down and just as that time in spoleto when he was commanded to abandon his journey to aquila francis was at once ready to obey the divine message simple and literal as he was he looked about him in the old chapel and saw that it was nearly falling down and trembling under the solemnity of the moment he answered the crucified one who had vouchsafed to speak to him lord with joy will i do what thou wishest at last god had heard his prayer at last god had set him to work and quick in his movements as francis was he at once set to work to carry out the lord's directions outside the door he found the priest of the place a poor old father sitting in the sun on a stone bench the young man approached him deferentially kissed his hand in greeting took out his purse and gave to the astonished priest a considerable sum of money saying i beg you to buy oil with this money so that there shall always be a lamp burning before the crucifix within and you may let me know when there is no more and i will supply it again before the old priest could recover from his astonishment francis was gone his heart was overflowing his soul was trembling with the great event that had happened to him as he went along he made now and then the sign of the cross and it seemed as if he each time imprinted deeper and deeper the image of the crucified one upon his heart unsurpassably true and incomparably beautiful the old legend goes on to say that from that hour the thought of the sufferings of our lord made francis's heart melt so that he from now on as long as he lived bore in his heart the wounds of our lord jesus 
but more money was needed to build up san damiano's church than what francis had with him at the moment but in the interim he had not the least doubt as to how he should get the necessary means as fast as his feet could carry him he hurried home took some rolls of fine cloth out of the shop loaded a pack-horse with it and took the road to foligno to bring his goods to the market in this large neighboring city as he had been wont to do in the course of a short time he had sold both goods and horse and was back with the money to san damiano the distance between the two places is only a couple of miles and francis rode on the outward trip perhaps he found the priest still on the stone bench sunning himself as he returned in any case the young man found him and as he again greeted him reverentially he put the whole sum of money no inconsiderable one which his transaction had brought him into the priest's lap with the words that it was for the restoration of the church the priest had accepted the former and less considerable alms but when francis now came with all this sum of money and wished to give it to him he feared that something was wrong and said no perhaps he thought that it was one of the young society man's wild impulses and that the gift was not seriously meant in any case he wanted to stand well with pietro di bernardone and was therefore determined to have nothing more to do with the affair in vain did francis sit down by the side of the old priest and use all his powers of persuasion to weaken his determination all was futile francis only obtained this much the priest would permit him to live at san damiano for a while to devote himself without interruption to prayer and works of piety from now on francis was virtually ordained to lead what was called in the middle ages a religious life that is to say the life of a monk or hermit he did not think of entering a convent in his testament he says himself that no one showed him the way to his vita religiosa but that the almighty taught it to him but in referring to the change that came to him at this time he uses the exact classical expression in the same place which designates the entering an order to leave the world exivi de seculo he says i abandoned the world the time he was now to spend with the priest in san damiano can be properly regarded as his novitiate but a novitiate in which the spirit of god alone was his teacher director and taskmaster near the priest's house there was a cave and true to his custom francis had chosen this as his prayer chamber here he spent nights and days in prayer and fasting with tears and unspeakable groanings while these things were occurring pietro di bernardone had been on one of his business trips now he returned home and did not find his son pica did not know what had become of him or if she did know would not tell but however this may be the old merchant soon found his son's hiding place and betook himself thither but did not find francis who was hidden in his cave meanwhile the priest seems to have utilized the opportunity to give pietro di bernardone the money from his son's business transaction francis had laid it aside in a window recess in the church the disappearance of the cloth and of the horse had naturally been one of the causes of the coming of pietro di bernardone after he had recovered the money he went home much quieted and spent a whole month without making any new attempt to find or to speak to his firstborn food was meanwhile brought to him in the cave from his home probably by his mother's contrivance it is fair to say that francis employed this month to imbue himself in the great thought which from now on presented itself to him as the essence of christianity the life of christ the crucified in every one of the faithful the epistle of paul to the romans is one of the biblical writings francis most frequently quotes 
it is precisely in this book that paul appears more strongly than elsewhere to be not only the great christian dogmatic but also the great christian mystic this is neither scientific hypothesis nor flower of literature but is in accordance with the facts when i find the emotions of the young son of the italian merchant in this time of proof and probation at san damiano expressed in these words of the eighth chapter of the epistle to the romans there is now therefore no condemnation to them that are in christ jesus who walk not according to the flesh for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus hath delivered me from the law of sin and of death that the justification of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit for if you live according to the flesh you shall die but if by the spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh you shall live for whosoever are led by the spirit of god they are the sons of god for the spirit himself giveth testimony to our spirit that we are the sons of god and if sons heirs also heirs indeed of god and joint heirs with christ yet so if we suffer with him that we may be also glorified with him for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be made conformable to the image of his son it is probable that to this month at san damiano we may assign an occurrence preserved for us in the legends without any more exact chronology francis was seen one day wandering around on the plain below assisi in the vicinity of a little old chapel which was called portiuncula or santa maria degli angeli our lady of the angels he wandered around the chapel sighing and weeping as if overcome by a great sorrow a passer-by approached him and asked in sympathy what had gone wrong with him and why he wept then francis answered i am weeping over the sufferings of my lord jesus christ and i will not be ashamed to wander around the whole world and weep over them this so affected the stranger that he too began to shed tears and they wept together thus for francis of assisi the life began not after the flesh but after the spirit which was to lead him ever higher until he approached as near as man can attain to the image of jesus christ the crucified end of book one chapter six book one chapter seven of saint francis of assisi a biography by johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book one francis the church builder chapter seven the abandonment of his home and father one april day in the year 1207 pietro di barnadone stood behind the counter in his shop when he heard a great noise in the street the sound of many voices shouting screaming and laughter the noise approached nearer and nearer now it seemed to be at the nearest corner the old merchant signed to one of his clerks to run out and see what was going on un paso messer pietro was the clerk's contemptuous report it is a crazy man whom the boys are chasing the clerk stood yet a moment and turned around white in the face he had seen who the crazy man was and a moment after pietro di bernadone stood in the doorway and saw in the midst of the howling crowd who now were close to the house his son his francis his firstborn for whom he had dreamt such great things and for whom he had nourished such bright hopes there he came now home at last in a disgraceful company pale and emaciated to the eye with dishevelled hair and dark rings under his eyes bleeding from the stones thrown at him covered with the dirt of the street which the boys had cast upon him 
this was his francis the pride of his eyes the support of his age the joy of his life and his comfort it had come to this to this had all these crazy cursed ideas brought him sorrow shame and anger almost overcame pietro di bernardone nearer and nearer came the shouting and howling throng mercilessly grinning they called to him where he stood upon his steps see here pietro di bernardone we bring you your pretty son your proud knight now he is coming home from the war in aquila and has won the princess and half the kingdom the old merchant could control himself no longer he had to give way to rage to avoid weeping like a wild beast he ran down into the mob striking and kicking to right and left until the crowd fairly frightened opened and dispersed without a word he seized his son and took him up into his arms his rage gave the old man a giant's strength raging and gritting his teeth he bore francis through the house and finally threw him almost exhausted and out of his senses down upon the floor in a dark cellar where he locked him in with trembling hands he stuck the keys in his belt and returned to his work pietro di bernardone's hope was to overcome his son's last madness with a good term of carcere to use the german student's expression to the dark prison he added therefore in addition a diet of bread and water thinking that he would thus reach his son's weak point whose sweet tooth he had known since his early days but the old days were gone and francis had changed he was approaching the times when he would sprinkle ashes on his food if it tasted too good saying to his brothers that brother ashes was chaste and when messer petro after the lapse of a few days had to go out again and fru pica opened the door of the prison hoping to do with her tears and prayers that which imprisonment and hunger had not accomplished she found her son uncowed and unsubdued yes glad to have suffered something for his convictions after she realized that francis would not give up his new mode of life she took advantage of the absence of her husband and set the prisoner at liberty and as a bird flies to its nest francis at once returned to his refuge by san damiano pietro di bernardone soon returned from his trip and found the cage empty instead of again seeking his son in san damiano he tried the law he turned to the lawyers of the city for the purpose of disinheriting his erring son or at any rate of banishing him from the locality furthermore he wanted to get back all the money that francis was in possession of apparently the mother had not let her son go away from home empty-handed perhaps all the money of the foligno transaction was not yet spent in the words of the chronicler mariano pietro di bernardone was republicae benefactor et provisor a benefactor and guardian of the republic one of the city's greatest benefactors nothing was more likely than that the authorities would seek to accede to his request and the herald of the state was sent down to arrest francis on his part he refused to obey the summons answering by the grace of god i am now a free man and not obliged to appear before the court because i am only the servant of the highest god as Sabatier has remarked, this answer can only be taken in the sense that Francis had now received the lower orders, and so came under the jurisdiction of the church. The intimate relations between him and the bishop of Assisi give this supposition great probability. The father seems to have awaited the return of the herald in the city hall. In any case, the lawyers let him know at once that they to their sorrow had to let the case go pietro di bernardone however would not let the legal prosecution thus begun cease and shortly brought his complaint into the episcopal palace on the piazza del vescovado before the representatives of the church 
the affair was here taken up and at an appointed time father and son met before the bishop from the first it was evident on whose side his sympathies were the motive which he adduced to persuade francis to return all the money he might have received from his father was anything but acceptable to pietro di bernardone if it is your desire to serve god said he to the young man then give his mammon back to your father which perhaps has been obtained by unjust methods and therefore should not be used for the benefit of the church these words said in the presence of the numerous hearers who had come to the palace to hear the celebrated suit between one of the city's most distinguished men and his crazy son were not adapted to pacify the old merchant all eyes turned from him to his son who sat on the other side of the bishop still clothed in his costly scarlet clothes and now something wonderful happened something that never before had happened in the world's history and never will happen again something which the painters of succeeding centuries should immortalize which poets should sing of and priests preach about francis stood up in silence with streaming eyes my lord said he turning towards the bishop i will not only give him the money cheerfully but also the clothes i have received from him and before any one had time to think what he intended to do he had disappeared into an adjoining room back of the courtroom a moment later to reappear naked except for a girdle of hair cloth about his loins and with his clothes on his arm all involuntarily stood up pietro di bernardone and his son francis were face to face and with a voice that trembled with emotion the young man said as he looked over the heads of the audience as if he saw someone or something in the distance listen all of you to what i have to say hitherto i have called pietro di bernardone father now i return to him his money and all the clothes i got from him so that hereafter i shall not say father pietro di bernardone but our father who art in heaven and francis bent down and laid his clothes of scarlet and fine linen at his father's feet along with a lot of money a mighty movement ran through the audience many began to weep even the bishop had tears in his eyes only pietro di bernardone was unmoved with a face of stone he stooped down white with rage but without uttering a word and took up the clothes and money then the bishop stepped over to francis spread his cape over him and clothed the naked young man in its white folds as he pressed him to his heart from now on francis was what he so long had wished to be the servant of god only and a man of the church when the first strong emotion was over and francis was alone with the bishop he began to think of clothing for the young man in the bishop's residence there was found an old cloak which had been the property of the gardener francis took this with delight and as he left the bishop's palace drew with a bit of chalk he had found a cross on the back of the poor garment it was in april twelve o seven that pietro di bernardone's son thus literally complied with the words of the gospel to forsake everything and taking up the cross to follow jesus the umbrian april is equivalent in point of view of the season to may or better june in denmark the clear sun shines day after day brightly from a clear sky the air is fresh and healthy purified by the many downpours of the winter's rain the roads are not yet dusty but firm and good to travel over and the corn is growing under the olive trees bright green and of half its final height sprinkled with quantities of bright red poppies it is the most beautiful of the italian seasons far better than the unhealthy torrid fever-bearing autumn it was on such a sunny april morning 
that pietro de bordone's son clothed in the old gardener's cloak left the bishop's palace in assisi to go out into the world like one of those evangelic strangers and pilgrims the scripture tells of every man's life is the fruit of his innermost will and therefore francis had attained that which he so long had striven for that which he had put to the proof in rome what he had prayed for in the solitude of the umbrian cave to be allowed to follow the naked and suffering saviour himself naked and suffering francis wandered forth from the home of his youth and from the city of his early days from father and mother from family and friends from all his past and all his memories he went neither out to san damiano nor down the plain to portiuncula's little chapel there are moments in the life of man when the soul is drawn to the greatest things in nature's gift to the mountains or to the sea francis wandered forth from assisi by the gate in the direction of monte subasio on the road which takes one up the mountain and remembering the words of the gospel about him who lays his hand to the plough he certainly never looked back until the towers and roofs of assisi were long out of sight beneath him and he found himself alone on the heights of monte subasio in a young oak woods or among great barren fields of stone hence his glance wandered far over the world the valley of spoleto lay under his feet as if seen from an air balloon with its white roads bright rivers fields with olive trees in regular order and houses and churches like toys the mountains which below us easy hem in the horizon seemed sunken down and low and behind them higher ones of paler blue lift up their summits the far distant apennines francis had started off in the direction of gubbio in this village which in a straight line is only four or five miles from assisi lived one of the friends of his earliest youth perhaps the same friend who used to go with him to discover the treasure in the cave it inevitably takes time to wander about the mountains day was already waning and francis had not yet crossed the wild wood-grown mountainside that separates assisi from valfabrica still he wandered along confidently and sang in french the praises of god as he was wont to do in the happiest moments of his life then there was a rustling among the dry leaves that spread the ground the branches and twigs were disturbed and a robber band broke out from concealment with a threatening who is there undisturbed francis answered i am the herald of the great king but what is it that you desire the highwayman looked for a moment at the wonderful apparition in the shabby cloak with the chalk-drawn cross on the back then they determined to let him go without further molestation but so as to let him know what he had escaped they took him by the arms and legs and flung him into a cleft where the snow in spite of the april sun was still deep lie there you peasant who wants to play at being a herald they said to him and departed it was only with difficulty that francis managed to work his way out of the drift in the cleft singing the praises of god as before he wandered on over the mountain after a little space of time he drew near to a little benedictine convent where he received shelter in exchange for serving in the kitchen here he stayed several days in the hope that he would be able to supplement his scanty garments by a cast-off monk's costume they gave him while there hardly enough food and as his first biographer says not actuated by anger but driven by necessity he went on to gubbio it is easy to believe that the prior of the convent came to give excuses after francis had become a celebrity but at this time francis was not celebrated and it is also credible that the good prior never gave a thought to his hard-hearted inhospitality 
and yet saint benedict in the rule of his order commands the strangers shall be received as christ at last francis reached gubbio and there found a friend from whom he received the clothing he had wished for and which was the same that hermits used to wear with a girdle around the body and shoes and staff other friendly services he did not accept and the biographers tell how francis lived in the hospital of gubbio how he washed the lepers feet bound up their sores treated their boils dried up the matter and often kissed the separating sores but meanwhile francis's own particular work awaited him in san damiano near assisi and one day he found himself there again to begin the work god had given him to do to restore the church edifice during his absence rumors seemed to have flown fast for the priest was it appears anything but glad to see him again and francis had to appeal to the word of the bishop which affirmed that he had the approval of the authorities of the church a question which never before had occupied francis now presented itself to him in all its prosaic obtrusiveness the question of money where would the money come from with which to restore san damiano if necessary francis could handle the trowel but stone and mortar could not be had for nothing and this last was the very thing francis undertook to provide for to procure for nothing the required stone and lime now he could avail himself of what he had learned in his troubadour and jongleur days one day men saw francis in his hermit robes in the market-place in assisi singing in public like another wandering minstrel and when he had ended his song he went around among his auditors and begged he who gives me a stone will have his reward in heaven said he he who gives me two stones will have two rewards he who gives three stones will receive three rewards many laughed at him but francis only laughed back others the legend tells us were moved to tears to see him converted from such great worldliness and vanity to such an intoxication of love to god francis actually succeeded in getting together a quantity of stone which he carried away on his own shoulders he also did the masonry work and people who went by used to hear him singing in french as he worked if anyone stopped to look at him he would call out to them you had better come and help me to build up saint damien's church again such zeal and self-sacrifice could not fail to affect the old priest of san damiano's and to show francis his appreciation he used every evening to wait upon him with one or another selected dish according to his limited means this went on very well for a time until one fine day it occurred to francis to ask himself if he ever would be able on his return to the world to be certain of finding so attentive a host as here what am i doing said he to himself is not living the life of a poor man as i have wished to do no a real pauper goes from door to door with his bowl in his hand and takes everything that good men will give him and this is what i must do from now on scarcely had the midday bell rung in assisi the next day and the people were sitting at their tables when francis with his bowl in hand went on his circuit through the city he knocked at all doors and got something at many of them here a sup of soup a bone with a little meat on it a crust of bread some leaves of salad all sorts of things mixed together when francis had ended his begging trip his bowl was full but of the most unappetizing mixture one could think of lost in thought the young man sat on a stoop and stared down into the bowl which seemed most like a trough filled with dog's meat nearly vomiting with nausea he put the first bit to his lips and behold it was just as when he kissed the leper in other times his heart was filled with the sweetness of the holy ghost 
and it seemed to him as if he never had tasted such exquisite food entranced he rushed home and said to the priest that for the future he should do his own providing well enough thus was the son of pietro di barnadone become a public beggar and it is easy to understand that the old purse-proud merchant so jealous of his honor felt the blow even heavier than any of the preceding ones from now on he could not bear to see his son but burst out into wild curses when he met him francis was perhaps not altogether insensitive to this outburst of wrath in any case from this time francis used to take with him an old beggar named albert on these peregrinations and when they would meet pietro di bernadone francis would kneel down in front of his companion and would say bless me father see now he would say turning to the old merchant god has given me a father who blesses me in your place who cursed me francis's younger brother angelo also shared in the persecution of the voluntary beggar and church builder one cool morning he saw francis who in his humble clothes was hearing mass in one of the churches of assisi and angelo said to his companion and so loud that his brother could hear him go there and ask francis if he will not sell you a shilling's worth of sweat francis heard it and answered back in french i have already sold it at a good price to my lord and saviour meanwhile the work at san damiano progressed rapidly it was more a putting to rights than a rebuilding as a sort of conclusion to the work francis wished to leave the priest a good supply of oil for the altar lamps especially for the perpetual lamp before the blessed sacrament for this purpose he went on a round through assisi to beg for oil and it so happened that on this occasion he came to the house of an old-time friend just at the height of a festival now at last his courage weakened he who had defied his father and had not feared the robbers on monte subasio was ashamed to be seen by his old companions perhaps he had one of those indescribable depressing moments experienced by all converts when that which has been left behind appears with perfect clearness to be one of the natural right and reasonable things while the new thoughts and the new life suddenly present themselves to one as something artificial acquired stilted something one would give anything to attain but which it seems useless to strive after perhaps the hermit's costume which francis in general so willingly wore suddenly seemed to him a laughable mummery and perhaps he seemed to himself less of a man than in those days of joy long past when he wore the party-coloured costume of the jester if he had been fighting his own fight at this time it would have lasted but a short time the legend tells us that he walked a few steps beyond the house of festivity but that he despised his weakness turned around and told his friends how weak he had been as he at the same time begged them for charity's sake to give him an alms for oil for the lamps of st damien after he had finished this work francis so as not to be idle undertook a similar one in repairing the old benedictine church of st peter which is now in assisi but then was outside the walls and finally he began the restoration of the little old field chapel before which he was one day found weeping over the sufferings of christ portiuncula also called santa maria degli angeli our lady of the angels francis chose as his abode for a longer time a spot in the vicinity of this little church which like san damiano belonged to the benedictine convent on monte subasio and was said to have been built by pilgrims returning from the holy land in the year three fifty two there is no doubt that he constantly regarded the restoration of churches as his real vocation in life even so late as twelve thirteen 
he founded a church in honor of the blessed virgin and in 1216 he filled a not inconsiderable role in the renovating of santa maria del vescovado in assisi like all humble souls he knew that it is of less importance what one does than how one does it and he felt the call to what verlaine many years after called la vie humble o irovo ennuye et facile the humble life of tiresome and easy achievements this life which precisely on account of monotony and lack of great things to be done exacts so much charity so great a power of seeing god's eternal will back of the whole mass of small endless affairs so as every day to live in the sunday spirit rest their guy quand le jour triste souci day au jour être fort et sous air en circonstances vie francis belonged to the strong and cheerful souls who can do this he saw laid out before him a vista of his future life to be spent in the work of a day laborer for little or no coarse bread he saw evenings of lonely prayer the lonely hearing of mass in the mornings and visits to the altar in chapels and churches by the wayside and among the mountains for the mass the liturgical sacrifice in memory of the sufferings and death of jesus was already the central point in francis's religious life he writes of this the first year of his conversion in his testament here in the world i see nothing of the son of the highest god but his most holy body and blood and these most sacred mysteries i will venerate and honor above all things and in one of the oldest of his admonitiones his admonitions to brothers in his order an accordance is found with the above all who have seen jesus christ in the flesh but have not seen him after the spirit and in his divinity and have not believed that he was really the son of god are doomed also all those are doomed who see the sacrament of the body of christ which is consecrated with the words of the lord on the altar and by the hand of the priest in the form of bread and wine but do not see it in the spirit and divinity and do not believe that it really is our lord jesus christ most holy body and blood it was not the general custom in the beginning of the thirteenth century for every catholic priest to read mass daily only on sundays or else after a special request and on important holidays was mass celebrated on all such occasions francis was invariably there at the place and to please him the priest from san damiano used often in the mornings to go down to portiuncula and hold the divine service in the newly restored chapel all who have lived in italy and have participated in the spiritual life of the people can tell by experience of the singularly impressive power of these very early divine services out of the morning's darkness which perhaps is lessened by the light of the setting half-moon or by that of a solitary great star shining far away over the mountains one walks into the church where the lights cast their ruddy glow over the altar table and the priest in his bright vestment stands at the foot of the altar steps makes the full sign of the cross and solemnly with a low voice begins the prayers of the mass with david's wonderful forty-second psalm and the responses of the acolyte are heard the holy service goes along rapidly in the deep silence and morning peace of the church are heard distinctly the whispered words from the priest's lips hoc est enim corpus meum hic est enim calic sanguinis mei and while the altar bell rings over and over again there is raised high over the bowed heads of the kneeling congregation the white host the shining chalice the body and blood of christ offered by the hands of the priest as the lamb of god who bears all the sins of the world in such moments one is lifted on mighty wings above oneself and one's misery and faith make themselves felt one cares to hope one desires to love god always 
to do his will and serve him only and never more to bow down to false gods on such a morning in the little chapel of portiuncula one day in february 1209 francis heard the passage in the gospel which seemed to him a new and clearer message from the lord still clearer than the words he had heard two years before in san damiano and which therefore remained effective for the rest of his life it was the feast of the apostle st matthew february twenty fourth on which francis heard the priest read the following passage from the gospel of st matthew chapter ten verses seven through thirteen at that time jesus said to his disciples and going preach saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand heal the sick raise the dead cleanse the lepers cast out devils freely have you received freely give do not possess gold nor silver nor money in your purses nor scrip for your journey nor two coats nor shoes nor a staff for the laborer is worthy of his meat and into whatsoever city or town you shall enter inquire who in it is worthy and there abide till you go thence and when you come into the house salute it saying peace be to this house and if that house be worthy your peace shall come upon it but if it be not worthy your peace shall return to you when francis went back in thought to that mass of st matthew in portiuncula he regarded the mere reading of the gospel of the day as a divine revelation we read in his testament the highest one himself revealed to me that i should live in accordance with the holy gospel and again the lord revealed to me a salutation that we were to say the lord give thee peace the biographers tell us that after he had listened to these words and heard them exhaustively explained by the priest he was inspired and exclaimed this is what i want this is what i with all my soul want to follow in my life as if in a vision he had understood what the lord asked of those who aspired to be his disciples who would belong to him completely who would sacrifice themselves for him and serve him alone that they should be apostles that free from all superfluity and without the troubles of the world they were to go out into the world rejoicing in spirit bearing the old serious joyful message be you converted for the kingdom of heaven is near francis the church builder and hermit was now to become francis the apostle and evangelist the announcer of the gospel of conversion and peace he had scarcely left the church before he took off his shoes threw away his staff cast off his outer garment which he wore against the cold in place of his belt he tied a rope around his waist and clothed in a long brown gray blouse of the kind the peasants of the region wore with the hood attached to go over his head he was prepared to wander through the world on his naked feet as the apostles had gone and bring it his master's peace if they wish to receive it end of book one chapter seven book two chapter one of saint francis of assisi a biography by johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Francis the Evangelist, Chapter One: The First Disciples. Preco sum mani regis, I am the great king's herald. Thus had Francis that April day in 1207 answered the robbers in the woods of Monte Subasio and he had in that ejaculation given the war-cry and motto for all of his future life 
it was after the mass of st matthew and portiuncula that it became clear to him how this career of harold should be carried to a conclusion and now he wasted no time in beginning it from that day on a remarkable sight was to be seen in assisi now here now there in the streets and squares of the city a figure showed itself clad in a peasant's gray cloak of undyed wool with a hood drawn over the head and a rope around the waist he greeted all whom he met as he went along with the words the lord give you peace and where he saw a larger crowd assemble he went to them stood barefoot upon a flight of steps or on a stone and began to pray this remarkable man was the son of pietro di bernardone who thus began his work as an evangelist what he said was very simple and without art it only concerned one thing namely peace as the greatest good for man peace with god by keeping his commandments peace with man by a righteous conduct peace with oneself by the testimony of a good conscience the laughter which a year before had greeted francis when he made public entrance into his native city was evidently stilled after the scene in the bishop's palace they listened to him with attention even with reverence and the words which he said were not forgotten they fell like living seed into many a receptive mind into many a heart which without knowing it longed greatly to live its life nearer to god thus it was that francis in a little while found disciples as the first we are told of a pious and simple man from assisi whose name has not been preserved for us and of whom history knows no more the first disciple known to history is therefore bernard of quintavalle bernard was a merchant like francis and apparently not much older than he he did not belong to francis's circle but followed his wonderful career only at a distance at the outset like so many he had only taken francis's conversion and church building as a new craze with him but as time went on and francis continued to persevere in his way of life bernard's doubt turned into regard and his wondering became admiration bernard certainly had led hitherto a perfectly regular and good civic life what seized him now was the feeling which sabatier has in one place so beautifully called la nostalgia de la santite homesickness for holiness the sacred fire burst out within his soul the desire for over sanctification which is the innermost kernel of christianity the longing to give up the thousand things with which the soul vainly creates unrest and perturbation for itself and to seek the one thing which satisfies there ripened in him the determination to follow francis to be poor like him wear his habit and live his life the desire to be satisfied with little a deep supernatural longing as well as an insatiability that never can get enough waxed stronger and stronger within him but hitherto he had never talked with francis on the subject on the contrary he found a kindred soul and a confidant in one of the canons of the cathedral church of san rufino pietro de catani a layman who in his position of law council of the church enjoyed one of its prebendships. in later legends it is told how bernard before he finally enrolled himself under francis tried to find out by a trick if francis's piety was true or assumed he asked francis a number of times to spend the night with him an invitation which he who at this time could hardly be said to have any fixed abode gladly accepted one evening therefore he asked his guest into his own sleeping chamber 
where after the custom in the better class of houses a light was kept burning all night but to hide his holiness thus it is told in the chronica twenty four generalium and in the fioretti st francis cast himself on the bed as soon as he came into the room and acted as if he slept and after a while bernard did the same beginning to snore strongly as if in deep slumber and st francis who believed that bernard really slept arose from his bed and started to pray while with eyes and hands raised towards heaven and with great devotion and fervor he cried out my god and my all and thus he remained praying and weeping greatly until morning and repeated constantly my god and my all and said nothing more that back of this tale there is concealed a real occurrence is clear from thomas of chelino's briefer description bernard saw francis praying at night sleeping little praising god and his mother the blessed virgin as day dawned bernard determined to follow francis therefore irrevocably he laid before him his wish in the form of a question for solution in a case of conscience if some one he said had received from his master property entrusted to his care be it much or little and had had possession of it for many years and now wanted to keep it no longer what would be the best way to act in such a case give it back to him of whom he had received it was francis's obvious answer but my brother the case is this that all that i own of earthly property i have received from my god and lord jesus christ and now i want to give it back again as it may seem best to you to perform it then francis said what you tell me of lord bernard is so great and difficult a work that we will ask our lord jesus christ for advice about it and pray to him to let us know his will and to teach us how we shall bring this intention to execution we therefore next morning will go into the church and read in the book of gospels what the lord told his disciples to do when the time came pietro de catani seems to have reached his decision in any case the three men went together the few paces across the assisi marketplace to the church of san nicolo which occupied what is now the site of a barracks of carabineers here they entered and prayed together whereupon francis went up to the altar and took the mass book opened it and found the following words if thou wilt be perfect go sell what thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven twice more he opened the book and found the first time if any man will come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me and the next time and he commanded them that they should take nothing for the way as francis closed the book he turned himself towards the two men and said brothers this is your life and our rule and not only ours but all theirs who wish to live with us go away therefore and do that which you have heard but bernard of quintavalle arrested his steps on the square of the church of san giorgio now the piazza santa chiara and began to distribute all his property to the poor and francis stood by his side and praised god in his heart in place of pietro di bernardone he had chosen a beggar for a father and now god sent him a far better brother than angelo while bernard and francis thus stood together and pietro de catani had also gone in search of his possessions it happened that a priest came by from whom francis had bought stone for the restoration of san damiano this priest whose name was sylvester had sold the stone cheap perhaps on account of the good object it was to be devoted to 
when he now saw so much money given away he approached and said to francis the stone which you in your time bought from me you paid for only poorly incensed at the covetousness of the priest francis suddenly reached down into the money which bernard had in the lap of his cloak and without counting the amount poured it out into the priest's hands as he asked i wonder if you are now satisfied sir priest but sylvester thanked him coldly and went away as the legends tell this occurrence was none the less the beginning of a new life for the avaricious priest he began to draw comparisons between his own avarice and the contempt for property and gold shown by these two young laymen and the words no one can serve two masters began to ring like a judgment in his soul over the life he had hitherto led after a further delay he too had to come to francis and beg him to receive him among the brethren the three brothers and followers of christ after all was arranged left assisi together and spent the night in portiuncula near this church they next erected a hut of bows plastered with mud where they could find a refuge for the night and pray in the daytime it was down here also that a young man from assisi named giles in latin egidius in italian egidio eight days after bernard's conversion sought to join them naturally the treatment awarded to their possessions by the rich bernard and the accomplished lawyer pietro had excited the greatest attention in the city and was the inexhaustible source of conversation as well by day on the market-place as by night at the fires where were held vaglia on such an evening of gossip before the sparkling fire of juniper branches and chestnut embers which in the cold april evenings were necessary in assisi giles heard his family talk about francis and his friends next morning giles rose early troubled about his salvation as the old legends say it was april twenty third the feast of the martyr st george and the young man betook himself to st george's church to hear mass thence he took the direct road down to portiuncula where he knew that st francis would keep himself at the hospital of san salvatore degli pareti the road forks and giles prayed god that he might select the right one his prayer was heard for after wandering about a while he approached a wood and saw francis coming out of it giles at once cast himself at the feet of francis and begged to be received into the brotherhood but francis looked at giles pious young face raised him up and said dearest brother god has shown you a wonderful favor for if the emperor were to come to assisi and wished to make one of the citizens his knight or his chamberlain then would the citizen be greatly rejoiced how much more should you rejoice whom god has chosen as his true knight and servant and to maintain the holy evangelical perfection and he took him to the place where the other brothers were keeping themselves and presented him to them with these words the lord our god has sent us a new good brother let us therefore rejoice in the lord and eat together in charity but after the meal was ended francis and giles went up to assisi to obtain cloth for the new brother's habit on the way an old woman met them and asked for alms then francis turned around toward brother giles and said to him as he looked at him with an angel's expression my dearest brother let us for god's sake give your cloak to this poor woman and brother giles at once took off his beautiful cloak and gave it to the woman and it seemed to him thus he told it afterwards that this alms seemed to ascend to heaven but he himself felt in his heart an inexpressible joy there were now four living together in the hut at portiuncula 
in this first year they had little need for a house and home for they spent most of their time in missionary trips what francis had up to this time done alone the four did together or in couples thus francis associated himself with giles whom he had quickly learned to love and whom with an expression borrowed from his reading of romance he called his knight of the round table and with him started on a trip through the nearest environs to mark ancona the region between the apennines and the adriatic sea on his return francis had the happiness to receive three new disciples sabatino morico and john the last name acquired the title of capella of the hat because he was the first to wear a hat in violation of the rule of the order all seven started out again and francis now chose rieti in the sabine mountains as the goal for his mission in contrast to the regular ecclesiastical eloquence francis and his friends were to the last degree simple in their preaching his sermons had more of the flavor of exhortations than of elaborated discourses they were artless words which came from the heart and went to the heart his preaching always came back to three points fear god love god convert yourself from bad to good and when francis was through brother giles would add what he says is true listen to him and do as he says wherever they went their sermons excited the greatest attention in peasant circles to some they looked like wild animals women ran away when they saw them coming others would speak to them asking what order they belonged to and whence they came they answered that they were of no order but were only men from assisi who lived a life of penance but if they were penitents they were not for that reason shamefaced with francis at their head who sang in french praised and glorified god for his untiring goodness to them they were able to rejoice so much says one of the biographers because they had abandoned so much when they wandered in the spring sunshine free as the birds in the sky through the green vineyards of mark ancona they could only thank the almighty who had freed them from all the snares and deceits which those who love the world are subject to and suffer from so sadly before sending out his six disciples francis had assembled them in the forest about him near portiuncula where they were wont often to pray in his own cheerful yet impressive manner he addressed them on the subject of the kingdom of god as they were going out to induce men to despise the world to subdue their self-will to discipline the body go out my beloved ones and announce the gospel of peace and conversion be patient in trouble give to all who insult you an humble answer bless them who persecute you thank those who do you wrong and slander you because for all this your reward shall be great in heaven and fear not because you are unlearned men for you do not speak by yourselves but the spirit of your heavenly father will speak through you you will find some men who are true good and peaceful they will receive you and your word with gladness others and these in great number you will on the other hand find to be revilers of god they will oppose you and speak against you be therefore prepared to endure all things patiently after these words francis embraced them one by one as a mother her children blessed them and gave them as a last ailment for the road this extract from the bible cast thy care upon the lord and he shall sustain thee thus the disciples went out into the world traveling in pairs and when they came to a church or a cross or merely saw a church tower in the distance they bowed down in the dust 
and uttered the little prayer which Francis had taught them. We adore thee, O Christ, here and in all thy churches over the whole world, and we bless thee, because by thy holy cross thou hast redeemed us. But if they approached one of the small towns, which then, as now, stood upon the mountain tops with circling walls and towers, they directed their steps in through the city gates, and when they were come to the marketplace, they stopped and began to sing the song of praise which Francis had taught them, and which ran thus Fear and honor, praise and bless, give thanks and adore the Lord God omnipotent in Trinity and unity, Father and Son and Holy Ghost, Creator of all things. Do penance, make fruits worthy of penance for know that you soon will die. Give, and it will be given unto you. Forgive, and it will be forgiven unto you. And if you will not have forgiven men their sins, the Lord will not forgive you your sins. Confess all your sins. Bless those who die in penance, for they will be in the kingdom of heaven. Woe to those who do not die in penance, for they will be the sons of the devil, whose works they do, and will go into eternal fire. Beware and abstain from all evil, and persevere up to the end in good. The brothers soon had need of the warning to be patient, which Francis had given them for use on their journeys. Many regarded them as weak-minded, and in the heartless way of the times derided them, and threw the dirt of the street upon them. Others robbed them of their clothing, and like good men of the gospel, the brothers made no resistance, but went their way half naked. Others seized the brothers by the cowls, and carried them on their backs as if they were meal sacks. Others came to them with dice, stuck them in their hands, and asked them to gamble some others took them for thieves and wanted to refuse them shelter for the night so that the brothers often had to sleep in caves cellars or porches of houses or churches together with an associate the latter according to thomas of chaleno was brother giles bernard of quintavalle went northwards and reached florence here they for a long time traveled about the city vainly seeking refuge for the night at last they found a porch outside of a house and now they thought that they might rest at last they knocked and got permission from the woman of the house to spend the night in the shelter of some woodsheds that stood there scarcely had this been arranged for when the master of the house came home and started to quarrel with his wife about her rather moderate hospitality she managed to pacify him to such an extent that they got permission to stay. They can steal nothing but a little of the firewood down there, she remonstrated with him. But a rug she had intended to lend the two wanderers she was not allowed to give them, although it was winter time and the night was cold. But after a poor sleep, Bernard and his companion left their inhospitable host early in the morning overcome by cold and hunger and betook themselves to the nearest church as soon as the bell rang for eight o'clock service their hostess found herself soon after in the same church and as she saw the brothers praying so piously she thought to herself if these men had been thieves or robbers they would not have been here now and taken so devout a part in the divine service while the woman was occupied with these thoughts, she saw a man named Guido enter, who every morning went to the church to give alms to the poor beggars who gathered together there. On his rounds he came to Bernard and his companion, but they refused to take anything. Guido, astonished, asked, Are you not paupers, like the others, that you will take nothing? Bernard answered, Certainly we are paupers, but poverty is no burden to us, for in our case it is voluntary, and it is in obedience to the will of God that we are poor. 
still more astonished guido asked them other questions and ascertained that bernard had been a very wealthy man but had given everything away so as to be able without disturbance to preach the gospel of peace and conversion at this moment the woman in front of whose house the brothers had spent the night joined in the conversation bernard's refusal of money from guido had convinced her of the utter injustice she had done the two strangers christiani she now said using a mode of address still common in italy you christian men if you will return to my house i will gladly receive you under my roof but when guido now heard how no one the night before had been willing to receive them he at once offered them hospitality and thanking the woman who had come to a better state of mind the brothers accepted the last offer as before mentioned francis had chosen rieti as his own mission district for this time from terni he followed the course of the river velino which brought him through a whole series of larger or smaller towns strancone cantalice poggio bustone greccio everywhere he found as the legends tell us the fear of god and the love of god almost vanished and the way of penitence untrod and despised the broad way the way of the world the way the three evil lusts urge men along were thickly frequented the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of the world had almost unlimited sway to block the wrong and endless way of lust was therefore everywhere the principal task for francis at the present time in the valley of rieti the great saint's preaching in those early days is regarded as an evangelization in the proper signification of this word a conversion from heathenism to christianity it was while engaged in this work that francis according to his biographers was made certain of the forgiveness of his sins the certainty of which may be said to have been absolutely necessary to carry out the work which he was to do five hundred meters high in the mountain above the town of poggio bustone and a thousand meters above the plain there is a cave to which francis true to his assisi habits was wont to betake himself for prayer here in the great loneliness and dead silence where only a single bird twittered and a mountain brook gurgled francis knelt long hours together on the hard stone under the naked cliff and if we wish to really understand francis we must follow him to this mountain cave there had been and was still the hermit as well as evangelist and missionary in his make-up and wherever he has set his feet are found these grottoes and caves these Aramee and Retiri, to which he was accustomed from time to time to withdraw himself. Carceri at Assisi, St. Urbano at Narni, Fonte Colombo at Rieti, Monte Casale at Borgo San Sepulcro, Celle at Cortona, La Coste at Notiano, Sotiano at Chiusi, Laverna in the valley of Casentino give widespread testimony that the spirit which inspired francis of assisi was none other than that which in the latest of the olden days had inspired benedict of nursia and the same which later in the first of the modern days was to inspire ignatius of loyola francis in poggio bustone or by fonte colombo is a side place to benedict in sagro specco by subiaco to ignatius loyola in the cave at manresa to all of them applies the same twofold exhortation pray and work ora et labora all three strove in the midst of the industry of martha to have the devotion of mary and in the cave at poggio bustone francis tried to have such an hour as that of mary 
at the feet of the crucified one perhaps he had already uttered the prayer which is first revealed to us in the later hours of his life and which in all its comprehensive conciseness is given here who art thou my dear lord and god and who am i thy miserable worm of a servant my dearest lord i want to love thee my lord and my god i give thee my heart and my body and would wish if i only knew how to do still more for the love of thee in any case there was a double abyss as angela foligno has called it which in these hours of lonely prayer yawned in front of francis the divine being's abyss of goodness and light and opposed to it his own abyss of sin and darkness for who was he that he dared to be the finger-post for mankind and the master of disciples he only who a few years ago had been a child of the world among children of the world a sinner among sinners who was he who dared to preach to others to warn others to guide others he who was not worthy to take the holy and pure name of jesus christ into his impure mortal mouth then he thought of what he had been of what he yet might be if god did not stand by him for that danger was always within his nature when he thought next of what others thought of him some who honored him some who followed him some who hated him it was then he knew not where to hide himself for very shame and the words of the apostle rang in his ears lest perhaps when i have preached to others i myself should become a castaway thus humility raged in his soul like a lion that leaves nothing of his prey but grinds the bones for the marrow and all torn asunder all annihilated francis cast himself on his face before god the god who had made heaven and earth the god who is all truth and all holiness and before whose omnipotence nothing can stand without complete truth complete holiness francis looked into the depths of his being and he saw that on the whole earth there was not to be found a more useless creature a greater sinner a soul more lost and fallen to the bad than himself and from the depths of his need he groaned before god lord be merciful to me a poor sinner and it came to pass that the empty cave over poggio bustone beheld a miracle one that always happens when a soul in complete distrust of itself calls out to its god in confidence and hope and charity then there comes to pass the great miracle of justification i fear everything from my badness but from thy goodness i also hope for all this was the innermost meaning of the prayer francis sent up to god and the answer came as it always comes fear not my son thy sins are forgiven thee from this hour francis was fully armed for the things that awaited him he was drawn into the heart of christianity because he had abandoned everything he was to win everything for not only had he given up father and mother house and home property and money but what means more than all else if god was to belong to him and he to god he had given up himself all his righteousness from now on was that which the apostle says is given by christ to the faithful and his life in holiness breathed out this righteousness therefore it is true with a deeper truth than that of history what the fioretti relates in the tenth chapter but one day brother maceo from marignano said to saint francis i wonder why the whole world runs after thee more than after others and all men want to see thee and hear thee and obey thee thou art not fair body 
thou art not deeply learned thou art not of noble birth why does the whole world run after thee when saint francis heard this he rejoiced in his soul and turned his eyes to heaven and stood a long time thus with soul uplifted to god and when he came to himself he kneeled down and gave thanks and praise to god and turned to brother maceo and said to him with great spiritual power do you wish to know why this happens to me do you wish to know why the whole world runs after me for i know that thing from the all-seeing god whose eyes see the good and the bad over all the earth for these most holy eyes have nowhere seen a greater more miserable poorer sinner than i because in all the earth he has found no more wretched being to do his wonderful work which he wishes to have done therefore he has chosen me so as thus to put to shame the noble the great strength and beauty worldly wisdom that all may know that all power and all virtue come from him and not from creatures and that no one can exalt himself before his face but he who praises himself let him praise himself in the lord for his is the honour and the power for ever and ever End of Book Two, Chapter One. Book Two, Chapter Two of Saint Francis of Assisi, a Biography by Johannes Jornson, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Francis the Evangelist, Chapter Two, The Foundations of the Order. Francis found himself one day in Bishop Guido's private room, as was customary with him. He had gone to the man he regarded as the father of souls to get advice, perhaps also to pray for alms. It was a period of hard times for the brotherhood after the return from the mission journeys four new brothers had joined the ranks philip lang john of san costanzo barbarus and bernard of vigilanzio francis himself had brought a fifth new brother with him from rieti angelo tancredi a young knight whom francis had met in the streets of rieti and whom he had won by suddenly calling out to him long enough hast thou borne the belt the sword and the spurs the time had now come for you to change the belt for a rope the sword for the cross of jesus christ the spurs for the dust and dirt of the road follow me and i will make you a knight in the army of christ thus it was that there were no longer so few men to have food daily in the beginning the people of assisi had been seized with a kind of wonder and the brothers had got considerable alms as they went from door to door now people began to grow weary of them now the relatives of the brothers were ready to persecute them you have given away what you had and now you come and want to eat up other people's things as their number increased they went from the hut at portiuncula to a tumble-down outhouse or shed some twenty miles distant in a place which because of its vicinity to a bend in a little stream was called rivo torto crooked stream here the crucigers from san salvatore della pareti owned a few small buildings and as one of the newly accepted franciscans had been a member of this order it is reasonable to suppose that francis by his intercession had obtained the right to use this new abode this shed or tigergium at rivo terto was so small that francis had to write on the beams the names of each brother over his place so as to avoid all disorder or confusion there was no church or chapel there the brothers prayed before a large wooden cross which was erected in front of the shed 
francis for his part had nothing against so great poverty he really liked rivo torto because by following the course of the river he could easily reach some caves on monte subasio where it was good to pray and which francis because of their narrowness called his prisons carceri all this excited much talk in assisi as was to be expected and the bishop showed good judgment he tried by gentleness to draw francis away from the ideas which to the prelate of the church seemed extravagant little was the amount which the brothers permitted themselves to own but he only allowed himself so much as was needed to ensure his daily bread to the bishop as to all men living an ordinary life the begging was particularly repulsive but francis was immovable in this point just as tolstoy has clearly seen it in the nineteenth century so he saw what a hindrance is removed from the way when money and possessions are given up lord bishop he therefore replied if we had possessions we should have to have weapons with which to defend them for from property comes strife with our neighbors and relatives so that charity to god and to men suffers many a scar and in order to preserve it whole and unimpaired it is our firm determination to own nothing in this world the bishop who himself was not clear of property disputes for he was involved in a suit with both the crucigers and with the benedictines on monte subasio bowed his head and was silent even if he could not mount to the height of such an ideal he did not dare to hinder or restrain them in carrying it out moreover begging was not the only or even principal resource of the brothers francis himself says in his testament about these early times and after the lord had given me brothers no one showed me what i was to do but the highest revealed to me that i was to live after the holy gospel and they who came to me and accepted this way of life gave all they possessed to the poor and were satisfied with a tunic patched both inside and outside if they wished it and a rope and breeches and we wanted nothing more we said the office those of us who were clerks like other clerks but the lay people said the our father and we liked to be in the churches and we were simple idiote and subject to all men and i worked with my hands and moreover wanted to work and i desired that all the other brothers should be occupied with honourable work and those who could do no work must learn it not for the desire of remuneration but to give good example and not to be lazy and if they will not give us pay for our work we must have recourse to the table which the lord has spread as we go from door to door and beg for alms we have in these few words from francis's own hand the entire program of the life they led at portiuncula and in the shed at rivo torto what francis desired was what jesus of nazareth desired that men should own as little as possible that they should work with their hands for their food and ask others for help when work failed them that they should not give themselves unnecessary troubles and lay up superfluous possessions that they should keep themselves free as birds and not let themselves be caught in the snares of the world that they should go through life with thanks to god for his gifts and with songs of praise for the beauty of his works like strangers and like pilgrims these words of an apostle return over and over again to the mouth of francis when he wants to express his ideal he wished says one of his biographers that all things should sing pilgrimage and exile the following by-laws and admonitions in the first rule which francis wrote for the brothers are in accord with this no brother who works or serves in another's house can be treasurer or secretary or have any authoritative position 
but they must be lowly sine minoris and subject to all in the house and the brothers who can do one kind of work should work and practice the art they have learnt if it does not interfere with their soul's salvation or is not dishonourable for the apostle says if any man will not work neither let him eat and let every man abide in the same calling in which he was called and they can receive for their work whatever is necessary but not money and they that be needed they must go out begging like the other brothers and they have permission to own tools and utensils which they need the lord teaches us in the gospel watch ye that your hearts be not troubled with avarice and with care for your nourishment therefore none of the brothers wherever he may go and wherever he may be may receive in any way or permit money to be received either for clothing or for books or as wages for work or for any other reason except when a brother is sick and calls for help for we ought not to care for or to look on money as of more worth than a stone let us therefore beware lest we who have abandoned all shall lose heaven for so small a thing and if we find money anywhere let us not then be more concerned about it than if it was dust that we tread in yet the brothers if the lepers are in need can collect money for them but must be greatly on their guard against money all brothers must try to follow our lord jesus christ's humility and poverty and remember the apostle's words that when we have food and clothes we should be content with them and the brothers should rejoice when they are among humble and despised people among poor and weaklings sick and lepers and beggars on the road and if it is necessary they may go and beg for alms and they should not be ashamed but remember that our lord jesus christ the son of the living almighty god made his face as hard as stone and was not ashamed and he was poor and a stranger and lived on alms both he and the blessed virgin and his disciples and when men cause shame to the brothers and will not give them alms then they shall thank god therefore and they shall know that the shame is not counted against them who suffer it but against them who inflict it for alms are an inheritance and a piece of justice which is due to the poor and which our lord jesus christ has levied upon us with these and similar words francis has certainly often enough inspired his friends to persevere in the severe life of poverty soon they were giving their services in the hospitals soon helping the peasants with the harvest in the fields and never was their recompense other than their daily bread and a drink of water with it from the spring it also happened that there was no work to be had and in assisi as we have said all doors were closed in the faces of the brothers then it was that hope could hardly be sustained and it may well be believed that discontent and despair were sometimes on the point of overcoming the poor penitents from assisi in their shed at rivo torto on dark and rainy days when the water drove in through the leaky roof of the building and the earth was black and miry and cold for the bare feet to tread upon and they sat there in their coarse ragged gowns seven or eight in number and had got nothing to eat all day and did not know if the brothers who had gone out to beg would bring anything home and there was no fire to warm them and no books to read in those days of rain in those dark cold hours during the short but raw and uncomfortable winter of umbria did it not perforce occur to one or another of them that it was all foolishness and that the best thing to do was to turn the back on the dark hole and its crazy inhabitants to go back to the city to the city where one had alas once owned a house and garden money and goods which foolishly had been cast aside and given to the poor 
there must surely have been some such moments when more than one of the brothers felt the spirit of penance weaken and yet we hear of only one falling away among the first disciples john of capella all the others held fast and persevered even if they as the legend tells us often had to eat roots instead of bread they persevered and they conquered for the public opinion which had long been opposed to them began to reverse itself little by little the inflexible perseverance of the brothers aroused wonder their pious way of life won approval wayfarers who passed by the shed at rivo torto heard the brothers voices in prayer by night by day they were seen going to the hospital or working elsewhere wherever they could get anything to do in spite of their poverty they always had something to spare for any one who asked it and if there was nothing else they would give the hood off of their cloak or one of the sleeves they showed no concern about money a man once laid a considerable sum of money on the altar in the chapel in portiuncula but soon after found his mammon lying in a heap of dirt upon the highway especially was it to be seen how they loved each other two of them once while on a journey were attacked by a wandering imbecile who had started to throw a stone at them and they saw the brothers shifting places constantly because each wanted to be upon the side the stone came from so as to protect his companion with his body if it happened that one of the brothers by a thoughtless or hasty word had hurt the feelings of one of the others he allowed himself neither rest nor quiet until he had made peace with his brother and at the behest of the offender the offended one would have to put his foot on the mouth out of which an uncharitable word had issued never was impolite or even superfluous and worldly conversation heard among them and if they passed by women on their way they did not look upon them but fastened their eyes on the dust with their hearts in heaven that they did not seek after this world's vanity and nothingness is to be seen on an occasion when otto of brunswick went through the valley of spoleto in september twelve o nine on his way to rome to be crowned emperor by pope innocent the populace gathered from assisi betona spelo isola romana and all the other towns and villages on the mountain and plain to see the gorgeous retinue only the brothers from rivo torto were absent with the exception of one who was sent by francis to go and meet the emperor otto and say to him that the honours of this world are transitory and not to be regarded a saying whose truthfulness was soon to be shown in the very case of the emperor himself meanwhile francis had decided to go to rome in the solitude at rivo torto he had as he tells in his testament with few and simple words written or had written the rules of life which he and the brothers followed in their lives his present desire was to have this rule or forma vitae as he used to call it ratified by the highest authority of the church there was no need of this visit it was the fourth lateran council of twelve fifteen which first made such a ratification a requirement for the founding of a community in the catholic church a custom which was not older than bald was now beginning in virtue of which laymen used to seek permission from the papal throne to participate in preaching hitherto reserved for bishops and parish priests bald had obtained such a permission but with a strict command to be subject to the local churchmen a similar permission had been given in twelve o one to the humilitates and in twelve o seven to durand of huesca and his catholic valdenses francis had reason to hope that innocent would be accessible to his wishes also but francis's devotion to the apostles had drawn him to rome with special power to the grave of the apostles and of their successors 
the apostles were francis's model all his thoughts went in the direction of the restoration of the apostolic life as he saw it in the gospels it was after the rule of life of the apostles that all property of the brothers should be for the common use it was thus in the apostolic church was an argument to which francis always submitted himself the later legends tell of peter and paul showing themselves to francis in the church of st peter as he was praying and assuring him of the possession of the perfect kingdom of the most holy poverty one day in the summer of twelve ten the little troop of penitents started from rivo torto and took their way to rome little is told us of their journey except that bernard of quintavalle was sometimes their leader instead of francis him they all obeyed as they shortened the way with prayer song and conversation the lord says the legend prepared resting places for them everywhere and never left them unprovided for on their arrival in rome bishop guido of assisi was the first to whom they presented themselves who at this time perhaps not without previous communication with francis was present in the eternal city the bishop presented the brothers to a friend of his among the cardinals john of st paul and the way to the pope was made easy for them later stories tell us that francis first tried to reach the pope by his own efforts but failed what is historically certain is only this much that cardinal john after the brothers had lived with him a few days undertook to speak to the pope about them the pope was innocent the third an injustice is perpetrated if we like sabatier reproach cardinal john because he in his capacity of representative of the curia utilized the time francis and the brothers stayed with him to investigate their intentions and prospects the period was actually very critical for the church and the greatest foresight was a duty for its pilot it is with a very poor comprehension of the middle ages that any one speaks of the powerful church of the middle ages and especially is this idea faulty when the period is that of innocent the third in fact the centuries of the reformation and the revolutionary days were scarcely more anti-papal or more opposed to the church than the epoch we speak of about the year twelve hundred no one would in our days permit pius x to be treated as innocent the third was treated more than once he tells himself how on holy thursday april eighth twelve o three on the way from st peter's to the lateran in spite of the papal crown which he wore upon his head he was insulted by the roman people with so offensive a word that he would not repeat it as early as eleven eighty eight the same roman people had anticipated the french terrorists and abolished the christian reckoning of time they had established in its place a new era based on the restoration of the roman senate in eleven forty three time after time was innocent chased out of rome the tower he and his brother had built for themselves as a secure refuge and whose imposing remains still bear innocent's family name torre dei conti was taken from him by the romans and was declared communal property from may to october twelve o four the pope had to be a helpless witness of the devastation of rome by his enemies of the capocci party and in the small remains of power which the hohenstaufens had left to the see of peter the power and authority of innocent was also small for to free themselves from the temporal domain of the pope men on all sides withdrew from his spiritual supremacy and broke away from the unity of the church in orvieto such an independent faction chose an albigensian for leader and killed the podesta pietro paranzi sent to them by the pope viterbo in the face of the prohibition and threats of the pope had chosen open heretics as consuls interdict and ban were without effect on the rebellious populace narni that against the pope's ban had laid waste the little community of otricoli situated near it lived untroubled for five years under excommunication the republic of orvieto likewise in cold blood 
overrode the papal command when their army plundered and burnt the neighboring town of aquapendente in sardinia the priests and even the bishops were so inimical to the pope that his legate blasio in the year twelve o two literally did not know whence he could procure food there eventually the ghibelline pisa took the island from the pope even when innocent won a victory over his opponents the fruits of the victory were taken from him thus when conrad of erslingen had gone to narni to make over the imperial castle in assisi to the pope the inhabitants of assisi destroyed the castle before the pope could take it in possession so far from punishing assisi for this violence innocent did not dare to enter the city when he passed near it as he visited perugia and spoleto on his journey of homage through umbria innocent the third's era was thus in full rebellion against the papal authority and this rebellion was just as in later centuries at the one time religious and political we seem to see puritans independents illuminati rosicrucians freemasons shadowed forth in the more or less politically tinted sects with which the time was crowded the church historians reckon whole ranks of sect creators and heresiarchs in this century from the rigorous peter vald and his poor men from lyon to shameless pantheists like david of dinant and ortlieb of strasbourg neomanichees like the albigenses satanists like the familiae amoris which celebrated the black mass even in rome the most dangerous of all these sects were the albigenses in the year twelve hundred they were to be found scattered all over europe from rome to london from the black sea to spain but especially along the lower danube in northern italy and southern france and in places along the rhine they bore different names in different countries on the lower danube bulgari burgi publicans in lombardy paratines gazarines in southern france cathari or albigenses after the city albi in languedoc everywhere they held the same doctrine and this was a reiteration of the dualism of the manichees by way of the bogomili and paulatians of bulgaria they descended directly from the adherents of Mani. The Albigensian theory of the universe rested on the old heathen doctrine of two gods, a good one who had created souls, a bad one who had created the material world. It was therefore essential, they taught, to hold aloof from all that is material. In theory they cast aside marriage, family life, all that could not be considered purely spiritual the name they themselves adopted cathari or the pure indicates this to preserve this purity the most zealous among them starved themselves to death in practice marriage was not allowed to the great mass of the cathari and often the severe denial broke loose into unbridled sensuality as with the german luciferians the cathari were therefore with their entire philosophy as well as with their practice born enemies of the catholic church the war which the church now took up and which on the part of rome was carried on as long as possible with spiritual weapons was therefore a fight for one of the most valued possessions of christian culture for theological monism the unity of god this was the truth for which the church fought and which it saved by fighting there is a bottomless abyss between the manichees for whom life is impure and unholy and for whom nature is a work of a devil a bad and detestable crime of the life desire and the christian who in matter sees a pure and holy work from the hands of an all-loving creator and only stained by the miserable crimes of little man rome had to decide on which side of this abyss francis and his brother stood if their strange asceticism was a product of the pride of the cathari or of evangelic christianity that they came from assisi could well awaken a suspicion for among the communities where the cathari had acquired political power it was precisely this little city 
which in 1203 had chosen an Albigensian for Podesta. In Francis, it was to be feared, might be found a man of the same character as Peter Wald, whose ideal had also been evangelical poverty. The well-known Leonese had, in 1179, obtained permission from Alexander III to preach in public the conversion of sinners and to live in apostolic poverty. Already in 1184, Lucius III had placed Wald and his followers under the ban as rebels against the functions of the church and as renewers of donatism. Only a few of the Waldensians were preserved as adherents to the unity of the church by the Spaniard Durand of Huesca. It took only a short time to convince Cardinal John that Francis and his friends were neither the one nor the other of these two sectaries. That God is one, this was the foundation of Francis's piety, as it is the fundamental doctrine in the theology of the church. There is only one God, the God of creation and of salvation, the God of the cross and the God of holiness, the God of love and the God of nature. One God, as there is one world and one heaven, one God, glorious, thanked, and praised by all, who moves and has the spirit of life, from worm to cherubim, through all the ages of eternity. Francis felt this, for he was no manichee to deny life and to hate life, but a Christian who wanted to live and loved life in its purity, in its golden goodness, in its deepest, innermost sweetness, in its highest, most divine plenitude. It was by these feelings that he was to be distinguished from the souls of pride who haughtily called themselves the pure, the perfect, the chosen, but who in reality had to vibrate between self-torture and degradation. Francis was no negative soul, neither was he a critical soul. The only criticism he understood was self-criticism, and this distinguished him completely from Wald and his tendencies. As a modern historian has pertinently said, Francis appeared as the herald of a holy life, Wald of the divine command. Francis preached the love of Christ and Wald the prohibitions of the Lord. Francis overflowed with the happiness of God's children. Wald punished the sins of the world. Francis collected those who loved amendment and let the others quietly go their way. Wald attacked the ungodliness of the ungodly and irritated the clergy. Such then was the distinctive peculiarity of Francis. This it was which separated him from all the contemporaneous reformers, even those of them who were best disposed to the church, such as a Robert of Aubrezel, fell before the temptation of turning their criticism against the priesthood and their failings, instead of against the heart of the individual. With instinctive certainty, Francis understood that without the reform of the individual, all other reform is meaningless, and therefore he brought about that general reform of conduct which neither the bulls of excommunication of the Pope nor the thunders of the lay preachers had been able to effect. Here it was shown, as so often elsewhere, that God was not working by stormy methods. Cardinal John was not long in coming to a complete understanding of the deep-rooted idiosyncrasy of Francis. He felt that here he stood before a man unselfish in root and branch. He felt that there were no idle promises, no false pretenses, when Francis, speaking of his plan, simply said, God has called us to the help of his holy faith and of the Roman Church's priests and prelates. After the lapse of a few days, the cardinal found himself in the presence of Innocent and imparted the following information. I have found a very perfect man who wishes to live after the precepts of the Holy Gospel and in all things to adhere to the evangelical perfection. And I believe the Lord intends by him to renew the faith all over the world. The brothers from Assisi were then admitted to the Pope's presence. The Pope let Francis unfold his program and then answered, My dear son, 
this life you and your brothers lead seems too severe to me i certainly do not doubt that you are all in a condition to live it borne up by the first enthusiasm but you should also think of those who come after you and who may not have the same zeal to this francis only answered thus lord pope i depend upon my lord jesus christ he has promised us eternal life and heavenly happiness and will not deny us so trivial a thing as what we need here upon earth to maintain our life with the suspicion of a smile one seems to see it through the words innocent answered what you say my son is perfectly true but the nature of man is frail and seldom holds to one purpose long go then and pray god to reveal to you how far what you want coincides with his will francis and his brothers left the presence of the pope who in the next consistory laid the affair before the cardinals as was to be expected several of the old practically minded ones had great doubts about an order whose principles seemed to exceed the powers of mankind it was no purely contemplative order that francis wished to found to which utter poverty might be supposed to be annexed francis's ideal was indeed the apostolic life and especially the apostolic preaching but how should this last mentioned task be performed in a life of all kinds of work or one of begging from door to door even the waldenses had had evangelical poverty on their program in reality they had laymen among them whose work took care of the needs of the preachers the humiliati in spirit and life allied to the waldenses originally a brotherhood of lombard cloth makers worked in common kept what was most necessary for themselves and distributed the rest to the poor the catholic poor founded by the converted german catharist bernard primus came the nearest to francis's ideal they lived by the work of their hands received no money wages but only food and clothes as compensation this did very well as long as prayer and work were the order's only effective obligations but francis came precisely to obtain the papal permission to preach and if this preaching could not be based on the work of lay preachers and necessarily they must be supported by a certain amount of study to make this study possible there would be needed no matter in how poor a shape fixed abodes and a cloister life and how was it possible to erect a cloister on the foundation of complete poverty there is scarcely need here to do more than call attention to the fact that the old monastic orders held their members to the obligation of poverty but this was to be taken in a far different sense than that in which francis used the word it stood certainly in the benedictine rules that he who entered the order should give first his goods to the poor and the holy poverty was glorified under this almost franciscan title by bernard of clairvaux but however scornfully this great father talks of silver and gold the white and red varieties of earth that acquire their value from man's wickedness yet the existence of the cistercian convents as well as that of the benedictine abbeys depended on large estates of land the single monk owned nothing except what the abbot gave him but his vow of poverty was not affected if the cloister was richly endowed even a certain degree of possession seemed necessary for the inmates of the cloister to be free to devote themselves to spiritual works and not be troubled about their daily bread on this head francis had an entirely different conception what peter and paul had been able to accomplish to announce the gospel to the world while they at the same time supported themselves by the work of their hands or by the gifts of the charitable should still be possible the apostles had not sat quietly within the doors of a convent and francis did not want to be behind them in this respect in the college of cardinals this wish of francis aroused the liveliest opposition all objections were met by john of colonna's simple enunciation these men only want us to allow them to live after the gospel 
if we now declare that this is impossible then we declare that the gospel cannot be followed and thus insult christ who is the origin of the gospel these words had their effect and francis was again invited to the lateran in the night preceding this new meeting the pope is said to have had a curious dream it seemed to him that he stood in the lateran palace in the place that is called speculum because there is a wide prospect therefrom and one looks out over the lateran church dedicated to john the baptist and john the evangelist the head and mother of all churches and then he saw with fear that the proud building shook the tower swung and the walls began to crack soon must the old basilica of constantine be a heap of ruins paralyzed with fright with powerless hands the pope stood in his palace and looked on wanting to cry out but could not and what good would that have done wished to fold his hands in prayer but could not and even that might have been useless then a man came over the ladder in piazza a small common-looking man dressed in peasant garb barefoot and with a rope around his waist instead of a belt and the poor little man looking neither to right nor left went right across to the falling church now he stood by one of the walls that leaned over him as if ready to fall and crush him in the next minute wonderful to see it seemed as if the little man suddenly became as tall as the wall he stood by see now he sets his shoulder in under the cornice of the wall and with a mighty push straightens the whole falling church so that it again stands up in perfect condition involuntarily the pope emitted a deep sigh of relief and loss of tension as if the little man had only waited for this he turned himself about with face directed towards the lateran an innocent saw that he who so wonderfully had rescued the head and mother of all churches was no other than the little poor brother francis from assisi when francis the day after stepped before the pope it was with a well-prepared tale lord pope said he i will tell you a story once there lived in a desolate place an extremely beautiful but very poor woman she saw the king of the country and she found favor in his eyes and he asked her to marry him hoping to have borne to him beautiful children but when they were married a long enough time the woman had borne many sons and she began to meditate within herself and said what shall i a poor woman do with all the children i have i have no inheritance from which they can live then she said to the sons fear not for you are the sons of a king go then to the court and he will give you all you want but as they came to the king he wondered at their beauty and saw that they resembled him and he said to them whose sons are you but they answered that they were sons of the poor woman in the desolate place then the king embraced them with great joy and said to them fear not for you are my sons if i feed so many at my table how much more should i feed you who are my lawful sons and he sent a messenger to the woman in the wilderness that she should send him all her children to the court so that he could support them after having ended this parable francis continued lord pope i am the poor woman in the wilderness god has in his mercy looked upon me and i have borne him sons in christ and the king of kings has said to me that he will take care of all my offspring for if he gives the stranger food much more should he give it to the children of his house god gives worldly goods to sinners on account of the love they have for their children how profusely will he not pour all his gifts upon those who follow his gospel and to whom therefore he owes that much thus francis spoke and innocent understood that it was not the world's wisdom but the spirit and power of god he broke out turning to the cardinals who sat there truly 
this is the pious and holy man by whom the church of god shall be restored and he arose embraced francis blessed him and the brothers and said to them go with god brothers and announce salvation for all as the lord reveals it to you and when the almighty has multiplied your numbers then come back to me and you will find me willing to give you further concessions and to charge you with a greater inheritance all the brothers knelt before the pope and promised him obedience as their superior permission to preach was also given to francis and only through him to the others as a conclusion to the audience the brothers finally received the clerky tonsure which was given them by cardinal john and which was the outer sign of the permission to preach the word after a visit to the graves of the apostles in st peter's and st paul francis and the brothers left rome their way led them out over the roman campagna and past soracte's white summits they hastened quickly from the place eager to be back in their accustomed surroundings once more to pursue the life and do the things for which they had so fortunately obtained the church's permission from the mouth of the vicar of christ end of book two chapter two book two chapter three of st francis of assisi a biography by johannes jornson translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book two francis the evangelist chapter three rivo torto after having wandered through the scorched roman campagna in the burning heat of a summer day francis and his companions approached the sabine mountains here they stopped for a while in the vicinity of the town of ortis in our day the junction point for the two great railroad lines which go to rome each from its own side of the apennines they rested here for a space of two weeks in one of the mountain valleys through which the green grey river nera flows the place was so beautiful says thomas of chaleno that the brothers were near proving untrue to their newly sanctioned plan of life by begging from door to door in ortis they obtained for themselves the necessary daily bread sometimes they got so much that they could lay aside some for the next day although this was not in accord with francis's designs the place was so desolate and empty that there was no one to whom they could give for alms what was left over an old etruscan grave served them as store chamber and so great a power had this isolated and solitary life in the midst of the mountains and of nature's loneliness upon the brethren that they seriously nourished the thought if it were not better for the salvation of their souls to remain here forever and to forget the world and mankind in a severe ascetic life those who have lived among the italian mountains will find it easy to understand this temptation there is something in the nature of the italian mountains that invites to the hermit life for example the limestone of which the sabine mountains are composed supplies natural caves and places of retreat for hermits for the simple man in italy the two principal needs for his nourishment are bread and wine and if the hermit has no wine the springs are bubbling and the brooks are flowing everywhere in the mountains there is a real italian feeling of enjoyment and contentment throughout the chapter in fioretti in which francis and his brother maceo eat the bread they have begged together on a fine big stone at the side of the clear spring and thank god so devoutly for the happiness to be allowed to sit in the warm sunshine under the blue sky and appease their thirst and their hunger at lady poverty's table with simple healthy food this is why italy's stories of her saints are so full of tales of hermits 
saint benedict of nursia himself began his career as a hermit in his grotto at subiaco where for three years he fasted and scourged himself so that the herdsmen who discovered him regarded him first as a wild beast and again one hundred years after the time of saint francis siena saw three of her most prominent and learned young men bernardo ptolemy and his two friends withdraw to the cypress-grown heights of mount oliveto and put on the white habit of the benedictine hermit separating them from the world this temptation to a life in lonely penance and prayer now drew near to francis and his friends here in this isolated valley among the sabine hills where no voice was heard except those of the birds and brooks but the temptation was overcome francis says his first biographer never depended on his own insight but asked in prayer for god's guidance in all things and so he now chose not to live for himself alone for it was made clear to him that he was sent out to save souls from the devil and win them for god soon the well-known places in the valley of spoleto greeted francis and his disciples and they re-established their dwelling in the shed at river torto and in the woods around the portiuncula chapel soon after their homecoming they had the happiness to receive the priest of assisi sylvester into their ranks as before related francis's liberality that day in st george's churchyard had made a deep impression on him and he began to form another opinion about the significance of our life than what he had hitherto entertained it came to pass that one night he saw in a dream a huge cross whose arms stretched over the whole world and that came out of the mouth of brother francis this made him understand that the brotherhood francis had begun to establish was to spread over the whole world of mankind and that its action was a divine one after some period of deliberation he decided himself to ask to be received among the brethren and thus became the first priest in the order francis emboldened by the power of the apostolic authority prosecuted the missionary activity he had begun before the journey to rome his preaching in accord with the permission given him was directed to the moral and social aspect of things he preached conversion from evil ways a life of goodness peace with god and with one's neighbor presumably with the consent of bishop guido the cathedral church in assisi was given to him for his sermons here he heralded the christian ideal without fear and without regard to other issues because he never as his biographers say gave any advice to others which he had not first practised in his own person for francis the proverb did not hold that the prophet is without honour in his own country that his exhortations were not fruitless is witnessed by the large accessions his order now received many of the people noble and common clerks and laymen were seized by the spirit of god cast aside all worldly distractions and followed the track francis had trod of these new disciples the majority were from assisi and its vicinity but the preaching of francis in san rufino operated in a much wider circle thomas of chelano compares its effects to a star rising brightly over the horizon and to the breaking of dawn after a gloomy night he compares it to a seed breaking forth from the ground with the coming of the flowers and spring the whole aspect of the place was changed he writes like a river rich in goodness and fruitfulness francis streamed through the place and transformed the gardens of the hearts of men so that they blossomed forth in virtue it is probable that brother thomas in this carefully worked out prose alludes to an occurrence which really changed the whole condition of assisi and which can undoubtedly be ascribed to the sermons of saint francis 
I refer to the adjustment between the upper and lower classes, maiores and minores, which was ratified in the great hall of the communal palace in 1210. We still possess the document which was drawn up on this occasion, and which begins thus. In the name of God, Amen. The grace of the Holy Ghost be with you, for the honor of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary, Emperor Otto, and Duke Leopold. After his introduction, a whole series of stipulations follows, of which the most important is the agreement below. In all mutual agreements, no alliance shall be entered into, neither with Pope or his nuncios or legates, nor with the emperor or king or their nuncios or legates, or with any state or fortification, or with any magnate, but they shall be united in all things which are necessary for the welfare and progress of the city of Assisi. In this, the Magna Carta of Assisi, almost all the citizens who hitherto had been bondsmen were released on payment of a very small ransom, which could be validly paid to the city authorities if their lords refused to accept it. Inhabitants of the environs of Assisi receive the same rights as the citizens proper. The protection of strangers was provided for. The compensation of ambassadors for going on embassies was stipulated. Finally, amnesty for the disturbances of 1202 was pronounced, and the proper authorities were strictly charged to carry out the work on the cathedral that had been underway since 1140. When we think of how the Italian republics, both in the 13th century and later, were rent by civil wars, then we can realize how eloquently such a document speaks for the peaceful growth and prosperity of Assisi. The biographers also picture Francis to us as the pacifier in other Italian states, such as Arezzo, Perugia, Siena. Even the celebrated wolf of Gubbio is nothing without the tale adorned in the legend about the treaty of peace between a little Italian republic and one of those inhuman savage lords of a castle, who, like Knight Werner of Urslingen, could bear a shield on the breast with the inscription, Enemy of God, of Pity, and of Mercy. An historical companion piece to Francis and the Wolf of Gubbio is given by Anthony of Padua face to face with the tyrant Ezzeline. This aspect of Francis's activity is pictured in the legends as the expulsion of devils. In Giotto's pictures in the upper church in Assisi, we see the demons flying in all sorts of horrible forms up the chimneys of Arezzo, while Francis's hand is lifted in blessing over the city. We, children of the twentieth century, have lost the power of representing the evil spirits in bodily form, as the artists and tellers of legends did in the Middle Ages. But can we say that their presence is less certain, or their disagreeable propinquity in many fateful moments less real? Are there no times and places when the great power of darkness is felt, not only in but around one? where it is as if a real incorporeal voice whispered in the ear when one is led off into the flames of hell hand in hand, when there is a low penetrating voice that goes through one, see that, go there. Ah, uh, there are not only many places, but also many houses, where the need is real that one of God's friends should appear upon the threshold and with mighty voice give the command, in the name of the Almighty God, and of his servant St. Francis, I command you evil spirits to depart. It was at this time that one day the rules of the order were being read aloud in the presence of Francis, and that the reader came to the part of the seventh chapter, where is the expression, et sint minores, and they shall be inferiors. The thought of a name for the brotherhood had long occupied Francis. The term penitence from Assisi, viri penitentes de Assisio, was only an expedient to repress the curious. 
on hearing this placed in the rules the word minores impressed him greatly little people little brothers that name suits me and mine well ordo fratrum minorum the order of the smaller brothers it became thomas of chelano in his first biography of st francis has given a sketch of the life of the brothers in the shed at rivo torto which in the bright harmony of clear colors on a sort of ground of gold reminds one of fra angelico's altarpieces when they returned from their work at evening time he writes and were again together or when they in the course of the day met on the road love and joy shone out of the eyes and they greeted each other with chaste embraces holy kisses cheerful words modest smiles friendly glances and equable minds because they had given up all self-love they thought only of helping each other with longing they hurried home with joy they abided there but separation was bitter and leaving was sad dissension was unknown among them there was no malice no envy no misunderstanding no bitterness but all was unity peace thankfulness and songs of praise seldom or never did they cease from praising god and praying to and thanking him for the good they had done sighing and grieving for what they had done badly or had failed in they felt that they were deserted by god when their hearts were not penetrated by the sweetness of the spirit so as not to fall asleep in their nightly prayers they wore belts studded with iron points whose pricking prevented them from sleeping filled with the holy ghost they not only prayed from the breviary like the catholic priests but at intervals sang out with suppliant voice and spiritual melody our father who art in heaven the central point in all this brotherly intercourse was francis from him none of the brothers kept anything hidden but revealed the most secret thoughts and feelings of their hearts to him they obeyed him and with so loving an obedience that not only did each one fulfill his behest but also tried to read his wish in his slightest expression the power francis exercised rested first and foremost on his personality he was the brother's teacher not only in word but also in action when he warned them against enjoyment in eating and even said that it was not possible to eat to satiety without danger of bearing the yoke of luxury they understood his warning better when they saw him strew ashes on his own food or pour cold water on it to take away its savour when he told them to fight heroically against all temptations it was he who gave them an example by jumping in winter into the ice-cold river to put to flight a temptation of the flesh every one who has had the happiness in his youth to have lived near a highly exalted personality will therefore understand that a young brother named Riserius had acquired the conviction that the good will of francis was an infallible sign of the satisfaction of god but now it came to pass with him the last to have come into the order that while francis showed himself friendly and loving to the others he seemed to make an exception in his case only when brother riserius had once come to this warped imagining naturally every occasion served only to implant it deeper within him if he came out as francis was going in he would think francis did so to avoid being with him if francis stood and talked with others and they happened to look in the direction of brother riserius then he would think that they must be complaining at having taken him into the order and were determining to ask him to take his leave again thus did this young brother misjudge all and was almost desperate certain that he was avoided and repelled by francis and consequently by god the sight of brother riserius pained face and imploring longing eyes seemed like a revelation to have betrayed to francis the poor youth's tribulations 
one day therefore he had the young brother summoned and said to him my dear son let no evil thought disturb thee or tempt thee thou art my own dear child and one of those i think the most of and as deserving of my love as of my confidence come then and speak with me when you will and whenever anything weighs upon thee thou art always thoroughly welcome overcome out of his senses with joy with heart happily beating and eyes streaming with tears the young brother left the master and knew of nothing until he in a lonely place out in the woods fell down on his knees and thanked god for his happiness two other stories that are associated with rivo torto tell of the same refined loving understanding of the special trouble of each individual brother one night thus it told in speculum perfectionis one of the brothers woke from sleep with loud cries and shouted oh i am dying i am dying all the others awoke and francis said let us get up my brothers and light the lamp as soon as the lamp was lighted he asked who was that who cried out i am dying one of the brothers answered it was i and francis asked further what ails thee my brother to make you die and he answered i am dying of hunger now this was in the early days of the brotherhood and they mortified and scourged their bodies beyond measure therefore francis had the table at once spread and sat at the table with the starving brother lest he should be ashamed to eat alone and he invited the rest of the brothers to take seats at the table and after they had eaten francis said to them my dear sons i truly say to you that every one must study his own nature some of you can sustain life with less food than others can and therefore i desire that he who needs more nourishment shall not be obliged to equal others but that every one shall give his body what it needs for being an efficient servant of the soul for as we are obliged to be on our guard against superfluous food which injures body and soul alike thus we must be on the watch against immoderate fasting and this the more because the lord wants conversion and not victims a trait of the same kind is told of when francis rose early one morning and took a sick brother whom he thought it would benefit to eat grapes fasting along with him into a vineyard and there sat by his side and gave him grapes to eat in company with himself lest the brother should be ashamed of eating alone it can be understood that as the speculum tells us the brother as long as he lived never forgot this attention of francis's and that he never could tell the other brothers this reminiscence of his youth without tears in his eyes the residence at rivo torto came to an end in a manner as abrupt as drastic one day as the brothers were in the shed praying quietly each in his place a peasant suddenly appeared with his ass which without more ado he drove in calling out in a loud voice go in long ears here we can surely be comfortable these words which seemed to be more intended for the brothers than for the ass showed that it was his intention to at once change the house of prayer into an ass's stable after a few minutes contemplation of the man's untroubled demeanor francis broke forth i know brothers that god has not called us to keep a hotel for asses but to pray and show men the way of salvation all then arose and left rivo torto forever from now on portiuncula was the central point of the franciscan movement and soon put the first modest abode completely in the shade and yet it was there that francis and the mistress of his heart the noble lady poverty had spent their first and perhaps happiest days end of book two chapter three Book Two, Chapter Four of Saint Francis of Assisi, a Biography by Johannes Jorensen. 
Translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Francis the Evangelist, Chapter Four, Portiuncula and the Early Disciples. The small and ancient chapel of Portiuncula, as it exists today, is a long room with a pointed arch ceiling and a semicircular apse, a gable roof a simple arched door in the facade and another in one of the side walls according to a tradition that for the first time is given in salvator vitalis's paradisus seraphicus milan sixteen forty five the chapel was built by five hermits during the pontificate of pope liberius in the fourth century who were returning home from the holy land with a relic of mary's grave which was given to them by saint cyril in any case there is found over the altar a picture of great age which represents the assumption of the blessed virgin into heaven the many angels who float around mary in the picture gave the popular name to the chapel of our lady of the angels the designation portiuncula little portion of earth dates from the benedictines on mount sabasio to whom the chapel had belonged ever since 576. In 1075, the building was in such a ruinous condition that the monks abandoned it and withdrew to the mother house upon the mountain. According to the legend, Pica had prayed in the deserted chapel and here received the knowledge that she would have a son who would eventually rebuild the fallen house of God. After the putting of it in order, Francis and his brothers usually kept themselves in the forest which surrounded the church, and it was a great joy to them when the abbey on Mount Sebasio, which now belonged to the Camaldolites, gave the brethren the privilege of using Portiuncula forever, for Francis was unwilling to take possession of the chapel in fee simple, and strictly kept up the custom of sending every year a basket of fish to the monks as payment of rent at the side of the chapel francis and his brothers built a hut of interwoven boughs plastered over with mud and thatched with leaves sacks of straw served for beds the naked earth was both table and chair and the hedge served for convent walls this was the first franciscan logo place established which according to francis's expressed wish was to be a model for all the others. When the Franciscan order began later to depart from his ideals, one of the signs of this departure was that the designation Luogo, locus, was changed for the more stately convento, whence the less severe branch of the order took a name conventuals. It was a new brotherhood, the poor of Christ, the Jesuati, founded by st john colombini of siena who assumed the old franciscan designation besides the original flock of disciples there was now gathered here in portiuncula a circle of new brothers who could properly be called the new generation of franciscans by the side of bernard giles angelo and sylvester tradition and legend from now on placed a second series of names, Rufino, Maceo, Juniper, Leo. Yes, this younger set is near surpassing the others and casting the older ones a little into the shade. It seems as if many of the older ones had a certain inclination to isolate themselves and set more of a price on solitude than on community life. Thus, Sylvester longed to keep himself in the caves of Carceri and there give himself up to prayer and meditation. Bernard was so wrapped up in God when he was in the woods that he did not even hear Brother Francis calling to him. At other times he wandered sometimes twenty, sometimes thirty days at a time alone on the highest mountain summits and saw the things which are on high giles led a life of extensive travelling was now in the holy land now in spain now in rome 
thou and barry at the shrine of st nicholas yet we will do wrong if we follow the legends and forget the works of early days on account of the newer members this before all applied to brother giles whom francis called by the title the knight of the round table and in whom all of the original franciscan spirit was vivified and stayed alive to the last until his death which happened in the year 1262 on the festival of st george the anniversary of his reception into the order giles continued to be god's good knight and the true st george of the noble lady poverty his life is especially a witness to the love of labor of the early franciscans his biography as it is written by his younger friend brother leo is full of such traits on his way to the holy land he came to brindisi and as there was no chance of embarking there at once he had to stay several days in the city here he begged an old cart filled it with water and dragged it through the city streets calling out like the water carriers qui vole de l'aqua who wants water as pay for water he took bread and such other things as were needed by him and his companions on the return from the same pilgrimage he was put ashore at ancona here too he found employment he went out and cut osiers for baskets and rushes for covering bottles he plated them and sold them not for money but for bread he also carried bodies to the grave and earned thereby not only a garment for himself but also for the brethren who accompanied him such deeds he wished to pray for him while he slept apparently it was during this stay in ancona that a priest who saw him coming home to the town with a bundle of rushes uttered the word hypocrite as giles passed by him on hearing this giles was so cast down that he could not keep back the tears and when the brother who accompanied him asked him the reason of his distress he answered because i am a hypocrite as a priest to-day said to me and does that make you believe that you are one asked the brother yes answered giles a priest cannot lie then his companion had to teach him that there is a difference between priests as between men and that like a man a priest can very likely do wrong and thus comforted the unhappy brother giles during his stay in rome giles had arranged it so that he heard mass early in the morning and then went out to a forest at some distance from the city here he gathered a bundle of wood which he carried back to rome and sold for bread and other necessities once a lady wanted to give him more for the wood than he had asked as she saw that it was a religious who was before her but giles now would not take more than half the former price i will not yield to avarice he declared at the time of the wine harvest he helped pluck grapes in the olive harvest he gathered olives he often gleaned corn in the fields like other paupers but gave most of it away saying that he had no granary to keep it in from san sisto's fountain outside of rome he brought water to the monks in the convent of santi quattro coronati and also helped the convent cook in mixing bread and grinding flour altogether he took part in all kinds of work by which he could support himself he only had one invariable requirement the time necessary to read his breviary and for meditation in the midst of this life of ceaseless industry he was infused with a deep franciscan goodness once he cut the hood off his cloak while on his way to san Iago de compostela and gave it to a poor person who had asked for alms he went about for the next twenty days without any hood as he went through lombardy a man beckoned to him giles thought that he wanted to give him something and approached him but with a grin the man stuck a pair of dice into his hand god forgive you my son said giles and went his way when carrying water to the monks in santi quattro coronati 
he was addressed by a wanderer on the appian way who wanted a drink from his jar giles refused it whereupon the man made an outcry in his wrath giles made no response but as soon as he had reached the convent he got another jar filled it overtook the man and asked him to drink saying do not be angry with me but i did not like to take the monk's water that another had tasted of even when a guest with such noble people as the bishop of tusculum cardinal nicholas he went out and earned his bread which he afterwards ate at the cardinal's table one day it rained in torrents and the cardinal was rejoicing that brother giles for once would have to eat of his food meanwhile giles went to the kitchen found that it was dirty and offered the cook to clean it for a price of two loaves the offer was accepted and the cardinal was disappointed in his hopes as it rained the next day also giles earned his two loaves by polishing all the knives in the house under the title of brother giles wisdom there are collected a quantity of maxims and sayings apparently mostly from his later years thus it is told that two cardinals once had paid him a visit and on leaving had politely recommended themselves to his prayers it is surely not necessary that i should pray for you my lords was his answer for it is evident that you have more faith and hope than i have how is that asked the two princes of the church astonished and perhaps a little anxiously for brother giles was known for his wit because you who have so much of power and honor and the glory of this world hope to be saved and i who live so poorly and wretchedly fear in spite of all that i will be damned until his death brother giles lived true to the franciscan ideals poverty chastity cheerfulness a sonnet which he composed in honor of chastity is preserved for us as well as some fragments of other verse in his little convent garden at perugia he listened to the cooing doves and spoke to them and on beautiful summer mornings he would be seen wandering up and down among his flower beds singing the praises of god and playing as if on a violin with two sticks one of which he scraped upon the other if the older brothers lived thus much by themselves we find the newer generation of franciscans almost always in the company of francis especially was maceo of marignano near assisi the master's companion on many important journeys while francis was a very insignificant man and of small size and therefore was taken for a poor being by those who did not know him on the other hand maceo was large and fine-looking and had the gift of eloquence and could speak with people when the two went together begging francis got nothing but a few bits and remains of bread and that dry but maceo got good big pieces and bread enough and whole loaves just the same the tall fine-looking eloquent maceo offered his services up in carceri to look after the door to receive alms and to go into the kitchen so that he alone would bear the whole burden of the house while the other brothers could give themselves undisturbedly to prayer and meditation and once when he was walking with francis and came to a crossway where one could go to florence to siena or to arezzo and brother maceo asked father which way shall we take francis answered him the way god wishes but brother maceo asked further how shall we know god's will and francis answered that i will now show you in the name of holy obedience i order you to start turning round and round in the road here as the children do and not to stop until i tell you to then brother maceo began to whirl round and round as children do and he became so giddy that he often fell down but as francis said nothing to him he got up again and continued at last as he was turning round with great vigour francis said stop and do not move 
and he stood still. And Francis asked him, How is your face turned? Brother Maceo answered, Toward Siena. Then Francis said, It is God's will that we shall go to Siena today. Francis exercised the tall, impressive Brother Maceo with other such humiliations until he felt humble and small and maceo at last became so deep in humility that he regarded himself as a great sinner and very deserving of hell although he daily waxed strong in all virtues and this humility filled him with such an inward light that he was always full of joy and often when he prayed he would give out a cry of joy a monotone like the cooing of a dove and with cheerful face and joyful heart he lived in the sight of god and yet regarded himself as the most insignificant of men but it came to pass in his old age that young brother jacob of faleroni asked him why he did not make a change in his way of rejoicing and make a new verse then he answered with great delight because he who has all his happiness in only one thing should not sing but the one verse brother rufino of assisi among the younger disciples reminds us of bernard of quintavalle among the older ones like him he was of noble family he belonged to the noble race shefi or shefi and like bernard he had an inclination to be a hermit an inclination which was so strong that finally he on a single opportunity offering itself was near leaving francis whose practical christianity appealed to him less than a life in ascetic solitude like that of the old hermits of the desert he was often seen sunk in prayer and meditation so that he could scarcely be roused out of it and when he at last was awakened there was no connection in what he said on the other hand brother juniper or Ginepro, was entirely of francis's spirit of him francis said jokingly i wish we had a whole grove of such juniper trees it was he who one day when one of the brothers who lay sick in portiuncula convent expressed a desire for boiled pig's feet sprang into the woods and cut off a foot from one of the swine which went there after mass and served it to the sick brother after him came the peasant to whom the pig belonged complained to francis whose suspicion fell upon brother juniper he was called and answered freely about his action for said he our brother got so much good out of the foot of this pig that i would have no remorse if i had cut the feet off of a hundred swine with much difficulty francis brought brother juniper to suspect the least wrong in such a wilful trespass upon a neighbor's goods very well said he at last i see that the man is angry with us but now i will try to find him and pacify him and he ran the best he could and found the peasant and told him the whole story how the brother who was sick wanted a cooked pig's foot that pigs are made for man's use for his nourishment and food that everything belonged equally to all men because no one can make so much as one little pig but god alone can do it and that therefore he had taken the one pig's foot because the sick man had wanted it so badly all this brother juniper told very explicitly and with satisfaction to the angry peasant being now sure that all was understood and that he would be understood and that the amputation of the pig's foot would be forgiven but it turned out otherwise for the man began to abuse brother juniper calling him an evildoer a loafer a thief and robber a simpleton and a fool why he cannot have understood me thinks brother juniper and begins anew his story still more impressively than before then when he came to the end he fell on the neck of the peasant and cried out see i did this for my poor sick brother that he might get well again and you have helped me so you must cease being troubled or angry 
but let us together rejoice and thank the good god who gives us the fruits of the earth and the flocks of the field and the wild beasts of the woods and who wants us all to be his children and to help one another like good brothers and sisters am i not right my dear good brother and thereupon brother juniper embraced the peasant and pressed him to his heart and kissed him and the peasant thought over it begged for forgiveness from god and from the brothers with bitter tears for his hardness and went away and caught a pig and slaughtered it cooked it and brought it himself to the convent at portiuncula as a gift to the brethren the same brother juniper was once in a little convent and the time came for the other brothers to leave it to go each to his work as they went off the guardian brother gave instructions to brother juniper and said to him take good care of the house while we are away and cook a little food before we return depend upon me answered brother juniper and the others went on when he was alone he began to reflect over what he had been told and said to himself as he went on chopping wood and gathering some twigs to make the fire with is it not really unreasonable that a brother should thus be in the kitchen every day and use up his time there without being able to pray a little bit i shall certainly see to it so that to-day there shall be prepared so much food that even if the brothers were many more they would have enough to eat for the next two weeks having reached this determination brother juniper went to the neighboring city and purchased there a lot of clay pots together with meat game eggs and a quantity of vegetables he lit a big wood fire filled the pots with water and put all the food into them chickens with the game all unplucked the vegetables without washing and the rest in the same style the brothers came home as brother juniper was in full blast with his cooking a huge fire was roaring away and brother juniper jumped from one pot to the other so that it was a joy to see him and stirred them with a long stick because the fire was so hot that he could not get near the pots at last he rang the dinner bell and red with his exertions and the heat of the fire he carried in his dishes of food and set them down before the assembled brethren saying eat now and then we will go to our prayers i have cooked so much food to-day that there is enough to last us for the next two weeks meanwhile none of the brethren touched the food which brother juniper vainly with great eloquence offered them as a great feast but as it dawned upon brother juniper what he had done he cast himself at their feet kneeling and striking his breast and blamed himself for having spoiled so much good food it was not always pure naivete that was at the bottom of such actions sometimes brother juniper wished in this burlesque manner to give others of the brethren a lesson which might be needed as they departed from the spirit of the order possibly the brothers to whom he served the wild lobscous had shown too great interest and had spent too much time in the cooking department a reprimand of the best kind was given by brother juniper when in the middle of the night he served porridge with a big lump of butter in the middle to his superior who had reproved him the preceding afternoon for his too great generosity in giving alms father said brother juniper as he stood before his door with the plate of porridge in one hand and a lighted candle in the other to-day when you reprimanded me for my fault i noticed that you were very hot from pure excitement now i have prepared this porridge for you and beg you to eat it it is good for the throat and chest the superior who understood the meaning of this untimely attention harshly told brother juniper to go away with his foolish tricks well said he the porridge is cooked and has to be eaten so you hold the light while i do the eating the other was enough of a franciscan to answer this boldness by sitting down at the table with brother juniper and sharing the porridge with him 
such actions resulted in making brother juniper famous and people used to collect together when he was coming to see him it so happened that he was once sent to rome and several prominent persons of the same type of the ladies rustling in silks and smelling of perfume who in our days are seen lorgnetting the martyr's graves in the catacombs presented themselves at his door for the purpose of meeting him brother juniper had been told about it and prepared at once to play a trick on their curiosity masquerading as piety in a field by the roadside a couple of boys were playing seesaw having placed a plank across a support each sitting on his own end of the plank and going up and down alternately so brother juniper took the place of one of the boys and when the noble company came along they were much surprised to find the man of god busily engaged in seesawing none the less they greeted him with great deference and next waited for him to stop his play and come out to them but brother juniper troubled himself little about their greeting and waiting on the contrary he gave them more energy to his seesawing and after the strangers had waited thus a reasonable time and brother juniper kept on seesawing they went away irritated as they mutually agreed that the so-called holy brother was an entirely common peasant and lout void of all culture then only did brother juniper leave his seesawing and went on to rome in peace and alone like brother leo and brother angelo tancredi of rieti brother juniper belonged to the small select circle who after the master's death associated themselves with st clara brother juniper was present with the other two at the deathbed of st clara what is the news from god she asked cheerfully as this loyal disciple of francis showed himself at her bedside and he sat down by her and spoke flaming sparks of words a chip of the same block as brother juniper was that brother john who bore the surname the simple whose calling to enter the order is told in the following recital when the brethren were living at portiuncula and were now many in number st francis went around to the towns and churches in the vicinity of assisi and preached to the people that they should be converted and he had a broom with him to clean the churches of dirt for it made st francis very unhappy when he saw that a church was not as clean as he wished and therefore he sometimes stopped in his preaching and gathered the priests around him in some retired place so that no one else should hear and preached on the salvation of souls and especially on keeping the churches and altars clean and all that had to do with the celebration of the holy mysteries and one day he came to a village in the environs of assisi and started in all humility to sweep and clean it but the rumor of who was there ran through the whole place and a peasant who was ploughing his field also heard of it and came at once and found him busy sweeping the church but the peasant whose name was john said to him brother give me the broom and let me help you and he took the broom out of his hand and swept vigorously then they sat down together and he said to st francis brother for a long time i have had a desire to serve god and especially after i heard of thee and thy brethren but i never knew how i could meet thee it has now pleased god to bring us together so i will do all thou wishest when st francis perceived so great a zeal he rejoiced in the lord especially because at this time he had only a few brothers and it seemed to him that this simple and upright man could become a good brother therefore he said to him brother if you have it in your mind to live like us you must free yourself of all the possessions you can dispose of and you must give them to the poor after the counsels of the gospel for thus have all my brothers done each in his own way when he had heard this he turned back to the field where he had left the oxen standing in the plough unyoked them 
and brought one of them back to St. Francis. Brother, said he to him, it is now many years that I have served my father and all in the house. I intend, therefore, as my portion by inheritance, to take this ox and give it to the poor in the way that shall seem best to you. But when his parents and his sisters, who were all younger than he, heard that he was going to leave them, they began to cry so strongly and so long that St. Francis was moved to pity, because they were many and could do nothing. Therefore he said to them, This your son wants to serve God, and that should not displease you in him, but you should rather rejoice over it but so that you in the meanwhile shall not be without comfort i will have him give you this ox just as he would have given it to the other poor as the gospel teaches us then they were all comforted with the word st francis said and still more that they had got the ox back but brother john was clothed in the habit of the order and so great was his simplicity that he thought he was obliged to do all that St. Francis did. When therefore St. Francis was in a church or other place to pray, he watched him closely so as to follow all his ways and movements. And when St. Francis bent the knee or lifted his hands to heaven or spit or sighed, then he did exactly the same. But as St. Francis became aware of this, he scolded him very cheerfully about it. Then Brother John answered, Brother, I have promised to do all that you do, and therefore it is fit that I copy you in all things. Francis's special confidant and best friend among the younger ones, yes, among all the disciples at this time, was Brother Leo of Assisi, who filled the office of his amanuensis and secretary. Francis called him, perhaps, with a willful opposition to his name Leone, Lion, Frate Pecorella di Dio, Brother Little Lamb of God. It was together with him that Francis, according to the Fioretti, was once in a place where they had no bravery to pray out of. So as to spend the time in praising God, Francis proposed the following part prayer. I shall first say, O oh, brother Francis, you have done so much ill and committed so many sins here in the world that you are worthy to go to hell, and to this you must answer, Yes, it is true that you deserve the deepest hell. And blithe as a dove, brother Leo answered, Willingly, father, let us begin in the name of God. Then Francis began to say, O oh, brother Francis, thou hast done so much evil and committed so many sins here in the world that thou art worthy to go to hell. And brother Leo answered, God will do so much good through thee that thou shalt come into paradise. And Francis answered, Do not say that, brother Leo. But when I now say, Brother Francis, thou hast done so much wrong before God that thou art worthy to be damned, then answer thus, Thou art certainly worthy to come among the damned. And Brother Leo answered, Willingly, Father. Then Francis began to sigh and groan and beat his breast and said in a loud voice, O Lord God of heaven and earth, I have committed such wrong against thee and so many sins that I am worthy to be damned by thee. And Brother Leo answered, O Brother Francis, God will do such things with thee that thou shalt be happy before all the blessed. But Francis wondered why Brother Leo was so set in not answering as he had been told to, and he scolded him for it, saying, Why dost thou not answer as I told thee to? In the name of holy obedience, I order thee to answer as I now will teach thee. Thus I say, O thou bad Francis, dost thou think that God will have pity on thee? that thou hast committed so many sins against the Father of mercy and God of comfort, that thou in no way art worthy to find mercy. And thou, brother Leo, God's little lamb, answer, thou art in no way worthy to find mercy. But as Francis said after this, O thou bad Francis, etc., brother Leo answered him, 
the father god whose mercy is infinitely greater than thy transgressions will show thee great mercy and will moreover manifest to thee much favor over this answer francis was very angry and a little carried away and he said to brother leo why hast thou fallen so as to show thyself disobedient now thou hast so many times answered the opposite of what i told thee but brother leo humbly and reverentially answered god knows father that every time i have wished to answer thee as thou commandest me to but god forced me to speak as it pleased him and not as it pleased me francis wondered greatly over this and said to brother leo i pray thee in charity to answer me this time as i have told thee brother leo replied in god's name i will certainly answer every time as thou wishest it and with tears francis now said o thou wicked brother francis dost thou believe that god can have mercy upon thee brother leo answered thou shalt have great favors from god and he shall raise thee up and glorify thee for all eternity for he who lowers himself shall be exalted and i cannot say anything else for god is speaking through my mouth it was also in company with brother leo that francis always according to the fioretti went one winter day from perugia to portiuncula and the great cold affected them severely and francis called to brother leo who went ahead and spoke thus to him brother leo even if we brothers over the whole earth give good examples of holiness and edification mark it well and write it down that in that is not the perfect happiness and francis went a little further and he called a second time and said o oh, brother leo even if we brothers gave the blind their sight again cured the lame drove out devils made the deaf to hear the cripples to walk the dumb to talk and what is still more woke the dead after four days had passed mark thou that in that there is not perfect happiness and he went on a little and called out loudly o oh, brother leo even if we brothers spoke all tongues and knew all wisdom and the whole of the scriptures and were able to reveal the future and the secrets of the heart so mark thou that in that there is not perfect happiness and francis went on a piece more and then called with a high voice o brother leo thou god's little lamb even if we brothers spoke with the tongues of angels and knew the courses of the stars and the powers of herbs and all the treasures of the earth were revealed to us and all the virtues and powers of birds and beasts and fishes and also the properties of mankind and of trees and stones and roots and water mark thou this still that in that there is not perfect happiness and francis went on a little further and then said with a loud voice o oh, brother leo even if we brothers knew how to preach so that all the faithless would be converted to the faith of christ mark thou still that in that there is not perfect happiness and thus he talked for more than half the way but at last brother leo said with much wonder father i beg thee for god's sake to tell me where perfect happiness can be found and francis answered him when we come to portiuncula and are wet through with rain and frozen with cold and dirty with the mud of the road and overcome with hunger and we knock on the convent door and the porter comes and is angry and says who are you and we say we are two of thy brothers and he says you do not speak the truth but are two highway robbers who go about and deceive people and steal alms from the poor away with you when he speaks thus and will not open the door for us but lets us stand out in the cold and snow and water and hunger and the night falls and when we endure such abusive words and such a wickedness and such treatment 
and endure it without becoming angry and without quarrelling with him and when we instead think in humility and love that the porter knows us as we really are and that it is god who lets him talk against us o brother leo mark thou that is perfect happiness and if we keep on knocking and he comes out and is angry and treats us like a pair of thieves and hunts us away with evil words and with ear-boxing and says to us get out ye shameless rascals go to the lepers here you will find neither food nor lodging and we bear this too with patience and cheerfulness and charity o brother leo mark thou that therein is perfect happiness and if we driven by cold and hunger and by the night knock again and beg him with bitter tears that he for god's sake will let us in if only across the threshold and he gets still more angry and says you are certainly shameless vagabonds but now you will get your deserts and he runs out with a knotted stick and seizes us by the hoods and throws us to the ground and rolls us in the snow and nearly kills us with the stick and if we endure all this so patiently and think of the sufferings of christ the all-praised one and of how much we ought to suffer for the sake of our love of him o brother leo mark thou that in this is perfect happiness now hear the end of all this brother leo more than all grace and all the gifts of the holy ghost which christ vouchsafes to his friends is the conquering of yourself and the willing endurance of suffering injustice contempt and harshness for of the other gifts of god we cannot take any credit to ourselves for they are not ours but come from god so that the apostle says what hast thou that thou hast not received but after you have received it why do you take credit for it as if you had it of yourselves but of trials and sufferings and crosses we can take the credit to ourselves therefore the apostle also says i will take credit for nothing except for the cross of our lord jesus christ ernest renan has justly said that since the time of the apostles there has never been a more powerful attempt to put the gospel into practice than in the movement started by francis it is no wonder then one night in a vision a pious man thought that he saw all men who were alive in the world stand like blind men around portiuncula and with folded hands and faces lifted to heaven call to god to give them back their sight and as they stood thus the heavens opened and a great light fell upon portiuncula and all who stood about it and all who had been blind opened their eyes and saw the light of salvation end of book two chapter four Book Two, Chapter Five of Saint Francis of Assisi, a Biography, by Johannes Jornson, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two, Francis the Evangelist, Chapter Five, Saint Clara and San Damiano. While men sometimes must be satisfied to represent theory practice often outside of all theory is the vocation of woman no one ever realizes more fully a man's ideal than a woman once she is possessed by it this must not be taken to intimate that francis of assisi did not put into practice the gospel which he preached on the contrary but if one wishes to see the franciscan life in a form free from all enforced additions and unfavorable foreign influences one must above all others turn to his great female disciple st clara of assisi 
she was accustomed to call herself brother francis's plant she is really the flower of franciscanism and he who visits the places where she has lived inhales even after seven hundred years have gone the singularly pure and heart-dripping perfume of this flower clara was born in assisi in 1194 probably on july the 11th her father was favorino de scifi her mother ortolana of the fiume family belonging in sterpetto the family was noble on both sides and the scifi belonged to the most prominent family in assisi favorino bore the title of count of sasso rosso the name of the cliff that rises over assisi his fortified palace is still shown to visitors near the porta vecchia not far from the church of st clara ortolana gave him five children a son basso and four daughters penenda clara agnes and beatrice it is told of ortolana that she was a good and pious child and among other things had undertaken such dangerous and prolonged pilgrimages as to the holy land to bury and to rome shortly before clara was born she is said to have received in prayer the promise of god that the child she was to bear would be a light for the whole world as a sequence thereof the child was given in baptism the name clara the bright in metaphorical rendering the celebrated one clara grew up in her home surrounded by the prosperity and order which are so favorable for the development of a sure and reasonable fear of god moral disorder leads almost invariably to poverty while the fear of god is useful for all things and has all promises for this life it is not only in our days that the answer to the question how shall i get on in the world has been fear god and keep his commandments for up to a certain degree it is also true what the apologists evidently pushed too far when they adduce as a proof of the superiority of a religion the statistics of its millionaires little clara at a very young age went beyond the usual degree of piety a favorite reading in her time was the stories of the lives of the old ascetics vitae patrum apparently clara had made early acquaintance with these legends in any case we read of her that she as a little girl greatly longed to wear a garment of horsehair and that she just as the hermit paul of ferme in historia lausiaca daily recited a great number of prayers which she kept count of with the help of little stones while she thus did penance herself she was like all the pious of the middle ages very zealous in giving to the poor thus clara grew up and became strong and beautiful at the age of fifteen years she had her first suitor and one pleasing in the highest degree to her parents when they spoke to their daughter about him they met to their surprise a certain resistance clara would not hear anything of marrying and when her mother pressed her for a reason the daughter admitted that she had consecrated herself to god and wanted nothing of any man this was more piety than favorino and ortolana had counted on the regular everyday christianity had in the middle ages just as in our days a great dislike for all that seemed to be too much of religion over and over again we are witnesses in the history of those times of the bitter disputes which father and mother carried on with sons and daughters whose fear of god seemed to them to go beyond the proper bounds of a good citizenship the sixteen-year-old clara must now fight this battle but she had the good fortune not to be without support in the contest it was at this precise time that francis whose conversion had attracted such attention in assisi was returning from rome with the papal permission to preach and now mounted the pulpit in san rufino a few steps from the scifi palace here and in san giorgio's church clara heard him speak and from the first moment she saw him 
was convinced that such a life as he led was to be hers and that it was the will of god the two friars minor rufino and sylvester who were both of her family paved the way for her and followed by a female relative to whom tradition has given the name bona guelfucci she sought francis and laid open her heart to him francis had already heard the rumors about clara and wished as the legend says to rob the bad world of so noble a booty and enrich his lord therewith he advised her therefore openly to despise the world its vanity and perishability not to yield to the wishes of her parents in the matter of her marriage but to keep her body as a temple for god alone and not to have any bridegroom but christ from now on francis was clara's spiritual guide and under his direction she was seized by a stronger and stronger desire to take the final step and let all things go that did not purely and entirely belong to the duty of man to his god she could not see how it was any part of this obligation to give herself to a man because her parents wished it and when she it was in the lent of twelve twelve sat in st george's church and heard francis from the pulpit speak so wonderfully of despising the world of voluntary poverty of pining after heaven and of the nakedness of our crucified lord jesus christ and the insults and his most holy sufferings her heart burned in her the moment she left with the desire to take off her elegant clothes and to live like jesus and like francis in contentment labor prayer peace and joy at last her desire for the new life became so strong that she could not be any longer restrained but must change the mode of existence she had hitherto followed francis set the night after palm sunday as the time for her to change the joys of this world for grief for the suffering of our lord clara utilized this feast day march eighteen twelve twelve to say farewell to the world in the most solemn manner wearing her richest dress she went with her mother and sisters to church no one among the women and girls of assisi were in such festive attire as the beautiful fair-haired claire Sheafy on that day on palm sunday the church commemorates the entry of christ into jerusalem olive branches which represent palm branches are consecrated that day by the priest and are distributed to the congregation who go in procession through the church while the choir sings the beautiful old anthem pueri hebreorum portantes ramos olivarum obviaverunt domino clamantes et dicentes hosanna in excelsis with olive boughs in their hands the children of the jews went out to meet the lord crying out and saying glory be to god on high as the distribution of the consecrated olive branches was in progress and all who were in the church came forward to the altar rail to receive a branch from bishop guido who said mass there was only one who kept back and this one was clara Sheafy. her emotions on thinking of the great step she was about to take may well have overcome the young girl here in the same church she had knelt so many mornings in the past years at the side of her mother and of her small sisters and heard mass with them and never thought that it could be different and now today it was for the last time on this very day she was to say farewell to them forever without their knowledge and the following evening was to be the last she would spend in the home of her childhood and youthful days the thought of her mother's tenderness of her young sister's charms affections and confidence overcame clara all the many happy and strong bonds which years weave unnoticed around those who grow up in the same home in this solemn hour cut into and wounded her heart and she wept like the woman she was 
wept the tears the bride weeps when she leaves father and mother bishop guido saw her bowed head and sobbing form and understood her it is probable that francis had told him what was to take place in any event he took with fine sympathy the palm clara had not taken and brought it himself down to her in her place in the church clara carried her flight into effect the next night out of a back door which was blocked by a pile of wood which she had to remove herself she got out upon the street and led by bona guelfucci took the road to portiuncula the franciscans who had expected her went to meet her with torches and soon she was kneeling before our lady's image in the little chapel and gave to the world for love of the most holy and loved child jesus wrapped in poor rags in the manger her letter of divorce which she had written long ago she gave her shining dress into the hands of the brothers and received in its place a rough woolen robe such as the brothers wore she exchanged her jewelled belt for a common rope with knots upon it and after her golden hair had fallen before the scissors which francis plied she let her high stiff headdress lie upon the ground and covered her head instead with a tight black veil instead of her rich embroidered shoes which she had worn at the festival in the church she put a pair of wooden sandals on her naked feet she then took three vows of consecration and promised moreover like the brethren to obey francis as her superior after the change was over by which the high-born lady clara sheafy became sister clara francis took her the same night to the benedictine sisters convent of st paul near the village of isola romanesca now bastia where he had temporarily arranged for her reception it could not naturally be long unknown what had become of clara favorino and his relatives had quickly discovered her refuge and presented themselves at the convent to induce her to return but the eighteen-year-old girl was immovable neither prayers nor flattery nor promises availed and when the father and uncles proposed to use force she clung to the altar in the church as she threw her veil aside and showed her cropped hair for many days the family renewed their attempts to win back clara and francis found it at last to be the wisest course to transfer her to another convent sant'angelo and panso which also belonged to the benedictine sisters angry as favorino had been he now was more furious than ever when his young daughter agnes sixteen days after clara's flight also left her home and went to san angelo to be there received into the sister's life of her he had had great hopes she was engaged and the marriage already settled and now she was taken also with the same madness wild with rage and indignation he asked his brother mondalo to take twelve armed men and get agnes back the nuns in the convent of san angelo drew back alarmed from the weapons that confronted them and deserted agnes the young girl scarcely more than a child made a vigorous resistance and the men had to adopt strenuous measures blows and kicks were hailed upon her they pulled her by the hair and thus drew her out of the convent clara clara come out and help me the unhappy one cried in vain as locks of her hair and bits of her clothes were left hanging on the bushes by the roadside clara was in her cell and asked god to help her in this hour of need and then it suddenly came to pass the twelve strong men were unable to bring agnes's body one inch further she became suddenly so heavy that she might have been of stone the men pushed and pulled her but in vain she had eaten lead the whole night said one of them grinning yet the nuns know what tastes good answered another but her uncle mondaldo became so furious over this unexpected obstacle that he lifted his armored fist to crush with one blow the contumacious girl's head 
but it came to pass that he too was petrified and stood powerless with lifted but helpless arm meanwhile clara came to the scene and the half-dead agnes was abandoned to her the family made no further attempt to prevent the two young girls from following their vocation later the third sister beatrice joined them and after favorino's death ortolana also the convent of sant'angelo could in the nature of things be only a temporary abode for clara and agnes they were not benedictines did not wear the benedictine habit and did not follow the rule of saint benedict francis in order to find a convent for them sought his old benefactors the camaldolites of monte subasio and who could paint his joy when these monks who had already given him portiuncula and who on april twenty second twelve twelve had given to the city of assisi the ancient temple of minerva changed into a merry church as it is seen still on the city marketplace now showed themselves willing to give him san damiano and the little convent belonging to the church with some few sisters clara took possession of the building within whose walls she for forty-one years as her biographer says with the blows of the scourge of penance should break open the alabaster vase of her body so that the whole church was filled with her soul's perfume for here it is that the life of prayer and labor of poverty and joy which i have called the flower of franciscanism unfolded itself the example which clara had given worked in a wide circle there seems to have been among women in that time a desire lying torpid for a life above the plane of the senses which is so well symbolized by the white walls of the cloister maidens who were not yet bound to the world hastened to san damiano to live there with her those whose attachment to their families did not permit this sought in secrecy to live as much of a convent life as possible noble ladies devoted their dowries to the building of cloisters into which they themselves entered in sackcloth and ashes to do penance for their past lives marriage was no impediment for man and wife went each to his own the man to francis and the woman to clara the conditions of entrance into san damiano were the same as for the entrance into portiuncula to give all possessions to the poor the convent could take nothing that must always be the fortified tower of the highest poverty as clara with a warlike turn in the spirit of the time expresses it the life of the sisters was the same as that of the brothers work and begging while some remained at home and worked others went out and begged from door to door almost all the paragraphs of the forma vivendi the rule of life which francis now wrote for the sisters are devoted to these few points and whose principal contents were the obligation to evangelical poverty apparently by the intermediation of francis innocent the third gave his approval to this rule even more formally than he had approved the brother's rule as clara first in twelve fifteen by francis's express command took the position as abbess in san damiano it is not too bold an hypothesis to place the pope's approval of the sisters rule in this year hitherto francis had been able to be the head of both orders and their leader but before rome clara had to stand as the superior of the sisters just as francis of the brothers innocent the third is said to have written with his own hand the first lines of the remarkable privilegium paupertatis so different from the privileges for which courts are usually importuned by which he accords to clara and her sisters the right to be and to remain poor as clara shared francis's feeling about poverty as the foundation of christian perfection in conformity with the words you cannot serve god and mammon so did she also share francis's ideas about work 
in spite of her dignity as abbess it was she who most often served at table poured water over the other sisters hands and waited upon them rather than ask others to do for her she would do things for herself she personally took care of the sick and drew back from no work however repugnant when the other sisters came home from outside the convent it was clara who would wash their feet at night she would get up and put the covering on the sisters who had uncovered themselves in sleep and were liable to become chilled francis often sent sick and weak people to san damiano where claire took care of them and sometimes cured them when it was she who was sick she would not stop working as soon as it was possible she would sit up in bed with a cushion behind her back and embroider altar raiment thus she made in francis's own spirit over fifty pairs of altar cloths of the kind called corporals and sent them laid into silk envelopes to the churches upon the mountains and on the plain as she surpassed the other sisters by her good example in her works so was it also in her religious life when compline's the last prayer for the day in the breviary was over clara stayed long before the crucifix the same whose voice francis had heard and before the little flame which in all catholic churches burns night and day in the perpetual lamp before the sacrament of the altar here she gave herself up to the sympathetic contemplation of the sufferings of the saviour here she prayed the crucis officium the prayers in honour of the cross of christ which francis had arranged and taught her but notwithstanding all this she was up in the morning before all the others herself waked the sisters lit the lamps and rang the bell for early mass at the same time she did not spare her body which by nature was full-blooded and strong her bed was in the first period in san damiano a bundle of vine twigs her pillow a log of wood later she lay upon leather with an uncomfortable pillow under her head and finally by francis's express command upon a sack of straw he it was also who forbade her in lent and on st martin's fast to eat only on three weekdays and then only bread and water a custom she had originally started he had bishop guido order her as a matter of duty to eat daily at least one and a half ounces of bread it was perhaps on account of the prohibition of this severe fasting that in compensation she for a while wore a garment of pigskin with the bristles inside which garment she later exchanged for a penitential belt of hair cloth when she returned from church after having prayed there for a long time her face seemed to shine and the words she spoke were full of joy once she was so seized by the significance of the holy water as a symbol of the blood of christ that she sprinkled the sisters with it all day and pleadingly exhorted them never to forget the rivers of salvation that flowed from the wounds of christ one monday thursday evening she was absorbed in spirit and could not be waked for twenty-four hours why are the lights still burning she asked as she awoke is it not yet day one christmas night she lay sick and could not follow the other sisters to church but heard in her bed the whole divine service in the convent church of san francesco and saw the child jesus in the christmas crib there it could be no secret to francis in how high a degree he was an object of admiration to clara and the other sisters and that a part of their religious feeling was intertwined with his personality to turn the sisters from this and direct their hearts to god alone he imperceptibly yet in adequate degree withdrew into the background his visits to san damiano which at first had been frequent became little by little of rare occurrence this action at last attracted the attention of his disciples and they assigned as a reason for it a lack of kindness to the sisters francis explained to them his reason that he did not wish to stand between them and christ 
for no consideration would he encourage the purely personal devotion to the priest or individual once he had agreed to come to san damiano and preach clara was greatly devoted to sermons when pope gregory the ninth at a subsequent time wished to prohibit the franciscans from preaching in this convent she impeded this prohibition by sending the brothers away also who after the closure was in force at san damiano about twelve nineteen went from door to door and begged for the sisters if we have to go without spiritual bread we can even go without bodily bread also she declared and the pope was obliged to take off his prohibition now francis had permission to go to the sisters and preach and all were glad not only at hearing god's word but also at seeing their spiritual father and guide francis entered the church and stood for a while with uplifted eyes absorbed in prayer then he turned to some of the sisters who were serving in the sacristy and asked for some ashes when the ashes were brought francis made a circle with them around himself and what was left over he strewed upon his own head then only did he break the silence not to preach but only to recite the fiftieth psalm of david the great penitential psalm miserere when he had said it to the end he went quickly away he had taught the sisters to see in him nothing but a poor sinner in sackcloth and ashes to the same order of thought may the tale be referred which is preserved for us in the fioretti of how st clara eat with st francis and his brothers in santa maria degli angeli it reads thus when st francis was in assisi he several times visited st clara and gave her many salutary admonitions and she had so strong a desire to eat with him and asked him so many times about it but he would not grant her the favor but the brothers who had knowledge of this desire of st clara said to st francis father it seems to us that this thy strictness is not after the divine precept of charity that thou wilt not yield to st clara who is so holy and pleasing to god in so little a thing as it is to eat together with thee especially when thou thinkest that she on account of thy preaching has left the kingdom and glory of the world and even if she asked for a greater favor than this is thou shouldst give it for she is thy spiritual plant then st francis replied you think then that i should accede to her his brothers answered yes father we think that thou owest her this favor and comfort then st francis said since it seems so to you it seems so to me but for her greater comfort i will have this meal occur in santa maria degli angeli here as she has been long shut up in san damiano it will please and strengthen her to see santa maria where her hair was cut off and where she was betrothed to jesus christ and there we will eat together in god's name and when the day for the meal came st clara left her convent with a companion and was taken by the brothers to santa maria degli angeli and she made a devout reverence before the altar of the virgin mary where her hair had been cut off and where she had taken the veil and then they took her around to see the convent until the meal should be served and meanwhile st francis had the table laid upon the naked earth as was his custom and when meal-time came st francis and st clara sat down together and one of the brothers with the companion of st clara and next all the other brothers and they humbly took their places at the table and with the first dish st francis began to talk of god so lovingly with such depth so wonderfully that the divine fullness of love descended upon him and all were enraptured in god and while they were thus transported with eyes and hands lifted towards heaven the people in assisi and betona and in the other neighboring towns saw that santa maria degli angeli and the whole convent and woods which then were at the side of the convent seemed to be in a great blaze 
and it looked as if there was a great conflagration both in the church and convent and woods and people from assisi came running down there in haste to put out the fire for they really believed that everything was on fire but when they came to the convent and saw that there was no fire they went in and found st francis and st clare and all the others transported unto god around the poorly furnished table then they understood that there had been a divine fire and no material one when god had let himself be seen there as a token to indicate and reveal the divine fire of love with which the souls of the brothers and sisters were inflamed and they went away with great comfort in their hearts and with great edification if clara thus showed herself before francis as the weak woman who was one that longed for comfort and encouragement she was in her relations to the sisters the strong woman the one who protected and defended the others it was not for nothing that she was of old warrior blood this was seen on the two occasions when san damiano was besieged by frederick the second's soldiers during his war with the pope this ruler had made an incursion into the papal states and had with some degree of cunning used his mussulman archers to whom the papal excommunication was an object of indifference from the elevated mountain fortification nocera only a few miles from assisi these saracens had darted out like wasps down over the valley of spoleto and one fine day they attacked also the convent of san damiano if the mussulman entered the sisters had not only death to fear but also dishonor they gathered trembling around clare who as so often lay sick without losing courage she had herself carried to the locked door so as to be the first who would be exposed to the danger next she had the silver and ivory ciborium brought from the church in which the sacrament of the altar in the form of bread was preserved and sank down in prayer to the saviour it then seemed to her that from the ciborium a voice issued like a child's and this voice said i will always be your guardian strengthened and confident she rose from her prayers and soon after the saracens gave up the attack and went elsewhere in another way clara showed her indomitable spirit when in twelve twenty the news reached italy of the death of the first five franciscan martyrs in morocco clara was so inspired that she wanted also to go to the heathen to suffer martyrdom with her sisters and only an express prohibition of francis prevented her from carrying out this plan perhaps it was in the war she waged with the pope himself that she might remain true to her vow of poverty that she showed herself most inflexible and most heroic over and over again her good friend Eugeline, who in twelve twenty seven became pope with the name gregory the ninth sought with the best intentions to force upon her and her convent some property on which they could live in peace and quiet like other nuns she steadfastly refused and he said that if it was only for the sake of the promise she had made he had power to release her from it holy father was her answer free me from my sins but not from following our lord christ two days before her death she obtained from innocent the fourth the perpetual ratification of the right of her and her sisters to be and to remain poor unlike francis and in spite of the austere life she led clara lived to an old age she died in her sixtieth year after forty-one years of convent life in that time one great sorrow had reached her this was francis's death in twelve twenty six as he lay at the last in the little poor sick cell down back of portiuncula a message came from clara that she wished to see him once more but st francis sent word back and said to one of the brothers go and say to sister clara to give up all trouble now she cannot see me 
but she must know this for certain that before her death both she and the sisters shall see me and take great comfort therefrom and then francis died but the day after his death the citizens of assisi came and took his lifeless body and along with the brothers carried it up to assisi with hymns and songs of praise with the blare of trumpets and with olive branches and lighted candles in their hands and in the early october morning as the violet mists still lay on the plain like a mighty sea they ascended the sunlit heights by san damiano the funeral escort stopped and the bier with the lifeless body was taken into the church so near to the grated window of the sisters that they could see their dead spiritual father for the last time and after the grating through which the maidservants of the lord were wont to receive the sacred host and to hear the word of god was passed by the brothers lifted this holy body up from the bier and held it in their raised arms in front of the window so long a time as my lady clare and the other sisters wished it for their comfort the speculum perfectionis tells us the little church now echoed the notes of sorrow and farewell of grief and woe for who would not be moved to tears says thomas of chaleno when even the angels of peace wept so bitterly years passed and clara still lived francis was gone but his near friends leo angelo brother juniper came frequently to san damiano and together with them clara buried herself in memories of the time when the master still lived also brother giles who otherwise always as bernard of quintavalle tells us sat in his cell like a maiden in her room gave clara now and then a visit and it was during one of these that the following real franciscan trade occurred an english franciscan who was a doctor of theology stood in the pulpit in san damiano and gave a sermon which with all his learning seems to have been very different from the words that used to be heard from this place out of the mouth of francis of assisi all felt it and suddenly brother giles raised his voice and called out be still master and i will preach the english doctor stopped speaking and giles began in the heat of the spirit of god says the old legend then he resigned the pulpit to the former preacher again and the latter continued but clara rejoiced over this she said more than if she had seen the dead brought to life again for this was what our most holy father francis wanted that a doctor of theology should have enough humility to be silent when a lay brother wished to speak in his stead the time came at last when the call of death was heard also by saint clara for all of twenty-eight years she had been more or less a victim of sickness and in the fall of twelve fifty two she felt that her death was near but as yet her life's work was incomplete she had not obtained the final unrestricted ratification of her privilege of poverty exactly at this time innocent the fourth returned from Lyon whither he had fled before the army of frederick the second the excommunicated emperor died in twelve fifty in fiorenzuola and in september twelve fifty two the pope took up his residence in perugia as soon as the papal court came to rest in the umbrian capital the sister's well-wisher and protector cardinal Reynaud, later pope alexander the fourth visited san damiano here he gave clara the sacrament of the altar and she begged him imploringly to obtain the ratification of the privilege from the pope the pope came with his court the next year to assisi he visited clara on her sick-bed and when she as is the custom wanted to kiss his foot he set it on a stool so that she could do what she wished she then prayed for the blessing of the pope and for complete absolution of her sins would to god my daughter that i had as little need of god's forgiveness as you said innocent with a sigh 
after his departure clara said to the sisters who were collected around her praise the lord my daughters this morning i received himself and now i too have been considered worthy to see his vicar on earth after this the sisters never left clara's bedside agnes who for thirty years had been separated from her sister as abbess of monticelli convent near florence knelt weeping by her bed day after day the dying saint lay there for over two weeks she had eaten nothing but still felt strong her confessor exhorted her to be patient since i learned to know the grace of my lord jesus christ from god's servant francis she answered no pain and no penance has been too great for me and no sickness too hard she then sent messengers to her friends in portiuncula to leo angelo and juniper telling them that they could read the story of our lord's passion to her they came and brother leo knelt by the bed and kissed weeping the hard sack of straw brother juniper opened his bundle of news from god angelo comforted the weeping sisters then it was that clara was heard to lift her voice in the tearful silence go forth without fear she said thou hast a good guide for the road go forth without fear for he who created thee has also sanctified thee he has always protected thee he has loved thee tenderly as a mother loves her child o lord i praise thee because thou hast created me clara ceased her prayers and lay quiet a while with open eyes whom art thou talking to at last one of the sisters asked her i am speaking answered clara solemnly with my blessed soul and do you not see she added a moment later do you not see the king of glory whom i now behold with eyes blinded with tears all watched the dying one but clara saw them no longer she constantly watched the chamber door and behold the door open and in white clothes with golden bands around their shining hair a flock of heavenly virgins entered who had come to take clara to the eternal fatherland one of them was taller and more beautiful than the others and her golden hair shone so that the dark cell was made more brilliant than the brightest day and the beautiful shining lady stepped out from the crowd of maidens to the bed of clara bent down over the dying one embraced her and hid her as it were under a veil of light in the arms of mary under the folds of the shining luminous robe of the queen of heaven clara's soul went up to everlasting glory but between the stiffening hands the dead saint held the pope's bull sent two days before the final solemn ratification of the right of clara and of her sisters to live after the franciscan ideal san damiano's convent is still standing almost as clara and her sisters left it here is the little narrow choir where they prayed their office along the walls are seats polished by wear made of old rough woodwork and in the middle of the creaking wooden floor the old desk with the great book of antiphons lying open on it here is shown one of the bells clara used when the sisters were to be called to prayer the tin cup out of which she drank after she had received the sacrament of the altar the breviary brother leo wrote for her and out of which she prayed daily and the copper reliquary given her by innocent the fourth here too we see the refectory where gregory the ninth was her guest and where she by the command of the pope blessed the rolls of bread while on each roll as she blessed it a cross appeared here we see clara's little narrow low bedroom here we visit finally her so-called garden a small strip of flagged ground between two high walls but from this bit of terrace there opens between the two walls as if through the proscenium of a theatre a beautiful view over the lovely umbrian land one sees rivo torto portiuncula 
the white roads the olive-grown fields the little town of betona over in the blue mountains the garden proper consists of only a sort of wide terrace filled with earth in which flowers are growing and as the old tradition goes clara would permit only three kinds of flowers here lilies which are the symbol of purity violets the symbol of humility and roses which signify the love of god to man end of book two chapter five Book Three, Chapter One of Saint Francis of Assisi, A Biography, by Johannes Jornson, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Three, God's Singer, Chapter One, The Sermon to the Birds. It seems almost as if Francis after he had seen the quiet introspective and happy life of st clara and the first of her sisterhood led in san damiano was again inspired with doubts as to his vocation again did the doubt arise within him if it were not better to withdraw altogether from the world and to live alone for his soul's welfare like the old anchorites many of his disciples had chosen this course sylvester rufino and to some extent giles and although francis was well aware of the dangers of the hermit life spiritual arbitrariness and ascetic pride the characteristic description can be read in the fioretti chapter twenty nine yet it seems to him incontrovertible that the wandering life as preacher was preferable to what he called the accumulation of dust on the spiritual feet to understand what francis meant by this we must follow him on his great missionary journey which he undertook in the years twelve eleven to twelve twelve with sylvester he went to tuscany pacified the troubles in perugia was joined in cortona by guido vagnotelli and if wadding can be relied on also by the celebrated and dreaded elias bombaroni established near the city a hermitage named celle and then wandered on to arezzo and florence in the latter city a celebrated jurist joined himself to him ioannis parenti a doctor of the university of bologna and judge in civita castellana wadding following rudolphus gives an anecdote about parenti's entrance into the order when on a walking tour he heard a swineherd driving his grunting hogs into the pen with the words hurry up into the sty pigs as lawyers hurry into hell the old proverb de juris den sin böse christen lawyers are poor christians seems to have been current in the thirteenth century in any case parenti gave up his office and became a franciscan at about the same time as another bolognese lawyer niccolo de pepoli took up with interest the franciscan mission in bologna itself from florence francis went on to pisa where angelus the subsequent general of the order and albert later the leader of the brothers english mission joined him he then returned back to assisi by san gimignano in the valle delsa by chiusi and cortona and after a full year's absence he gave the lenten sermons in the cathedral as already alluded to but this last part of francis's journey was almost a triumphal march as he would approach a city the bells were rung the people went out to meet him with palm boughs in their hands and conducted him in festival progress to the parish priest with whom he always stayed they brought bread for him to bless to be afterwards preserved as a relic and they repeated the cry which the italians are so inclined to utter behold the saint even the disciples found that this was too much sometimes they asked him just as the chief priests and scribes had asked the master 
hearest thou what these say francis used to answer that he regarded the homage paid him as analogous to the honor paid to pictures in churches for the god-fearing man is only an image of god and flesh and blood like wood and stone should not dare to ascribe themselves the honor which belongs to god alone but eventually this was insufficient for him and he sought therefore to abase himself as well as he could do not praise me too soon he liked to say for soon i shall have sons and daughters or he would break out had god shown a street robber the love he has shown me he would be much more thankful he heartily thanked the bishop of terni when he once introduced one of francis's sermons with a little introduction in which he had developed the theme of how wonderful it was to see so insignificant and ungifted a man as francis attain such great results to those who praised his severe way of life he said all that i do a sinner can also do a sinner can fast can pray can shed tears can mortify the flesh only one thing a sinner cannot do be true to his lord and his god for such faithlessness to god francis often upbraided himself and never concealed it once he had been sick and while sick had eaten some chicken scarcely was he well again when he put a string around his neck and had himself led stripped to the village pillory and while thus led made the brother who led him cry out here you see the great glutton who ate chicken without your knowing about it and as the people only broke out into greater praise of his humility he ordered one of the brothers to scold him vigorously so that for once he could hear the truth much against his will the brother upbraided him as a rustic a hireling and a useless servant and with a contented smile francis answered him god bless thee for the word that is what the son of pietro di bernadone ought to hear on other occasions francis sought to escape the homage of the people by withdrawing into solitude thus he passed the whole of lent twelve eleven on an uninhabited island in lake trasimene and he seems to have passed a great part of the following winter in the high-lying hermitage sartiano near chiusi the huts made of branches which he with a few brothers built there resembled mostly the dens of wild beasts but francis liked the place partly for its wildness partly for its loneliness and finally because he could see from it assisi in the distance in this loneliness he was visited by great temptations sometimes to despair an interior voice said to him there is salvation for all except for a self-tormentor like you someone to give up the state of celibacy and marry against this temptation he used an old practice of the anchorites with the rope which he wore as a belt he gave himself a dreadful beating on the bare back but his brother ass as francis used to call his body would give him no peace he found another way outside of his cell the ground was covered with snow and half naked as he was francis sprang out into the snow and began to build seven snow images when the work was done he said to himself see francis here is your wife the big one over there the four at her side are your two sons and two daughters and the other two are your manservant and maid they are dying of cold hurry up and put something on them and if you cannot then be glad that you have no one to serve except god alone in one way or another the idea of withdrawing entirely from the world engaged francis's thoughts he often discussed it with the brothers of the order and weighed the pro and con there was one thing that always prevented him from choosing the hermit life and that was the example of our lord jesus could have chosen to remain in his glory at his father's right hand but instead descended to earth to endure the vicissitudes of human life and to die the bitter death of shame on the cross 
and it was the cross that had from the first been francis's model the cross to which he applied with the rest of the middle ages god's word to moses fox secundum exemplar make it according to the pattern that was shown thee in the mount in his doubt francis resolved to ask a decision from god and to follow it blindly whatever it might be on other occasions he had opened the bible and taken the sense of the text that met his eyes this time he decided to submit himself to the inspiration of two privileged souls brother maceo was therefore sent away first to st clara and then to brother sylvester who lived a hermit life in a cave on monte subasio where now is situated the convent carceri in whose garden the first cells of the franciscans are still shown francis determined to follow the judgment of sylvester and clara but brother sylvester started at once to pray we are told in actus beati francisci and in prayer he at once got the answer from god and he went to brother maceo and said this says the lord you shall tell brother francis that god has not called him for his own sake only but also that he shall win many souls and then brother maceo went to st clara but she answered and said that she and another sister had had the same answer exactly from god as brother sylvester but brother maceo went back to st francis and st francis received him lovingly and prepared for them a meal and when they had eaten francis called him out into the woods and st francis bared his head crossed his arms over his chest knelt down asked and said what does my lord jesus christ tell me to do brother maceo answered that both brother sylvester and sister clara and another had received the answer from jesus christ the glorious that thou shalt go out and preach for god has not called you for your own sake alone but also to save others and then the hand of the lord was lifted over st francis and he sprang up in the glow of the holy ghost and inspired by power from on high he said to brother maceo well let us go and he took brother maceo with him and brother angelo both of whom were holy men and they came between canara and bavagna and st francis saw some trees by the roadside and in these trees there was a multitude of birds of all kinds such as never before were seen in this region and a great quantity were on the ground under the trees and when st francis saw all this multitude the spirit of god came over him and he said to his disciples wait for me here i am going to preach to our sisters the birds and he walked into the field up to the birds who sat upon the earth and as soon as he began to preach all the birds who sat in the trees flew down to him and none of them moved although he went right among them so that his cow touched several of them but saint francis said to the birds my sister birds you owe god much gratitude and ought always and everywhere to praise and exalt him because you can fly so freely wherever you want to and for your double and threefold clothing and for your colored and adorning coats and for the food which you do not have to work for and for the beautiful voices the creator has given you you sow not neither do you reap but god feeds you and gives you rivers and springs to drink from and hills and mountains cliffs and rocks to hide yourselves in and high trees for you to build your nests in and though you can neither spin nor weave he gives you and your young ones the necessary clothing love therefore the creator much since he has given you such great blessings watch therefore well my sister birds that you are not ungrateful but busy yourselves always in praising god but after this our holy father's word all those little birds began to open their beaks to beat with their wings 
and stretch out their necks and bow their heads reverently to the earth and with their song and their movement showed that the word saint francis had said had pleased them greatly but saint francis rejoiced in his spirit as he saw this and wondered over so many birds and over their variety and differences and that they were so tame and he praised the creator for it and gently exhorted them to praise the creator themselves and when saint francis had finished his sermon and his exhortation to praise god he made the sign of the cross over all the birds and all the birds flew up at once and twittered wonderfully and strongly and separated and flew away end of book three chapter one book three chapter two of saint francis of assisi a biography by Johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book three god's singer chapter two missionary journeys it was not now the intention of saint francis to restrict himself to a new mission trip through italy he had greater plans as he went out of assisi this time and in a sense it was his youthful dream of wars that returned to the man of thirty years it was the time of the crusades not many years later john of brienne a brother of francis's old-time hero walter was to go to damietta at the head of a great army of christians francis too would go on a crusade but with no other weapon than the gospel what he had in mind was no less than to preach christianity and conversion to the saracens first he wished to obtain the pope's assent to his new proposal it is said of st dominic that he was always to be found on the road to rome to obtain instructions the same applies to francis two years after he had obtained innocent the third's verbal ratification of the rules of the order we find him again in rome to remind the pope of the promises he had then given he could now well say that god had multiplied his brother's voice and could therefore beg to have a greater mission given him we know little of francis's third journey to rome on the way he visited alviano near todi where he preaching in the marketplace is said to have ordered the swallows swooping about and disturbing him with their cries to be silent perhaps he also went through narni and toscanella in rome francis preached as usual in the streets and alleys with these sermons he won two new brothers zacharias who afterwards became a missionary in spain and william the first englishman who entered the order far more important for the whole future of the order was the friendship francis here contracted with a woman whom he later on account of her manly character called jokingly brother jacoba the wife of the roman nobleman graziano frangipani her name was giacoma or jacopa de setasoli and she was about twenty-five years old the frangipani family is one of the noblest in rome it is said to have sprung from the gens anicia which counts among its members in the course of years a benedict of nursia a paulinus of nola and saint gregory in the year seven seventeen flavius anicius petrus then the head of the family by generous gifts of bread during a great scarcity of food in rome won the name of the breaker of bread in the beginning of the thirteenth century the frangipanis lived in rome with extensive estates in the trans-tiberian region and on the esquiline where they possessed among the rest of their property the castle-like remains of the septizonium of septimus severus a name which in a changed form still lives in the title of the roman street via della sette sale and from which graziano frangipani's wife acquired her name de sette soli giacoma is said to have been of a mixture of norman and sicilian blood 
She was probably born about 1190, for in 1210 she was married and had a son, Giovanni. Afterwards, she had another son, Graziano, in 1217, shortly after her husband's death. Already in the year 1212, she had made the acquaintance of Francis of Assisi, an acquaintance which, on the next visit of the Umbrian evangelist to Rome, was to develop into a true and inward friendship. Francis had certainly little trouble in obtaining Innocent III's blessing on his work. He embarked on the sea. We do not know from which port. Storms drove the ship off her course and she stranded on the coast of Slavonia. There was no way of embarking thence for the Orient. It was late in the year, and the weather was also unfavorable for the sea crossing. Francis tried to get a ship for Ancona, but the seamen were unwilling to load a ship with him and his followers. They then formed the plan of hiding themselves among the ship's cargo without the crew knowing it. They emerged only after the ship was on the open sea, and as the voyage on account of unfavorable weather lasted longer than was expected, and the ship's rations became exhausted, the two hidden passengers obtained permission to share their rations with the crew. Hardly had Francis's feet touched Italian soil when he took up his old way of life and went preaching from city to city. In Ascoli, his preaching had such effect that over thirty men, some priests, some laymen, sought to be received into the brotherhood. Elsewhere, he was surrounded as before by the jubilations and crowds of people. They strove at least to touch the skirt of his garment. Only the Cathari, also diffused through the Ancona region, kept away from him. For the kernel of his preaching, as of all his religious life, was the absolute, unconditional, and in all unessential things, blind obedience to the Roman Church, and the principal sequence thereof, a deep reverence for the priests of the same Church. It was with timely retrospect over this and similar missionary journeys that Francis, in his testament, has written words about the poor minor priests in the parishes about whom he, in spite of all, will fear, love, and honor as his masters, and not look upon their faults. This last was what the Cathari wanted. They expatiated long and loud over the sins of the priests, and thus took many out of that church which the priests represented. Francis was of that rare nature that can discriminate between things and persons and he knew how to inspire the same spirit in his brethren. But how can a priest lie, Brother Giles asked in this spirit, incensed over so unreasonable a supposition? While in Ancona this time, Francis converted a celebrated man of that time, the troubadour Guglielmo de Vini, called by the people the Verse King. De Vini was on a visit to the little village San Severino in Mark Ancona, where he had a relative, a nun. Francis was preaching in the convent at the time, and the celebrated poet heard him there. There was, according to all testimony, something very impressive in Francis's way of speaking. It was not so much a sermon, says Thomas of Spilato, as a concio, a lecture that touched on practical and moral reform. And Francis was an unbending moralist, he was not silent about wrongs that he saw, but gave everything its right name. In spite of his poor external appearance, he inspired thereby not only wonder, but also fright. There was something of John the Baptist about him. In his writings, there is many a woe to the sinner whose wages are eternal fire. He was not afraid to threaten with God's punishment. His words were compared to a sword that pierces through hearts. So Guglielmo de Vini heard the celebrated preacher of repentance in the cloister in San Severino. The poet came from curiosity and a crowd of the gay youth of the village with him. At first Francis did not impress them greatly, but the verse king soon began to listen. 
it seemed to him as if the poor little man from assisi talked to him alone as if all the words he heard were directed to him and one after another like well-aimed arrows sent by a master hand thrust their points into his heart what did francis talk about it was on his usual theme to despise the world and to be converted so as to withstand the coming wrath and when he was through the simple and great thing at once happened and guglielmo de vini rose up fell at the feet of francis and cried out brother take me away from men and give me to god on the next day francis clothed him in the gray clothes of the order and girded his loins with the cord and gave him the name pacificus because he had left the world's tumult for the peace of god thus too a century later another much greater poet was to seek for peace among the children of st francis one evening he already gray and bowed down stood before a lonely cloister in the apennines and knocked at the door and to the porter's question as to what he sought there the great florentine dante gave only the one all-including answer pace peace although francis thus received every one with a troubled heart who came to him and without further novitiate clothed him in the order's garb it was in twelve twenty that a year's trial or novitiate was established he had a wonderful ability at discriminating among the many who began to wish to be received among the brothers a short period had elapsed after pacificus's conversion when a young nobleman from lucca sought francis and with tears cast himself at his feet and asked to be one of his sons francis addressed him with severity your weeping is a lie he said your heart does not belong to god why do you lie to the holy ghost and to me thus it appeared that the longing for the cloister was only a caprice of the young man perhaps conceived in a moment of dissatisfaction with the conditions of home when his parents came to beg him to come back he readily complied especially was francis on his guard with the book-learned viri literati when such a bookman comes to me he said openly i see at once if his intentions are sincere when his first prayer to me is this one behold brother i have lived long in the world and never rightly knew my god give me a place far from the world's alarms where i in the bitterness of heart can think over the years i have lost and squandered to live a better life in the future it was only for the disinherited of this world the poor and oppressed the unfortunate and lost the lepers thieves and robbers that francis's heart was open without reservation it is true that the benedictine rules contained at this time the words all strangers shall be received as if it were christ but francis himself had found by trial in his youth that this command was not always lived up to that it was observed in the case of guests who could claim a position in society but that it was not observed in the case of those who needed it the most the homeless the tramps and the beggars it is certain that with the experiences of his youth at saint maria della rocca in mind francis in his rule at the very beginning wrote the beautiful words and whoever comes to the brethren friend or enemy thief or robber shall be kindly received even his most devoted disciples had trouble sometimes in following him in this matter the speculum perfectionis contains the following impressive tale from the early days of the order in a hermitage over borgo san sepulcro monte casale is meant borgo san sepulcro is a village about halfway between mount alverna and gubbio it happened that robbers who used to keep in the woods and fall upon wayfarers came and asked for bread but some of the brothers said that it was not right to give them alms meanwhile st francis came to this convent and the brothers asked him 
if it were right to give alms to robbers and saint francis answered them thus if you do as i say then have i hope in god that i will save their souls go then and get good bread and good wine take it out to them in the woods and say to them brother robbers come here we are brothers and we come with good wine and good bread to you then they will come at once and i will spread a cloth on the ground and set the table for them and wait on them with humility and cheerfulness while they eat but when they are through i will speak god's word to them and finally i shall beg them to grant you a request in god's name namely that they shall promise you not to kill any one and to do bodily harm to no one if i ask anything of them at once they will answer no but now for the sake of your humility and goodness they will promise you this the next day in requital of their good promises you shall go out to them with bread and wine eggs and fruit and wait upon them while they eat and when they have finished you shall say to them why do you wander about all day and suffer hunger and endure so much and in thought indeed perpetrate so many things and imperil your souls it is much better to serve the lord then he will give you what you need here upon earth and at the same time you will save your souls then the lord will grant them that for the sake of your humility and patience they will be converted but the brothers did all just as saint francis had said and the robbers from thankfulness and with god's mercy held point for point and jot for jot what the brothers had enjoined them yes for the sake of the humility and confidence of the brothers they helped them and carried wood into the hermitage and eventually some of them entered the order but others confessed their sins and did penance for their transgressions and promised the brothers solemnly to live by the work of their hands and never to do such things again as this tale one of the oldest remains we possess lies before us it gives us a full conception both of francis's knowledge of men he knew that it was useless to preach to a hungry man he knew also that rome was not built in a day and of his unpharisaical love of men here is one of the moments in the history of christendom when the words of the gospel are understood exactly as they were said and if you love them that love you what reward shall you have do not even the publicans this but do good without expecting anything from it and your reward shall be great and you shall be the sons of the highest for he is kind to the unthankful and to the evil if francis was thus indulgent to the last degree with great sinners so on the other hand he put good people to a severe test from those to whom much was given he expected much the fioretti have preserved for us many incidents which illustrate this characteristic in him such demeanor in the case of rufino who belonged to one of assisi's best families and whom he ordered to go naked from portiuncula to the city and to preach naked in the cathedral a similar command was that which he gave to brother agnolo near borgo san sepulcro who belonged to that place and who like rufino was of good family he too was to go naked into the town and announce that francis would come next day and preach there but he was called back as he was approaching the city gate and francis promised him paradise for the readiness with which he had humiliated himself little is known with certainty of francis of assisi's journeys during the next few years wadding has with admirable sagacity tried to put into order all the fragmentary pieces which constitute the biographical material for these years so as to form an artificial mosaic but he failed in the attempt and when he for example assumes that francis was sick in assisi in the winter of twelve twelve to twelve thirteen and sent out from his sickbed his letters to all christians 
it confuses the occasion with much later events we can with some certainty believe that francis pursued his journey through italy however this may be we meet him in the beginning of twelve thirteen on a similar mission a journey in the province of romagna in this region not far from the little republic of san marino there was in olden times a nobleman's castle called montefeltro now sasso feltrio near the city of san leo francis and his companion probably leo came to this city on a beautiful may morning just as the banners flying from the towers and the proud blare of the trumpets announced a great festival gaily dressed pages and men-at-arms hastened over the drawbridge knights on powerful chargers brightly caparisoned thronged under the gateway swinging carriages bore ladies young and old with laced bodices and high headdresses up the steep road to the castle everything indicated that a festive tourney was to be held to which all the nobility of the district was invited all the splendor here displayed did not irritate brother francis pious people are addicted to this failing so that francis was wont to warn his disciples against judging and despising those who went in costly clothes and lived in luxury god is also their master said he he can call them when he will and make them just and holy had not this happened to him therefore he stood there a little while and looked at the banner that waved over the gate with the bearings of the barons of montefeltro he then turned with a smile to his companion what do you think should we too go up to the festival perhaps we can win a good night for god's cause it was done as he said the occasion of the festival was the knighting of a young soldier all attended mass during which the young man took the pledges of knighthood and then francis ascended some steps in the castle garden and began to speak as his text he had chosen some words in the dialect of the people a simple doggerel such as children use the two following lines tanto e it bene ci caspetto ciogni pena me diletto i hope that i so blessed will be that every suffering pleases me one can easily imagine that francis grown up as he was in the atmosphere of the romances of king arthur and the knights of the round table developed this text somewhat in the following manner the knight he began who wants to win a lovely dame must be ready to undergo great and many sufferings she may require of him that he shall go on a crusade against the sultan perhaps that he shall bring her a horn of the unicorn or an egg of the bird called the rock perhaps that he shall set free a captive maiden or ride a fully equipped charger over a bridge which is so small that one can hardly walk across it while under it pours a wild torrent and all these dangers and sufferings the true and noble knight is ready to undergo only because his dear lady wishes it and through all his tribulations he thinks only of her white hand that she will give him to kiss when he goes back with deeds well done and immediately his despondency and gloom are over but now there is another and far nobler knighthood to which all men are called and not only those of noble birth there is another battle not to win the favor of an earthly beauty but to do the will of the eternal and highest beauty who is god for is not god far more beautiful than all the beautiful ladies for they are all the work of his hands made out of the dust of the earth is not he who made so much that is beautiful is not he still more beautiful than all his creatures yet he is that and therefore he also deserves that you go out as knight-errants for him and fight valorously for his honor against the enemies who are the world the flesh and the devil and what will he not give us if we have been faithful to him like a knight to his lady-love and do not permit ourselves to be cast down in his service by any obstacle or suffering 
he gives us infinitely more than even the most beautiful dame can give she has only herself her hand and her heart but the hand shall wither and the heart shall fail some time but when god gives himself as the prize for the victory as the shining prize for the winner of the joust then he gives us life light and happiness in imperishable immortal eternity it was about in this way that brother francis spoke and his words may well have moved many a young and noble heart but one among them and this was duke orlando de catani of the castle of chiusi in casentino approached francis and said father i want to talk to you about the salvation of my soul but francis who gave god's spirit time to work upon souls had no haste but answered go first and hold festivities with your friends wherever you may be invited after that we will talk in peace and quiet when the tourney was over the young duke again visited francis and they talked together but at the end of the conversation the duke orlando said i own a mountain in tuscany which is called laverna a very lonely mountain well adapted to meditation if you would wish to build there you and your brothers then for my soul's sake will i give it to you but saint francis thus it is told us in the actus beati francisci greatly wished to find lonely places where it was good to pray therefore he thanked first of all god who with his faithful took care of his lambs and thereafter he thanked lord orlando and said lord duke when you go back to your home i will send two of my brothers to you and you can show them this mountain and if it seems suited to prayer and meditation then i will be very grateful to you for your friendly offer for the present francis himself did not go to inspect the duke orlando's gift for again did the crown of martyrdom beckon to him from afar he had not succeeded in going to the holy land now he thought of bringing the gospel to the mussulman on the further side of the mediterranean sea in morocco sultan mohammed ben nasser the mir molan as the christians by an anagram on the title emir el mumanin the ruler of the faithful were wont to call him had been beaten by the spaniards at tolosa and was forced to retreat to africa here francis determined to visit him and started on the journey probably in the winter of twelve thirteen to twelve fourteen he travelled across spain but fell sick as he reached the end of his journey and again had to return home with his object unattained on reaching portiuncula he took several new brothers into the order among them thomas of chelano the year after this fruitless mission to the heathen francis seems to have been present at the fourth lateran council he obtained in all probability on this occasion innocent the third's ratification of clara's and her sister's privilege of poverty it was about the same time that the french prelate jacques de vitry passed through italy on his way to the holy land and then made the acquaintance of the first friars minor in a letter sent from genoa in october twelve sixteen to his friends at home the french canon thus expresses himself in the time that i spent at the curia the papal court in perugia i saw much that i was entirely dissatisfied with all was so taken up with worldly and temporary affairs of politics and law that it was hardly possible to get in a word of spiritual affairs there was one thing however which comforted me in these surroundings many men and women among them many rich and worldly have for christ's sake forsaken everything and fled from the world they are called friars minor and stand in high repute both with the pope and cardinals but they take no heed of temporal things but work day in and day out with zeal and diligence 
to draw souls away from the vanities of the world so that they will not fall to the ground and to take them along with themselves and with the favor of god they have already reaped a rich harvest but they live after the example of the primitive man of whom it is written the multitude of the faithful were of one heart and one mind by day they labor and go into the cities and highways to capture souls but at night they turn back to waste places and lonely regions where they give themselves up to prayer the women abide together in various retreats in the vicinity of the cities they receive nothing but live from the work of their hands but the men of this order come together once a year with great provision to a predetermined place to hold a feast together and to rejoice in the lord and with the support of good men they ordain and announce their laws which the pope ratifies after this they disperse and for the entire year are in lombardy and tuscany and apulia and sicily but a holy and god-fearing man nicholas the pope's secretary recently forsook the curia and went to them but was called back because the pope could not do without him in the summer of twelve sixteen the papal court was stationed in perugia and as can be seen from the last lines of jacques de vitry's sketch the movement started by francis began to spread up to the highest hierarchy the bishop nicholas here spoke of was bishop of tusculum later cardinal nicholas chiaramonti of whom we know that he was very friendly to the franciscans and liked to have one of them with him perhaps it was at the same time that another cardinal paid his first visit to the friars minor this was cardinal ugolin of ostia and afterwards a friend and tireless protector of the order he came to portiuncula as we are told in the speculum perfectionis where the brothers were holding a conference with a large band of followers both clerks and soldiers but when he saw how poorly the brothers lived and that they slept upon straw and ate from the bare earth he was so overcome that he broke into tears and cried out how will it go with us who live so luxuriously day after day in superfluity and delights it is certain that the time was approaching for a nearer relation between francis and the papal court to be established the road from perugia where the curia as already said was held for the greater part of the summer of twelve sixteen to portiuncula is not long and there seems to have been reciprocal visits it was in this summer that the majority of his biographers are unanimous in placing one of the most contested affairs in the life of francis of assisi in the first days of the pontificate of honorius the third god's poor little man from assisi knelt before christ's vicar and begged for the celebrated portiuncula indulgence End of Book 3, Chapter 2book three chapter three of st francis of assisi a biography by johannes jorensen translated by thomas o'connor sloan this librivox recording is in the public domain book three god's singer chapter three the portiuncula indulgence it is first of all necessary to observe that the church of rome previous to the establishment of the portiuncula indulgence had only one plenary indulgence the one granted to those who took up the cross and joined the ranks of the crusaders every one who did this and fulfilled the requirements of confessing his sins and obtained absolution from a priest obtained complete remission of the church's penances as well as of the punishment of purgatory so that his soul could appear before god directly after death this indulgence of the crusade indulgentia de terra sancta was later extended so as to apply to any one who for one reason or another 
did not personally join the ranks of the crusaders but with money or with armed men sustained the holy war it was also the franciscans something which in this connection is of the greatest importance who obtained from the pope the right of distributing this indulgence extended as above stated whenever the church decreed an indulgence in other cases as on the consecration of a church it was done in a distinctively different form the lateran council of twelve fifteen had imposed further restrictions on this custom on the consecration of a church the council decreed an indulgence of only one year canonical penance should be granted and on the recurring anniversaries of the consecration only one of forty days at the consecration of the church of st francis in assisi there was granted as something quite extraordinary an indulgence of three years to all who had come over the sea to take part in the festival and of two years to those who had crossed the alps while the ordinary pilgrim had to be content with the usual indulgence of one year what is it then that francis in contrast to this tried to get from the pope or better did obtain from him if we give credence to the authorities he presented himself one fine day accompanied by brother maceo of marignano before honorius the second and begged for the portiuncula church the same indulgence granted to the crusaders in the holy lands i desire he is said to have announced to the pope that every one who with penitence for his sins comes into this church and confesses his sins and is absolved by the priest shall be free from all guilt and punishment for the sins of his life from the day of his baptism to the day when he entered the said church it was in vain that the pope urged that the roman curia was not accustomed to grant such indulgences to any church it was vain that he offered to francis one of the ordinary indulgences francis could not be moved as he declared that the lord himself had sent him in order to obtain this indulgence then the pope suddenly as if by the divine guidance yielded the point and now it remained to the cardinals as honorius depicted the injury it might do to the indulgence of the crusade to restrict the new indulgence it was to be valid for only one day in each year from the vespers of the evening before through the full twenty-four hours following until sunset francis departed contented and when the pope asked him if he did not want a written authorization he said it was superfluous for god will know how to bring his own work into the light with this relation for a foundation a group of legends has been built up to which belong the rose legend depicted by overbeck on the facade of the portiuncula chapel these adornments of the recital first appear in works of the fourteenth century what is given above can be referred to earlier sources at the first glance this narration seems very probable in itself every biographer of francis tells us how he loved his dear portiuncula and we also know how zealous he was for the conversion of sinners he once saw in a vision how men from all places near and far came in streams around the little portiuncula and one of his disciples had a similar vision again the dislike of documents is a characteristic of francis in twelve ten he was satisfied with the verbal ratification of innocent the third and at the lateran council he got nothing more when orlando de catani gave him laverna this too was done without any writing as it is explicitly stated in the letter of gifts of the young count catani in 1274 in his testament francis forbids most definitely his brothers to seek written privileges from the curia whether for a church or for any other place it is perfectly clear that such an answer as francis gave to honorius according to the old story is quite in the spirit of st francis it is quite another question if francis really gave this answer in other words 
if such an interview ever took place first and foremost we must here remark that none of the undoubtedly authentic authorities of the thirteenth century contain a single reference to the portiuncula indulgence thomas of chalino knows the indulgence which gregory the ninth granted to the church of st francis in assisi but neither he nor the old biographers of st francis have the least inkling of the existence of the portiuncula indulgence it is only much more recent authorities who assert that this indulgence could be gained every year since twelve sixteen on days appointed by honorius the third namely from the evening of august the first to the evening of the second this remarkable silence of the official biographers may be regarded as the sequence of the non-existing papal bull or as a result of the opposition of elias of cortona and of his party to the portiuncula men the strict division of the order the biographers in question had to serve the party in power if this was the correct conclusion on the other hand we should expect to find the portiuncula indulgence in the place of honor in the legend originating in the ranks of the strict division as in the speculum perfectionis or in the fioretti but it is in vain that one looks even here for a trace of the legend given above the tradition of the indulgence naturally can be referred if not in the direct then in the secondary line to brother leo and the other intimate friends of st francis and in the first rank stands the testimony taken in the presence of numerous witnesses on october thirty first twelve seventy seven and signed by a notary public in arezzo as given by two franciscans brother benedict of arezzo who formerly was with st francis when he still lived and brother rayner of arezzo who declared himself a confidential friend of brother maceo from marignano in this document the two franciscans testify that they had heard from brother maceo who was the truth itself how he and francis went together to perugia and obtained from pope honorius the above described indulgence although the pope said that the apostolic throne was not one to give such an indulgence the recital is very short and the document is provided with a date which is quite complete and in all particulars correct the original is no longer in existence sabatier maintains that one of the copies now in assisi dates from the end of the thirteenth century various other recitals of the same period rest upon the testimony of brother maceo through the intermediary of brother benedict of arezzo sabatier has inserted them in his edition of francesco bartoli's book on the portiuncula indulgence of about fourteen thirty five but if they originate with brother john of laverna or with brother otto of aquasparta they contain nothing new it is only a new appearance of the original source maceo benedict which we find in various places that an old man pietro zalfani in his youth claims to have been present at the consecration of the portiuncula church and that he says that he there saw francis standing with a paper in his hand amounts to but little another group of witnesses of about the same time depends upon brother leo instead of brother maceo a nobleman of perugia jacopo copoli who on february fourteenth twelve seventy six gave the perugian franciscans the hill on which their old convent monte ripido stands testifies at about this same time and in a similar form to that of brother benedict of arezzo that he had heard brother leo tell about the portiuncula indulgence in the narration of copoli the pope offers to francis an indulgence of seven years without satisfying him he then offered the indulgence de terra sancta but the cardinals caused him to limit it after francis had told this to brother leo he told him to say nothing of the indulgence for the present for this indulgence shall remain hidden for a while the lord will in good time bring it out and reveal it 
wadding places and certainly correctly this testimony in the year twelve seventy seven this was two generations after the granting of the indulgence it is clear that within the order or rather within its stricter party to which benedict of arezzo belonged the effort was made first as strongly as possible to prove the existence of the portiuncula indulgence and secondly to explain why the indulgence was not announced sooner for this reason brother benedict had his testimony affirmed by a notary and jacob copoli's testimony was given in the presence of numerous witnesses before the provincial minister for umbria brother angelo 1270 to 1280 it was also about this time or a little earlier that brother francis of fabriano obtained himself the portiuncula indulgence and he tells also that he received from brother leo the tale of how francis obtained it from the pope it is definitely certain that francis of fabriano wrote the work to which we refer in his later years for he quotes a document which at the earliest may be of thirteen ten brother francis who was born in twelve fifty one and died in thirteen twenty two was sixty or seventy years old when he put down his reminiscences there is no reason to doubt that francis of fabriano was in portiuncula in the year referred to we cannot set aside the explanation that in his advanced age he may have had the indulgence as the object of his pilgrimage from the beginning many franciscans made the pilgrimage to the grave of their spiritual father and to portiuncula and in this connection it is of the greatest significance that pope nicholas the fourth himself a franciscan speaks in a letter of may fourteenth twelve eighty four of the numerous crowd of brothers who streamed to assisi but never names the portiuncula indulgence as the reason of their going according to this pope the church of san francesco containing the saint's tomb as well as the portiuncula chapel were the objects of pilgrimage and not the indulgence all being done to honor the saint this accords with the fact that angela of foligno twelve forty eight to thirteen o nine soon after she entered the third order of st francis made a pilgrimage to assisi but on this occasion never speaks of portiuncula but tells of two visits to the memorial church of san francesco and she is known to have been of the strict observance the great chief of this party hubert of casale visited her shortly before her death and speaks of her in the prologue to his arbor vitae with the greatest reverence naturally angela's visit to assisi may have fallen in a time of the year when the indulgence was not to be obtained she may have not been there on the first or second day of august still it is strange that she never says a word about portiuncula everything indicates that the portiuncula indulgence first began to be known only in the last quarter in the last third if we accept francis of fabriano's words of the thirteenth century if it were allowable to apply modern conceptions to the ways of those days we might be tempted to place the origin of the indulgence at the fifty-year jubilee of the granting of the indulgence twelve twelve to twelve sixty four francis of fabriano's visit was made in twelve sixty eight it is certain that as soon as the indulgence became known it awakened opposition hence the notarial declarations of benedict of arezzo rainier copoli zolfani even the great leaders of the strict franciscan observance peter john olivi twelve forty eight to twelve ninety eight took up the question of the indulgence in a small unfortunately undated pamphlet he strives to uphold its authenticity first on dogmatic and then on historic grounds unfortunately the historic portion is lost it is not to be wondered at that in this dispute several catholic investigators doubted or even denied the origin of the indulgence to have been with st francis so inadequately is it proved even the author of this book was once of the same opinion 
and so expressed himself in the first edition of the same according to my views at that time the portiuncula indulgence was only a localized indulgence de terra sancta or crusader's indulgence thus when the holy land was lost st jean d'acre fell twelve ninety one being the last stronghold of the christians the indulgence of the crusade which the pope had permitted the franciscans to share could only be obtained in portiuncula it was natural that the second of august should be chosen as the day for granting the indulgence as this was the anniversary of the consecration of the church such a choice was not unfranciscan on august the first is celebrated the festival of st peter's chains francis of assisi's reverence for the saint was well known and in the mass of this day in the collect is this passage o god who didst let the blessed peter the apostle depart free and uninjured from his bonds we beg thee to free us from the bonds of our sins in the little portiuncula chapel the new terra sancta the franciscans by virtue of the authorization already obtained shared on these days the same plenary indulgence which formerly belonged to the crusaders and led penitent pilgrims out of the valley of sin and punishment into the holy land of innocence in the four years which have passed since this chapter in my book was written a most meritorious investigator of franciscan history rev herbert holzefell in munich has developed new viewpoints for the consideration of this question father holzefell agrees that in the lifetime of st francis the indulgence in question was little known and little used it must impress us he writes that all later authorities only mention the fact that the indulgence was secured by st francis but never say that it was much frequented either in the lifetime of the saint nor during the first decade following his death some causes must then have been operative which in the beginning at least hindered the dissemination of the indulgence in seeking these causes we are driven into the region of conjecture i may be permitted to suggest the following solution for discussion the pope conceded the indulgence only after long persuasion as we learn from later authorities the cardinals were decided enemies of the proposition as were the bishops of the vicinity that is in assisi foligno perugia gubbio etc these bishops says father holzefell did not wish such an extraordinary demonstration of favor for the insignificant portiuncula chapel and expressed themselves to st francis on the subject in various ways and the more as they doubtless knew the feeling of the curia it would be in exact accord with the spirit of st francis that he would remain silent from his reverence for the priesthood his was no combative nature and here as in other instances yielded that he did it willingly we do not assert it may have hurt him like many another thing that he had to yield to and could not change he will have spoken also of the disappointment with his trusted companions he will have comforted himself with the prospects of a better future and have exhorted them for the present to practice patient submission this does not exclude the possibility that the few friars sharing his knowledge or similar people in the world may have used the indulgence as granted only we must not think of a wide dissemination of it the circle of those knowing of it would grow with time and consequently the frequentation of the indulgence but also the opposition of its enemies then the friars who were still living felt it their duty to leave authentic proof of what they knew so well they need fear no longer the enmity of the curia which was very friendly to the order nor the enmity of the bishops at least not of the directly interested bishops of assisi who for some time had been franciscans this hypothesis explains the silence of the biographers if moreover the speculum perfectionis which was written in the year thirteen eighteen when the indulgence was perfectly known on all sides 
never mentions it why should the silence of the early biographers prove anything against the existence of the indulgence at the period when they wrote as in so many other questions of franciscan investigation we here have to refer to approved authorities of the olden times end of book three chapter three Book Three, Chapter Four of Saint Francis of Assisi, a Biography, by Johannes Jornson, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Three, God's Singer, Chapter Four, Chapters and Provinces. The community of brothers which Francis of Assisi had founded was from the very first an order of penitents and apostles and francis himself was the superior of the order he it was who had written the rules of the order and had promised obedience to the pope he it was to whom the permission to preach was given and through whom the others participated therein it is certain that the first six brothers had the same right as francis to receive new members into the order but the new members were taken to portiuncula there to receive the robe of penitence from francis himself this reception into the brotherhood was regarded as equivalent in weight to the old-time conversio of the orders of monkhood by it one left the world with its pomp and glory as a sign of this the supplicant gave his possessions to the poor again from the very first francis had liked to have his brothers about him as much as possible when the first disciples were sent out on their mission journeys he had accordingly arranged the time statuto termino when they should all again meet at portiuncula later there were arranged once for all two such terms in the year when all the brothers should meet at portiuncula at pentecost and on the feast of st michael september twenty ninth of these two meetings or as they were called using an expression from the older days of convent life chapters pentecost chapter was the most important then all the brothers came together and discussed how best they should maintain the rule they held a feast in frugality and joy after which francis preached his admonitiones or admonitions which will be spoken of later evidently originated at these chapter meetings they explained perhaps a text from the sermon on the mount or sentences such as for he that will save his life shall lose it i am not here to be served but to serve he who doth not renounce all that he possesseth cannot be my disciple most often the most willingly he spoke on his favorite theme reverence for the sacrament of the altar and the reverence for priests which flows from it sometimes he would have the brothers kiss the head of the horse a priest rode on and always have peace in your hearts you who come to bring others peace if therefore any disciple felt disturbed by temptations he went to the master and took him into his confidence and none went away uncomforted to the last francis undertook the choosing of preachers whom he afterwards sent to the various mission districts or provinces as the expression became later in this choosing he was led only by considerations of the fitness of the one recommended and sent out lay brothers as willingly as priests with all his overflowing fatherly heart he finally blessed them all and two by two they went off gladly into the world like strangers and like pilgrims without other burden than the books they needed to say their office out of francis's always strongly personal preaching at these meetings often approached the poetical this passage from one of his admonitions unmistakably recalling the church monday thursday hymn ubi caritas et amor deus ibi est 
may in this connection be cited here where charity is and wisdom is is neither fear nor ignorance where patience is and humility is is neither unquiet nor anger where poverty is and joy is is neither cupidity nor covetousness where the fear of the lord stands at the door the evil enemy cannot enter where compassion is and prudence is is neither waste nor hardness of heart like all model christians francis turned with special devotion to the blessed virgin and mother of god mary and troubadour as he was he sang one of his most beautiful lauds in praise of all the virtues with which the blessed virgin was adored and which should be the ornaments of all holy souls hail queen wisdom he cries the lord save thee with thy sister holy pure simplicity lady holy poverty the lord save thee with thy sister holy humility the lord save thee with thy sister holy obedience all you most holy virtues may the lord from whom you proceed and come save you holy wisdom confounds satan and all his wickednesses pure holy simplicity confounds all the wisdom of this world and the wisdom of the flesh holy poverty confounds all cupidity and avarice and the cares of this world holy humility confounds pride and all men of this world and all things which are in the world holy charity confounds all diabolical and carnal temptations and all carnal fears holy obedience confounds all corporal and carnal wishes and keeps the body mortified to the obedience of the spirit and to the obedience of its brother and makes man subject to all men of this world and not only to men but even to all animals and beasts from this praise of all virtues which inevitably reminds one of giotto's exaltation of the holy obedience the holy chastity and the holy poverty in the frescoes over the grave of st francis in assisi the poet takes his flight up to the throne of the purest virgin hail holy lady most holy queen mary mother of god who art a virgin for ever chosen from heaven by the most holy father whom he consecrated with the most holy beloved son and the paraclete spirit in whom was and is all plenitude of grace and all good hail his palace hail his tabernacle hail his house hail his vesture hail his handmaid hail his mother and all you holy virtues which by grace and illumination of the holy ghost you may pour into the hearts of the faithful and may you make out of the faithless ones men faithful to god after having ended such a song of praise to mary taken as the christian ideal it may have been that francis cried out we friars minor what are we other than god's singers and players who seek to draw hearts upward and to fill them with spiritual joy to play good people into heaven to sing before every one's door about the beauty and delight of serving the lord this francis had tried personally in assisi and he assigned the same troubadour's ways to his brothers do you not know dearest brother he asked brother giles that holy contrition and holy humility and holy charity and holy joy make the soul good and happy there were many who in st francis of assisi's time did not know this and therefore god's singers joculatores dei went out into the world to sing this into the hearts of men from the beginning the chapter meetings were thus practically gatherings for mutual edification the order had no other organization and what was there to organize they carry neither purse nor bag with them on their way neither bread nor money in their belt not shoes on their feet they have no churches no convents no fields nor vineyards nor animals nor houses nor property 
nor where they can harbor their heads they use neither fur nor linen but only woolen habits with hoods neither cap nor cape nor overgarment nor any other raiment if any one asks them to a meal they eat and drink what is set before them if anything is given them for pity nothing is kept for the next day and not only by their words but by their holy life and perfect way of life they draw many of all classes to despise the world to leave house and home and great possessions and put on the habit of the friar's minor which is a plain tunic and a rope around the waist for men who lived thus many laws and regulations were not necessary do the larks need more than a drink of water out of the spring and the food they can gather in the fields to again fly up into the sky and sing the praise of god so exultingly that all must stop and look upwards therefore brother francis loved also above all birds the bird which in everyday language is called the crested lark and he said of it sister lark has a hood like us and is an humble bird for it goes willingly along the wayside and finds a grain of corn for itself its plumage is of the same color as the earth and is an example to us that we shall not have fine and colored clothes but simple and plain but when they fly upwards they praise god so devoutly like good brothers of our order whose life is in the heavens and whose pleasure is always in glorifying god this happy unconfined bird life could not be forever more and more joined the brotherhood and not only young men came to them but women too married and unmarried even married men came it was possible to help the young unmarried woman they were told to enter a convent and one of the brothers undertook temporarily to guide them and help them but old married men came and said we have wives from whom we cannot separate teach us how to live and they too must be looked after but in what way the movement francis had awakened bid fair to mount over his head he did not like his brothers to have the superintendence of nuns i am afraid the devil will give us sisters around our necks in place of the wives we have given up for the sake of god he may have said and in canara he himself had to restrain his hearer's zeal all wished to follow him men and women married and unmarried the whole population of the village be not too hasty he advised them i will think over what i can advise you for your salvation the progress of the order brought great difficulties with it francis on the one hand could only rejoice at the numbers of his army but on the other hand he had no place to harbor them in his net like that of the apostles was ready to tear under the too rich draught of fishes the rules of the order he in his time with few and simple words had written would answer for wandering evangelists and musicians but would not suffice for nuns and still less for married people a flock of larks francis would willingly undertake to guide or to lead the wild birds always gladly obeyed him but men in the ranks of citizens and maidens longing for the convent life tame useful beings and mystic doves that cooed in the mountain clefts of tabor or of carmel how should he simplex et idiota the simple and foolish give them rules of life or laws involuntarily francis looked for a helping hand it was nearer to him than he thought it was stretched out white well kept and strong adorned with the bishop's amethyst ring stretched out to his help by the nephew of innocent the third the bishop of ostia and velatri cardinal ugolin end of book three chapter four book three chapter five of 
St. Francis of Assisi, a biography, by Johannes Jorgensen, translated by Thomas O'Connor Sloan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book 3, God's Singer, Chapter 5, Cardinal Ugolin. Hugo, or Ugolin, Count of Anagni, was, when Francis first knew him, a man of nearly seventy years and of awe-inspiring and engaging appearance he possessed all the highest polish of the day had studied in bologna and paris and was also characterized by an upright piety his two principal interests were the freedom of the church and the promotion of the cloister life in eleven eighty eight he had with danger of his life defended the cause of the church against the usurper markwald and he stood in close and permanent relations with the camaldolites the monks of cluny the congregation of st Flor, for whom he built two new convents and also later with the franciscans and the dominicans in his native land anagni he founded a poorhouse with church annexed thereto and in october twelve sixteen gave it over to the hospital brothers from alto Paschio in tuscany in eleven ninety eight he was papal chaplain as well as cardinal deacon with the titular church of st eustatio in may twelve o six he was nominated to the bishopric of ostia and Velletri, the highest position in the church next to the pope it was not necessary to possess the power of a seer to see in him the coming pope as it is said francis did also as gregory the ninth ugolin continued to be a true friend and benefactor of the religious orders among other things he founded with his own means a franciscan convent in viterbo and a convent for the poor clares in rome san cosmiato in lombardy too and in tuscany several convents owe their existence to him to this man it fell as his biographer puts it to find the order of the friars minor in insecurity and formless and to give it form as already told the first acquaintance between francis and ugolin dates from the summer of twelve sixteen when the papal court was established in perugia no closer relations were for the present established next year on may the fourteenth twelve seventeen francis held his usual pentecost chapter at portiuncula he had made his appearance only with grave apprehensions on his way thither he had opened his heart to a friend when i now come to the chapter said he the brothers ask me to preach as usual and accordingly i do so but what if all the brothers when i am ready to begin start to cry out against me we do not want thee to rule over us any longer for thou art not eloquent as would become thee and as thou oughtest to be and thou art too small and simple and we are ashamed to have so simple and poor looking a superior over us and therefore thou shalt no longer be called our supreme head and then they will cast me out with great scorn anxious before the many accomplished book-learned people who now had come into the brotherhood francis began to preach in his usual simple way and a wonder happened no one called out against him on the contrary all the brothers were greatly edified and filled with peace and francis took courage and came out with his great plan that now when the brothers were so many they ought to go out on missions not only in italy but also to countries on the other side of the mountains to germany to hungary to france and spain yes even to the holy land this proposal was received with favor and they started to divide not only italy but also the rest of the world into mission districts provinces the holy land was a province in itself and over it a man was placed for whom francis had a great liking elias bombaroni for himself he chose to go to france because there more than in all other catholic countries 
they have the devotion to our lord's body on leaving he held one of his usual sermons of admonition in which he counseled the brothers to go about in much silence and inward prayer just as if you were in a hermitage or a cell for wherever we go or stay we have with us a cell brother body is our cell and the soul sits in it like a hermit and thinks of god and prays to him in the fioretti this journey of francis to france is described with many additions what is absolutely definite is that francis in the latter half of may twelve seventeen came to florence and there sought cardinal ugolin thomas of chelano is undoubtedly right when he says that the acquaintance between francis and ugolin was as yet not intimate they had each heard the other praised for goodness and piety and were thus prepared in advance to enter into closer friendship ugolin was sent by honorius the third as papal legate to tuscany with the double task of establishing peace between the perpetually contending republics and to preach a crusade as soon as francis on his arrival at florence found out that the cardinal was there he sought him out simply on the principle he followed of always seeking quarters with the clergy rather than with lay people the cardinal received him with great cordiality and a conversation began in which francis lightened his burdened heart as he had done in former days to bishop guido in assisi the end was that francis cast himself at the feet of the reverend prelate and conjured him to take up his and his brother's affairs this ugolin promised with pleasure and francis from now on looked on him as his spiritual father to whom he showed filial reverence and obedience the first effect of this new relation was that francis abandoned his journey to france brother francis said ugolin i do not want you to go over the alps for there are many prelates in the curia at rome who do not feel well disposed towards you but i and the other cardinals who feel well towards you can help and protect you better if you do not go too far away in vain did francis plead that he could not send his brothers on missionary journeys to far and dangerous lands while he stayed home and saved his own skin the cardinal was immovable and francis had instead of going himself to france to send there the verse king brother pacificus along with many other brothers what now first of all attracted ugolin and his organizing spirit at work was the movement which the preaching of the friars minor started in the world of women francis had taken care of clara and her sisters by procuring for them the convent of san damiano he had promised to look after them both in the spiritual and temporal sense as long as he lived but this promise could not be extended to include all those who now came and asked for the brothers to guide them to salvation the form of vivendi or rule of life which francis had given clara and her sisters simply told them to live after the gospel that is to say in poverty labor and prayer after having distributed their possessions to the poor the sisters in san damiano could not again accept any property either themselves or by an intermediary the only exception was the convent itself with so much land around it as was required for its isolation but this land was not to be cultivated except as a garden for the needs of the sisters this privilege of poverty was what claire apparently by francis's intervention in twelve fifteen had had ratified by innocent the third this was all the rule there was for claire and her sisters and this rule applied this we must note well only to san damiano for the simple reason that francis had never thought of the possibility of more convents of the same kind now when there was talk of how to dispose of the many young women who gathered together in all the towns and wished to live a religious life 
Eugeline was entirely free. In the course of the years 1217 through 1219, we find him therefore busy in establishing the order, which has since come to be called the Clares, but which in the documents of the time is called by the most varying names. Of the highest importance to the understanding of the evolution of the order of the Clares is a letter of August 27, 1218, from Honorius III to Ugolin. It is an answer to a letter from the Cardinal in which he had informed the Pope that several maidens and other women wished to flee from the pomps and vanities of the world and to prepare for themselves abiding places where they could live without owning anything, with the exception of these houses and the chapel or church appertaining thereto. Several pieces of land had been offered to Ugolin for this object, and now he asked for full authority to accept these pieces of land in the name of the Church of Rome, so that the convents built thereon would be out of the jurisdiction of the local bishop and directly subject to Rome. Honorius granted this authority in his answer. No other churchly or temporal authority should have anything to say about these convents, and this position of exemption should continue as long as the sisters affected by it should abide by their vow of poverty. Even before Ugolin had received this letter, Bishop John of Perugia, July 31, 1218, had given his permission for the erection of a convent for nuns of the above description upon Monteluce by Perugia. In exchange for his renunciation of his jurisdiction over the convent, he exacted only a tribute of a pound of wax to be given every 15th of August. At about the same time, Ugolin took steps for the establishment of three exactly similar convents, one in Siena, outside of Porta Camolia, one in Luca, St. Maria in Gattajola, and finally one in Monticelli, near Florence. At first, the only requirement for the religious life in these convents was poverty. It was the Franciscan preaching and the Franciscan life which had drawn these women out of the world and into the convent. When the problem was to establish a proper rule for the order for these new convents, the obvious thing for Ugolin to do was to consult the Lateran Council of 1215 and its interdiction of new orders. This great assemblage of the Church, taking into consideration the so frequently proposed new orders and the resulting confusion, determined that for the future no new rules of an order should be approved by the Church, but that those who wished to found a new convent or establish a new order should be instructed to accept one of the old and tested rules. One of the first to whom this regulation applied was St. Dominic. According to John of Saxony, the Dominicans, as well as the Friars Minor, were definitely accepted by the Lateran Council, but neither of them obtained papal sanction of their rule. Dominic was even told to go home again and talk over with his brothers as to which of the rules already in existence they would decide to choose. They chose the premonstratensian rule, and Honorius ratified this choice when he explicitly defined the Dominicans as a canonical order after the rule of St. Augustine. Exactly in the same way, Ugolin had proceeded in the case of the nuns of St. Clair. As Dominic chose the premonstratensian rule, for himself and his associates, Cardinal Ugolin now chose for the Franciscan sisters the oldest and most respected of all the rules of orders of the West, the rule of the Benedictines. What Francis expressly stood by as an inevitable basic principle that the evangelical poverty must not be impaired, Ugolin adhered to accurately not once could the sisters acquire ownership of the ground on which the convents were built they belonged to ugolin in the name of the church in exactly the same spirit francis had not wished to own portiuncula 
but continued to regard the land as belonging to the benedictines and to pay them a yearly rent for it the outlines of the rule of life of the clares was in accordance with that of st benedict they were not bound literally to this rule as innocent the fourth expressly declared at a later period they were only in general obliged to lead a life based on obedience poverty and chastity to this were added many rigid rules of cloister the cloister could be entered by no stranger and the active care of the sick which according to jacques de vitry the sisters were to have practised must now in every case cease it is certainly francis who wished the rigid cloistering for preventing the meeting of his brothers and the nuns ugolin is said nevertheless to have wept from sympathy when he with francis wrote down this requirement after francis's death he modified several of the most rigid of the observances after twelve nineteen the clares lived after the rule of st benedict but with the addition of the so-called observances of st damian in these last it is permitted to see with some degree of confidence the form of vivendi which francis in his time had given clara and which now was put into the second position but was by no means inoperative the core of these observances observantiae was presumably the privilegium of poverty which clara after the custom of the time tried to have confirmed on the accession of each new pope as long as francis lived there was no complete new rule given to the sisters in san damiano or to the community of poor clares in general it was only after the death of francis that gregory the ninth tried to introduce modifications first of all in the regulation of poverty on account of the unfavorable times it might be well to own a little land on which the convent could be firmly founded instead of depending entirely on begging these views of his he also brought to the attention of clara but was definitely refused on september seventeenth twelve twenty eight clara obtained from gregory as she had from his predecessor the privilege of poverty the clares in perugia had their privilege renewed june the sixteenth twelve twenty nine and clara's sister agnes obtained the same for her convent of monticelli near florence other convents were less constant however many of them in this very year had the right of ownership granted by gregory and not only the right of usufruct but of inheritance and owning this defection filled clara with anxiety and sorrow as long as she lived san damiano would remain the fortified tower of supreme poverty but how was it to be when she was gone thence came her ardor for replacing the benedictine rule and its proportion of the privilege of poverty with a completely new real franciscan rule of the order there can be no doubt that she herself wrote it and that it was the one which innocent the fourth ratified two days before her death this rule is as far as possible modelled on the franciscan rule like it it is divided into twelve chapters each of them not greatly differing from ugolin's and francis's rule of twelve nineteen but the point on which clara's rule is based is in the very first place the obligation of poverty as she came to this section she ceased to be the impersonal lawgiver and began to speak from her heart after the heavenly father she writes had enlightened my heart with his grace and had led me in the model of our most holy father francis on the way of penance shortly after his own conversion then i and my sisters promised him willing obedience and as she turned her thoughts to these times now so remote when she first said good-bye to the world one recollection after another pressed upon her she remembered so many words that came from the mouth of the dear teacher and guide addressed to the honour of his lady the noble lady poverty 
and wrote them down and with strong hand she impressed the sentence in which the ideal claim appears on record in all its rigor beyond all appeal the sisters shall own neither house nor convent nor anything but as strangers and pilgrims shall wander through this world serving the lord in poverty and humility under these words as clara was closing her eyes in death innocent set the inviolable seal of rome end of book three chapter five